Chapter One of Our Young Folks Plutarch. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April Walters. Our Young Folks Plutarch by Rosalie Kaufman. The Preface. The lives which we here present in a condensed simple form are prepared from those of Plutarch, of whom it will perhaps be interesting to young readers to have a short account. Plutarch was born in Chironia, a town of Boeotia, about the middle of the first century. He belonged to a good family and was brought up with every encouragement to study literary pursuits and virtuous actions. When very young, he visited Rome, as did all the intelligent Greeks of his day, and it is supposed that while there he gave public lectures in philosophy and eloquence. He was a great admirer of Plato, and, like that philosopher, believed in the immortality of the soul. This doctrine he preached to his hearers, and taught them many valuable truths about justice and morality, of which they had previously been ignorant. After his return to his native land, Plutarch held several important public offices, and devoted his time to forming plans for the benefit of his countrymen. Living to an advanced age, he wrote many important books, but the one which gave him most celebrity is The Lives, from which we have derived this work. He consulted all the historians of his day, but did not follow them blindly, for after carefully comparing and weighing their statements, he selected those which seemed most probable. There can be no doubt that he shared the belief of the age in which he lived, for his works give evidence of devotion to the pagan gods. The legends of the heroic age must not be accepted as historical facts, nor must any importance be attached to the prophecies of priests, omens, oracles, and the divinations of soothsayers except in so far as they afford a picture of ancient superstitions, and show how even the most powerful minds had their weaknesses. They may be traced to natural causes, and it seems probable that the Roman and Greek armies were victorious, or the reverse, because they went into battle impressed by the favorable or unfavorable prophecies, as the case might be, of their soothsayers. Plutarch says, It must be borne in mind that my design is not to write histories, but lives. That is why anecdotes, short sayings, or a word or two of repartee are frequently recorded, for they furnish a better insight into the thoughts and character of a man than his most glorious exploit, famous siege, or blood battle. So it is lives, and not a history, that we offer. This must be borne in mind when some of the most important events the world has ever known receive insufficient mention. End of chapter 1. Recording by April Walters. Chapter Two of Our Young Folks, Plutarch. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Our Young Folks, Plutarch by Rosalie Kaufman. Chapter Two Theseus. Theseus was one of the most celebrated heroes of ancient times, but he lived so many centuries ago that no one knows the date of his birth. He was a Greek of noble descent, Aethra his mother being the granddaughter of one of the most powerful of all the Peloponnesian kings. Aegeus his father was not of royal blood, but he was descended from the oldest inhabitants of Attica, and became a sovereign before Theseus was born. A short time after he was chosen to rule over Athens, he had occasion to travel, and one of the cities he visited was Trozene, where he was invited to court there he met the princess aethra with whom he fell in love she returned his affection and the two were married but aegeus did not mention this important event when he returned to athens because of the displeasure that he knew it would cause his relations and still less did he dare to do so when the birth of his son was announced to him this was on account of his nephews the Pelantidae, a band of fifty brothers who expected to mount the throne in turn and would not have hesitated to destroy anybody who might stand in their way so aegeus carefully preserved his secret although it was his intention to recognize his son as soon as he felt that it would be safe to do it before his departure from trozene aegeus had hidden a sword and a pair of sandals beneath a huge stone and had told aethra that when their boy should reach manhood and should become sufficiently strong to raise the stone without aid he was to carry the articles concealed under it to athens 
in that way after the lapse of many years aegeus hoped to recognize his son he had no fear that aethra would betray the secret for he had taken great pains to make her understand the danger to himself and theseus if the existence of the latter should become known to the palantidae pythias aethra's father took charge of his grandson and engaged a tutor named conidus to educate him in later years the athenian sacrificed a ram to this tutor on the day before the celebration of the theseian feasts simply because he had been honored with the care of the person whom they loved and for whom they entertained the most profound reverence aethra was true to her trust and told nobody who was the father of her son but pythias declared that it was neptune the god of the sea this pleased trozenians because they considered neptune their special deity offered sacrifices to him and stamped their money with a three-pronged sceptre called a trident which was the symbol of his power in course of time theseus became a robust healthy youth and his mother was so pleased on account of his strength of mind and body as well as the excellent judgment he displayed on various occasions that when he was only sixteen years of age she resolved to inform him of the secret of his birth so taking him by the hand one day she led him to the stone under which his father had placed the sword and sandals bade him remove it and with what he would find concealed beneath hasten to athens and present himself before aegeus the youth obeyed in so far as lifting the stone was concerned for as we have said he was strong and the task was by no means a difficult one but he astonished his mother by refusing to sail to athens at her request to athens he replied he would certainly go but not by sea this announcement troubled the fond aethra for travelling by land was at that time made extremely dangerous by the bandits and cutthroats who overran greece and whose cruelty strength and desperate deeds were world-renowned but theseus was inspired with the spirit of the heroic age in which he lived and before following him in his travels we will say a few words about this period what is known as the heroic age in history is supposed to have extended over about two hundred years the greeks believed that during that time their country was governed by a noble race of beings who though not divine possessed more than human strength and were in many ways superior to ordinary men these are the heroes mentioned in grecian mythology whose exploits and noble deeds furnished themes for the early writers the heroic age closed with the trojan war eleven eighty four b c homer has given the best picture of the government customs and society of that age and his poems furnish the earliest knowledge we have of the greeks this renders them valuable even though they may not always be based on facts among the most prominent heroes of grecian mythology are hercules theseus and minos now hercules and theseus were of the same family and the latter had heard so much about the wonderful feats of strength and the glorious valor of his ancestor that he burned to imitate him and have his name enrolled among the heroes he had longed for the day when he might set forth to perform great deeds and when at last it dawned he eagerly began his plans and before long he started on his journey determined to destroy all those who should offer violence to himself or who had been cruel to other travellers thus he hoped to benefit his country and all mankind the first creature who tried to stop him was periphetes the club-bearer theseus killed him and took the enormous club with which he had put an end to his victims for so many years as hercules carried a huge lion's skin to show what a ferocious beast he had slain so now did theseus appear with the club of periphetes which in his hands became a most formidable weapon theseus next slew sinus the pine bender whose very name had long been a terror to the world his way of destroying people was to fasten their limbs to branches of pine trees which were bent together for that purpose then suddenly the trees would be unfastened when they would return to their upright position and tear the victim to pieces sinus suffered the very fate he had imposed on others 
at camion there was an immense sow so fierce and wild as to keep the whole neighborhood in a state of constant dread theseus went out of his way to meet the horrible creature because he did not wish it to appear that he would avoid peril of any sort besides he thought that a truly brave man ought to rid the world of dangerous beasts as well as of wicked human beings so he put an end to the sow and then travelled to megara at megara there lived a notorious robber named siren who made any person that came his way wash his feet that would not have been a fatal operation performed in the ordinary way but siren would seat himself at the edge of a lofty precipice for the washing and while it was going on he would give his victim a violent kick and send him headlong down the rock into the sea theseus did not go through the ceremony of foot washing with siren but seized him and dashed him over the precipice in putting these creatures out of the world in the same way they disposed of others theseus imitated hercules as students of mythology will perceive thus in boxing matches he killed sickness and Circeon, celebrated wrestlers he broke to pieces the skull of termerus who had killed people by butting his head against theirs and procrustes a famous robber of attica he punished in the following way procrustes had a bed on which he made all his victims lie to see how nearly they would fit but it was of a size that was sure to be too short for some people and too long for others so the tall ones were lopped off and the short ones stretched out the powerful giant's whole head had to come off before he could lie on the bed and so theseus punished him much to the delight of the neighbors on his arrival at athens theseus found public affairs all in confusion for the inhabitants were divided into parties that were constantly disputing with one another he did not at once present himself before his father but medea to whom aegeus was then married found out who he was and made up her mind that he would not stay to inherit the throne if she could help it particularly as she had a son of her own for whom she desired it so she told aegeus that the appearance of the young stranger at court just then when the government was so disturbed meant mischief and he must be put out of the way she advised him to give a banquet and invite theseus for whom she would prepare a cup of poison aegeus who was always in dread of plots against his throne readily consented when all the guests were assembled he took the cup of poison in his hand and was on the point of offering it when theseus drew out his sword and prepared to cut the meat with it the father recognized the token and dashed the cup to the ground a few questions convinced him that the stranger was his son and he forthwith tenderly embraced him and publicly proclaimed him his heir the athenians who had heard of the daring deeds of theseus shouted with joy for they were delighted at the prospect of one day having so brave a king not so the palantidae seeing their hopes thus destroyed they became desperate and dividing themselves into two companies they broke out into open warfare their plan was for one party to attack the city while the other lay in ambush ready to set upon the enemy from the opposite side they might have met with success had it not been for a herald named laos he pretended to work with them but treacherously repeated all he heard to theseus that young hero speedily destroyed one party whereupon the other thought best to disperse having no special business to attend to after that theseus amused himself by going to marathon to destroy a furious bull that was doing great damage to the fields and frightening the people this bull hercules had brought from crete and when theseus led it in chains through athens the people were filled with wonder at his having captured so ferocious a creature alive theseus was now ranked next to hercules among the heroes but the adventure which won for him the greatest glory was this the island of crete was governed by minos a wise good king much beloved by his subjects on account of his justice and honesty it so happened that his son androgeus when on a visit to attica 
had been treacherously murdered and in order to avenge the dreadful deed the disconsolate father made perpetual war against the athenians the gods sided with minos and not only sent famine and pestilence to punish his enemy but dried up all their rivers at last their sufferings became so intense that the athenians could no longer bear them so they sent to the oracle for advice the oracle told them that if they could devise some means of satisfying minos the anger of the gods would be appeased and their distress would come to an end messengers were forthwith dispatched to crete to see what could be done the king proposed a treaty which required that every nine years seven young athenian men and as many girls of noble families should be sent to crete as victims to the minotaur the minotaur was a huge monster that had the body and limbs of a man and the head of a bull his abode was at the centre of several winding paths that crossed and recrossed one another in such a puzzling manner that nobody who got into the labyrinth as it was called could ever find his way out again well aegeus had agreed to king minos's treaty and two sets of athenian maids and youths had been devoured by the minotaur the period for sending the third lot came around just after theseus had captured the marathon bull the sorrow in athens was so great that theseus was much affected by it parents lamented loudly and in the bitterness of their grief accused the king of signing the cruel treaty only because he had no child to sacrifice no sooner did theseus hear this than he unhesitatingly offered himself aegeus was shocked and tried to dissuade his son from taking such a rash step but theseus remained firm and the other thirteen victims were chosen as usual by lot the treaty provided that the athenians should furnish their own ships and that no weapons of war should be carried to crete but it set forth distinctly that if by any fair means the minotaur should be destroyed the tribute should cease for ever on the two previous occasions the ships had carried black sails only but theseus had so encouraged his father by declaring that he felt certain of being able to kill the monster that aegeus gave the pilot a white sail commanding him to hoist it on his return if he brought theseus safely back but should such not be the case the black one was to appear as a sign of misfortune on his arrival in crete theseus took part in the public games that minos yearly celebrated in memory of his lost son and showed such superiority as a wrestler that ariadne the daughter of minos fell in love with him this proved a blessing for she secretly informed theseus how to reach the centre of the labyrinth and gave him a thread which he was to unwind as he passed along and thus be able to find his way back with such a clue the killing of the minotaur became an easy task to so powerful a man as theseus and having accomplished it he set out with his companions in triumph for athens but when the ship neared the coast so great was the excitement on board that neither theseus nor the pilot remembered the signal of success they had been ordered to hoist so when aegeus beheld the vessel with the black sail he naturally concluded that his son was dead in despair he threw himself headlong from a rock and perished in the sea the first thing theseus did on stepping ashore was to offer sacrifices to the gods but while thus engaged he sent a messenger to athens to announce his victory and safe return the city was filled with mourning on account of the king's death but the lamentations were changed to rejoicing when the good news was made known the messenger was crowned with garlands which he hung upon his staff and hastened back to the seashore theseus was still sacrificing when the death of his father was reported to him he was much grieved and so were his companions all of whom took part in the funeral ceremonies and helped theseus to do honor to the memory of the late king they then marched through the city in triumph the people flocking out to welcome them and to gaze at the hero who had relieved them from the cruel tribute imposed on them by king minos theseus was now king of attica and he set about improving the condition of his subjects at once instead of living near together they were scattered over such a large space that they could not be easily governed so disputes and even battles were constantly taking place 
Theseus thought of a remedy, and after consulting the oracle of Delphi and getting a favorable answer, proceeded to apply it. He went from town to town, from tribe to tribe, and explained his plan for establishing a commonwealth, which he promised to protect. It required a vast deal of persuasion before he could convince people that he was working for their good and not for the purpose of increasing his own power but at last he was rewarded for his trouble by seeing the various little state houses closed and one grand council hall established for the use of the whole kingdom a public feast was given to celebrate this union of the people and the state was henceforth called athens strangers from other countries were now invited to settle in athens and they flocked there in crowds much confusion might have resulted but theseus was wise enough to provide against this at the outset he divided the people into three classes the noblemen the husbandmen and the mechanics each class having its duties and position clearly defined the nobles had charge of religious affairs appointed the magistrates and saw that the laws were not violated the husbandmen tilled the ground and raised cattle and the mechanics attended to buildings and improvements in machinery etc the new money was stamped with the image of an ox probably in memory of the brute theseus had slain at marathon so the athenians valued an article at so many oxen instead of dollars as we do theseus took possession of the country about megara and added it to athens but wisely set up a pillar to mark the boundary line so as to avoid dispute on that point indeed he seemed to be ever on the alert for anything that might disturb the peace and order he had established at home but he was not so considerate of other nations as his expedition against the amazons proves the amazons were a race of warlike women represented in the ancient pictures and writings as fighting the greek heroes theseus seized antiope their queen fled with her to his ship and set sail forthwith the rash act led to a disastrous war which lasted four months for the amazons followed their queen to athens and fought desperately antiope was slain and so were many of her race before peace was declared theseus performed several exploits which we need not relate because they were not of great importance but when he reached the age of fifty he was guilty of a deed that by no means adds to his glory that was the carrying off of helen who was supposed to be the daughter of the god jupiter she was considered the greatest beauty in the world although she was then only nine years old helen was dancing in the temple of diana when theseus went there accompanied by his friend Perithous and stole her away armed men pursued the robbers but could not overtake them for they hastened on through peloponnesus and were soon beyond danger of arrest then they drew lots to see which of them should marry helen when she should grow up agreeing beforehand that the successful one should assist the other in getting a wife theseus proved the lucky man and he bore the beauty to the house of a friend of his named aphidnus bidding him take the very best care of her and keep her hiding-place a profound secret aethra was conducted to the same house by theseus who begged her to assist in the care of the precious charge now Perithous had to be provided with a wife and cora daughter of pluto god of the lower regions was fixed upon accordingly the two friends set out to secure cora but this was by no means so easy a task as they had supposed for pluto kept a fierce dog named cerberus and all the suitors of cora's hand had to fight the brute before they could be received cerberus must have been wonderfully intelligent for he knew that perithous had come to steal the young lady not to sue for her so he rushed at him and tore him to pieces theseus escaped a similar fate but he was captured by pluto and locked up theseus was still in prison when helen's brothers castor and pollux went to athens to seek their sister the inhabitants assured them that she was not with them and that they did not know where she was to be found but an athenian named academus had discovered her hiding-place and informed castor and pollux of it they gathered together an army marched to the town where aphidnus lived assaulted and got possession of it helen was rescued and sent to troy where it is supposed aethra went to live with her 
Castor and Pollux returned to Athens and became citizens, for the people felt so grateful to them for not punishing them on account of Theseus's crime that they received them with every mark of friendship. In course of time, Hercules, while traveling, went to visit Pluto, who related to him how Theseus and Perithus had tried to steal his daughter, and the punishment each had received. Hercules was grieved at what he heard of Theseus, whom he had long admired. So he entreated Pluto to release his prisoner, telling him that so great a hero deserved a better fate. So Pluto opened the prison door, and Theseus returned home, where, as a mark of gratitude, he dedicated all the sacred places to Hercules. Now Theseus expected to resume his place on the throne, and govern the Athenians as before, but he soon found he was mistaken. All the good he had done was overshadowed by the silly actions that had made the people despise and distrust him. At first he thought of fighting for his rights, but deciding that no benefit could result from that, he gave up hope and set sail for Syros, where he owned land that had belonged to his father. He thought that Lycomedes, king of Syros, was his friend, and that he should have no trouble in laying claim to his own possessions. But such was not the case. Lycomedes received him courteously, and invited him to walk with him to a cliff, under pretense of pointing out the estate he owned. When they reached the highest point, Lycomedes threw his visitor headlong into the sea, killing him instantly. In course of time, the Athenians began to worship Theseus as a demigod. And when they were at war with the Medes and the Persians, part of their army declared that he appeared at their head, completely armed, and led them against the enemy. After that, sacrifices were offered to him, and the oracle of Apollo ordered that his bones should be placed in a sacred spot at Athens. But for a long time it was impossible to find them, for the people of Cyros were not friendly, and would not tell where Theseus was buried. At last Cimon, who had conquered the island, saw an eagle one day pecking at a certain mound and trying to scrape up the earth. It suddenly struck him that the gods were thus pointing out to him the burial place of Theseus, so he dug until he came to a coffin which he opened. It contained the bones of a very large man, by whose side lay a sword and brass spearhead. Cimon was now convinced, and lost no time in carrying the coffin to Athens. Had Theseus returned alive, his countrymen could scarcely have rejoiced more than they did when his remains were brought to them. They made a grand public funeral, and erected a tomb in his memory just in the heart of the city. Ever after, sacrifices in honor of the benefactor of Athens were offered on the anniversary of his return from Crete. End of chapter 2 Recording by Mary Schneider Section 3 of Our Young Folks Plutarch This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. Our Young Folks Plutarch by Rosalie Kaufman. Section 3. Lycurgus. There is so much uncertainty about the life of Lycurgus, the lawgiver of Sparta, that circumstances related by one historian are often contradicted or differently represented by all the others. No two agree as to the date of his birth, his voyages, or the manner of his death. One reason for this disagreement is that there were two men in Sparta at different periods named Lycurgus. The earlier one, of whom we write, lived not long after Homer, and some of the exploits of the later Lycurgus are often confused with his. However, we shall be careful to present only such facts as are given by the most reliable authors. It must be borne in mind that the capital of Laconia was sometimes called Sparta, and sometimes Lacedaemon. The names are used indiscriminately, both meaning the same city. The most renowned of all the ancestors of Lycurgus was Suus, who, while king of the Lacedaemonians, gained a tract of land called Helos. He reduced the inhabitants to slavery, and from that time, all the slaves that the Lacedaemonians captured in their wars were called by the general name of Helots. A remarkable story is told of Soas, which is worth repeating, because it gives an example of wonderful self-control. 
he was once besieged by the clitorians in a barren spot where it was impossible to get fresh water this occasioned the soldiers so much suffering that suus was forced to appeal to the besiegers and he agreed to restore to them all that he had conquered providing that he and his men should drink of a neighboring spring the clitorians thinking that they had nothing to lose and much to gain readily acceded to the terms then Soas assembled his forces and offered his entire kingdom to any man among them who would forbear to drink but they were so thirsty that they scarcely paid any heed to the offer and eagerly partook of the cool refreshing water when all were satisfied Soas approached the spring and in the presence of his own soldiers and those of the enemy merely sprinkled his face then without allowing a drop of water to enter his mouth looked around with an air of triumph and loudly declared that since all his army had not drunk the articles of the agreement were unfulfilled and the country remained in his possession when the father of lycurgus died his eldest son polydectes succeeded to the throne of sparta but he lived only a few months and at his death it was unanimously agreed that lycurgus should be king but it so happened that a short time after her husband died the widow of polydectes gave birth to a son when lycurgus being too just to deprive the child of his right presented him to the magistrates and said spartans behold your newborn king he then placed the infant in the chair of state and named him Cherelius. lycurgus acted as guardian of the little king and was for many months the real ruler of sparta but in course of time the friends and relations of the queen mother became jealous of his power and complained because they thought they did not receive proper consideration. They went further, and accused Lycurgus of desiring the death of Corelius, in order that he might ascend the throne. This, and the various other accusations which they brought against him, so aroused the suspicions of the people that Lycurgus determined to go away, and not return until his nephew had reached manhood. So, in indignation that any one should believe him capable of such baseness, he set sail with the intention of visiting different countries and studying their various forms of government. The first place he landed was Crete, where he became acquainted with one Thales, a poet and musician, renowned for his learning and for his political abilities. Thales wrote poems which he set to music, exhorting people to obedience and virtue, and so effective were they that private quarrels were often ended, and peace and order restored by their influence, and Thales had in consequence become a most important and useful person. He and Lycurgus were soon warm friends, and the latter persuaded him to go to Sparta, where, by means of his maladies, he did much towards civilizing the inhabitants. Lycurgus traveled on, only stopping long enough in each country to find out what was better or worse in its institutions than in those of his native land. While on this journey he first saw some of Homer's poetry, which he admired so much, that he introduced it wherever it was not known. Although Lycurgus remained away from Sparta several years, he was very much missed, and his countrymen frequently sent ambassadors to entreat him to return. They compared their condition with what it had been under his rule, and were convinced that he had a genius for governing, whereas Corellius was only a king in name. Of course, in time public affairs went from bad to worse, and then the king himself expressed a wish to have Lycurgus back, when this was made known to the traveller, he no longer hesitated. Lycurgus saw at once, on his arrival in Sparta, that no sort of patching up would restore the government to its proper state, and the only way to remedy the evil condition of public affairs was to begin at the very foundation and frame an entirely new set of laws. The first step he took was to visit the oracle at Delphi, where he offered a sacrifice and asked advice. The priestess called him the beloved of the gods, and in answer to his request that he might be inspired to enact good laws, assured him that Apollo had heard him, and promised that the constitution he should establish would be the wisest and best in the whole world. This was so encouraging that Lycurgus went to his friends, and to all the prominent men of Sparta, and begged them to assist him in his undertaking. They consented, and when his plans were completed, Lycurgus requested thirty of the best-known Spartans to meet him at break of day in the marketplace, well armed and prepared to attack any one who should oppose him. Such a tumult arose when the new form of government was announced that King Corellius became alarmed and thought there was a conspiracy against his person. So he rushed to the temple of Minerva of the brazen horse for safety. 
There Lycurgus and his party followed, and explained their intentions so satisfactorily that the king was easily won over to their side. The most important feature of the new government was the establishment of a senate, whose duty it should be to prevent the king on one hand and the people on the other from assuming too much control. After this was accomplished, a difficult task presented itself in the new division of the land, which was all owned by a few wealthy men of Sparta. Lycurgus considered this a bad state of affairs, but it required a great deal of discussion and persuasion before he could convince these landowners to part with their estates. He succeeded, however, and 9,000 lots were distributed among as many citizens of Sparta. Then the country of Laconia was divided into 30,000 equal shares for her citizens. After that, all being rich and poor alike, the only distinction a man could hope for was in acts of virtue. Once when Lycurgus was traveling through the country at harvest time, he smiled to see how equal were the stacks of grain on each division of land, and said, Laconia looks like a large family estate distributed among a number of brothers. To divide movables was such an impossible matter that the lawgiver had to resort to stratagem to accomplish this. He made gold and silver coin worthless and substituted iron instead, but it was so heavy and bulky that a whole roomful of it was not very valuable, and a yoke of oxen was required to remove a small sum. This put an end to robbery, for it was difficult to steal enough of such money to make the crime an object, and impossible to conceal a large sum. Another peculiarity of the iron coin was that it prevented the Spartans from making purchases of their neighbors, who laughed at it, and would not receive it in exchange for their wares. Hence the Spartans were forced to manufacture whatever they needed, so they turned their attention to the production of such useful articles as tables, chairs, and beds, and were willing to dispense with luxuries. Finding that very little money was required for necessities, the Spartans were easily satisfied and had no reason to covet wealth. This was a state of affairs that Lycurgus particularly desired. Wandering fortune-tellers and vendors of trashy trinkets ceased their visits to a country that had undesirable money, and as such people do more harm than good, their absence was an advantage. Public tables were introduced, and in more than any other institutions of the lawgiver, in placing the citizens on a more equal footing, by forcing every man to partake of the same description and quality of food as his neighbor. In no circumstance would it do for any one to take a private meal beforehand, even though he made his appearance afterwards at the public table, for a person with a poor appetite was suspected and accused of being dainty and effeminate, and that no Spartan could stand. But the men who had been wealthy objected to eating what Lycurgus prescribed, and one day they collected in the marketplace and attacked him with abusive language, which they followed up by throwing stones. Finding that he was in danger, Lycurgus ran for a sanctuary, but he was pursued by a young man named Alcander, who overtook him and struck him such a violent blow in the face with a stout stick as to put out one of his eyes. Lycurgus did not attempt to resent his injury, but turned towards the rest of his tormentors, who, at the sight of his horrible condition, with his face streaming with blood, were so repentant and ashamed that they placed Alcander in his hands for punishment, and conducted Lycurgus to his home with great care and tenderness. The lawgiver thanked them for assisting him, and then dismissed all except Alcander, whom he took into his house. No word of reproach or ill-treatment of any sort awaited the offender. The usual servants and attendants were sent away, and Alcander was ordered to wait upon Lycurgus instead. This he did without a murmur, because he was sorry for the dreadful injury he had done, and knew that he deserved punishment. Day by day his admiration of Lycurgus increased, and he constantly spoke to his friends of the goodness, the temperance, the industry, and the gentleness of the man he had once deemed proud and severe. Alcander knew that he could not do better than to imitate his master, and by so doing he became a wise, prudent citizen. In memory of his accident, Lycurgus built a temple to Minerva, and to prevent the recurrence of such violence, the Lacedaemonians made it a rule never to carry sticks in their public assemblies. Now we must give a description of the public dining tables. Fifteen persons sat at a table, each being obliged to furnish monthly a bushel of meal, eight gallons of wine, five pounds of cheese, two pounds and a half of figs, and a little money to buy meat and fish. Any man who offered a sacrifice of first fruits, or killed a deer, had the privilege of eating at home for one day, providing he sent part of the venison to the public table. Besides repressing luxury, these assemblages for dining had another object. 
they were a kind of school for the young where they were instructed in state affairs by learned statesmen who discoursed while eating conversation was encouraged among the diners who chatted freely and made jests though they were always exceedingly careful not to hurt one another's feelings that being considered ill-bred the first time a youth entered the eating place the oldest citizen present would say pointing to the door not a word spoken in this company goes out there this gave freedom to the conversation and taught the young not to repeat what they heard the manner of admitting a candidate to a particular table was as follows each man who occupied a seat at it took a bit of soft bread and rolled it into a little ball which he silently dropped into a vessel carried around for that purpose by a waiter the vessel was called kados if the candidate was desired the shape of the ball was preserved by the person who made it but if for any reason he preferred somebody else the ball was flattened before being deposited in the kados one flattened ball was sufficient to exclude an applicant and such being the case the fifteen men who occupied each table were always acceptable to one another a rejected person was said to have ill luck with the kados the lacedaemonians drank wine in moderation and only at the public table at the conclusion of the meal they went home in the dark the reason for not carrying lanterns was that they might accustom themselves to march boldly without light and thus be prepared for midnight forays against an enemy it is remarkable that none of the laws made by lycurgus were put into writing indeed he particularly enjoined that they should not be he preferred rather to educate people to proper habits than to enforce them by writing he said that matters of importance would have more weight if they were woven into the actions of everyday life and imprinted on the hearts of the young by wise discipline and good example even for business contracts no writing was deemed necessary the idea being so to educate men that their judgment would become sufficiently correct to enable them to adhere to an agreement or alter it as time and circumstances might require one of the laws of lycurgus required the ceilings of the houses be wrought with no tool but an axe and the doors and gates be only so smooth as a saw could make them this was to prevent extravagance and luxury for in a house so roughly constructed a man would not be likely to place bedsteads with silver feet showy drapery or gold and silver cups and salvers such costly articles would seem out of place plain substantial ones were selected in preference so accustomed did the spartans become to simplicity that when leotychidas one of their kings was entertained in a room at corinth where the ceilings and doorposts were richly carved he asked whether the trees of that country grew like that it is not probable that the question arose from ignorance but the king had learned to sneer at such sumptuous and expensive buildings as he saw at corinth lycurgus thought the good education of the spartan youth the noblest part of his work and required girls as well as boys to take plenty of exercise in the open air such as running wrestling and throwing quoits that they might become strong and healthy every child was regarded as the property of the state so it was carried soon after birth to a place called leski to be examined by certain elders who decided its fate if it were found to be well formed and healthy an order was given for its rearing and a portion of land set apart for its maintenance but a puny or deformed baby was thrown into a chasm for the spartans would have no weaklings their object was to build up a martial race and they did not see as we do that people whose bodies are not strong often become the most valuable members of the human family those children that were permitted to live were nursed with the greatest care not tenderly but with a view to making them robust their clothing was loose their food coarse and plain they were not afraid to be left alone or in the dark nor were they permitted to indulge ill humor or cry at trifles the lacedaemonian nurses were so famous that people of other countries often purchased them for their children no tutors or nurses were obtained in that way for spartan children nor were their parents at liberty to educate them as they pleased for at the age of seven they were enrolled in companies and all subjected to the same discipline performing their tasks and enjoying their recreations in common the boy who showed most courage was made captain of the company and the rest had to obey his orders implicitly and submit without a murmur to the punishments he inflicted old men were always present at the games and often suggested some reason for a quarrel in order that they might study the characters of the different boys and see which were brave and which cowardly a slight knowledge of reading and writing was all that was required but a spartan youth was taught to endure pain and to conquer in battle as he advanced in years the severity of his discipline was increased 
his head was shaved, he wore no shoes or stockings, and no clothing whatever when at play. After reaching the age of twelve, the boys discarded underclothing, which up to that time they were permitted to wear, and one coat a year was allotted to each. Bathing was not considered a necessity, and in order to render the skin hard and tough, it was indulged in only on specified days at rare intervals. The Spartan boys slept together, forming themselves into bands and assisting each other in breaking and gathering the rushes of which their beds were composed. They were allowed to use no tools, their bare hands being considered sufficient for the work. In winter, they added thistle down to the rushes for warmth, they were constantly and carefully watched by the older men of the nation, and promptly punished for neglect of duty. The bands were selected by the ablest and best citizen, who was appointed for that purpose. He governed them all, selected a captain for each, and exercised a general supervision over them. The captains were chosen from among the irons, as those who had reached the age of twenty were called, bravery, good temper, and self-control being the necessary qualifications. The position, therefore, was considered one of high honor. It was the captain's duty to command in battle, but in time of peace he was waited on by the members of his band, who obeyed his orders implicitly. The older ones did the hard work, such as fetching logs of wood, while to the younger and weaker ones fell the duty of gathering salads, herbs, meats, or any other food as best they could, even though it became necessary to steal it. For this purpose they would creep into the gardens, or sneak into the eating-houses which chanced to be left unguarded, and help themselves. If caught in the act, these youths were whipped unmercifully for their awkwardness. Their supper was purposefully made, such a scant meal that they were encouraged to steal from actual hunger. This was done as an exercise of courage and address, for if a youth could not steal or beg food he had to suffer the pangs of hunger. Fortunately for the morals of the Spartan boys, they had no need of riches or luxury. Consequently, their thefts were limited to the requirements of their stomachs. This was bad enough, but the object was to render children who were destined for war expert in escaping the watchfulness of an enemy, and to accustom them to expose themselves to the severest punishment in case of detection. Another reason for feeding them so sparingly was to make them tall and pliant, rather than short and fat." The Spartan boys performed their stealing so earnestly that one of them, having hidden a young fox under his cloak, suffered the animal to tear out his very bowels, choosing rather to die on the spot than be detected and accused of awkwardness. This story might appear incredible in any other nation, but Plutarch assures us that he himself saw several Lacedaemonian youths whipped to death at the foot of the altar of Diana, on which their blood was sprinkled as a sacrifice. All the institutions of Lycurgus tended towards excessive self-control, by which he desired to render Spartans superior to other human beings. It was the custom of the iron to spend some time with the boys every evening after supper, when he would test their wits and find out which were the bright and which the stupid ones. For example, one boy was ordered to sing a song, and was expected to comply instantly whether he chose or not. Another was asked who was the best man in the city, or what he thought of the various actions of such and such men. The object of these questions was not only to encourage the boys in forming opinions, but also to oblige them to inform themselves as to the defects and abilities of their countrymen. If a boy was not prepared with an answer, he was considered dull and indifferent, and supposed to be wanting in proper sense of virtue and honor. A good reason had to be given, in as few words as possible, for every statement made, and if it were not clear and sensible, the boy had his thumb bitten by his captain. This was done in the presence of the old men and magistrates, who expressed no opinions in the presence of the boys, but as soon as they were gone, reproved the iron if he had been too severe or too indulgent. The art of talking was so cultivated that the boys became sharp and quick at repartee. Indeed, it was the aim of every Lacedaemonian to condense a deal of sense into as few words as possible. Like Hergus set the example, as the anecdotes related about him prove, on being questioned as to why he allowed such mean and trivial sacrifices to the gods, he replied, that we may always have something to offer them. When asked what sort of martial exercises he preferred, he said, all, excepting those in which you stretch out your hands. That attitude meant a demand for a quarter in battle. Lycurgus was once consulted by letter as to how his countrymen might best oppose an invasion of their enemies. His answer was, by continuing poor and not coveting each man to be greater than his fellow. When asked whether the city ought not to be enclosed by a wall, he wrote, 
the city is well fortified which hath a wall of men instead of brick king chiralius was once asked why lycurgus had made so few laws he replied men of few words require few laws it was said by a learned spartan in defence of another who had been admitted to one of the public repasts and had observed profound silence throughout he who knows how to speak knows also when to speak a troublesome impertinent fellow asked one of the wise men four or five times who was the best man in sparta and got for his answer he that is least like you an orator of athens declared that the lacedaemonians had no learning true answered one who was present for we are the only people of greece that have learnt no ill of you these are enough examples to show how chary the spartans were of their words music and poetry were cultivated to a great extent and the songs were such as to excite enthusiasm and inspire men to fight they were always simple in their expression serious and moral in their tone often they were praises of such men as had died in defence of their country declaring them to be happy and glorified or they were written to ridicule cowards who chose rather to drag out a life which was regarded with contempt than seek glory on the field of battle at no time was the discipline of the spartans less severe than when they were engaged in war then they were permitted to have fine clothes and costly armor and to curl their hair of which they had a great quantity they were particular about the arrangement of this ornament because the lawgiver had said that a large head of hair added beauty to a good face and terror to an ugly one during their campaigns they were better fed and forced to exercise less severely than in time of peace and their whole treatment was so much more indulgent that they were never better satisfied than when under military rule they went to battle dancing and keeping step to the music without disturbing their ranks they were gay cheerful and so eager that they resembled race horses full of fire and neighing for the start when the king advanced against the enemy he was always surrounded by those who had been crowned at the public games spartans considered it such a favor to be so placed in battle that one of them who had gained a difficult victory in an olympic game upon being asked what reward he expected since he would not accept money as the other combatants did replied i shall have the honor to fight foremost in the ranks before my prince when they had routed an enemy they continued in pursuit until they were assured of the victory but no longer for they deemed it unworthy of a grecian to destroy those who did not resist this manner of dealing with their enemies was not only magnanimous but was wise for their opponents often gave up the fight and fled knowing that their lives would be spared as soon as they did so lycurgus made great improvements in the art of war and proved himself a brave competent commander he made lacedaemon resemble one giant camp where each person had his share of provisions and his occupation marked out even a man advanced in years could not live according to his own fancy for he always had to consider the interest of his country before his own if nothing else was required of him he watched the boys in the performance of their exercises and taught them something useful lycurgus forbade his people to engage in any mechanical trade consequently they had plenty of leisure they required no money and thought that time devoted to the accumulation of wealth was sinfully wasted the helots tilled the ground and did all the menial work which a lacedaemonian freeman considered beneath his dignity lawsuits ceased because there was no silver or gold to dispute about and everybody's wants were supplied without any anxiety on his part when not engaged in war the spartans spent their time in dancing feasting hunting exercises and conversation and they were taught to believe that there was nothing more unworthy than to live by themselves or for themselves they gathered about their commander and devoted themselves entirely to the welfare of their country esteeming no honor so great as that of being selected as a member of the senate this is not remarkable when we remember that it was only the wisest and best citizens who were chosen and only those who could count sixty years of honorable life with regard to burials lycurgus made some wise rules he tried to lessen superstition by ordering the dead to be buried within the city and even near the temples so that the young might become accustomed to seeing dead faces without fearing them and that they might touch them or tread upon a grave without fancying themselves defiled thereby nothing was allowed to be put into the ground with a corpse except a few olive leaves and the scarlet cloth in which it was wrapped only the names of such men as fell in war and of such women as died in sacred offices were inscribed on the graves 
eleven days were devoted to mourning which terminated on the twelfth day by a sacrifice to ceres the goddess of agriculture traveling abroad was forbidden because lycurgus did not wish his people to adopt the bad habits and manners of the ill-educated and for the same reason all strangers who could not give a good account of themselves and a sensible reason for coming to sparta were banished it seems strange that a man who thought so much of honesty and valor as lycurgus did should have allowed the helots to be used with injustice but such was the fact the lacedaemonians treated these poor slaves who performed for them all the menial offices that they were too proud to stoop to themselves with positive cruelty everything about the downtrodden helots indicated that they were in bondage their dress their manners their gestures all their surroundings differed from those of their masters they wore dog-skin bonnets and sheepskin vests they were forbidden to study art or to perform any act that was not menial once a day they received a certain number of stripes whether they deserved punishment or not merely to remind them that they were slaves if they dared even in the most trivial matter to imitate their masters they were made to suffer for the offence and sometimes they were actually murdered in cold blood by the lacedaemonian young men other shameful cruelties were practised upon them which it is not necessary to recount after lycurgus got his ordinances into working order and was satisfied that the government was firmly established on the principles he had introduced he felt so pleased that he wanted to do something to make it last for ever having thought out a plan he called an assembly of the people and when they had gathered in large numbers he told them that although the happiness and well-being of the state seemed assured there was one very important matter that needed attention but he did not wish to mention it until he had consulted the oracle he then begged them to continue to observe the law strictly without the slightest alteration until his return promising that he would act precisely as the gods should direct everybody consented and urged him to set out at once on his journey this did not satisfy lycurgus however he needed more binding assurance and for that purpose the senate as well as all those in authority were required to take a solemn oath that they would abide by the laws and maintain them until his return that done he departed for delphi on his arrival he offered a sacrifice to the god and asked whether the laws he had established were acceptable the reply was that they were excellent and that so long as they were observed sparta would be the most glorious city of the world having sent this flattering announcement of the delphic apollo to sparta in writing the lawgiver resolved to put an end to his existence hoping thereby to compel his countrymen to be faithful to their oath for an indefinite period he therefore starved himself to death for he considered it a statesman's duty to set an example of heroism even in his exit from the world the oath that lycurgus had exacted before his departure for delphi was religiously observed and sparta retained her position as the chief city of greece for five hundred years in consequence during that period fourteen kings succeeded one another to the throne but no change was made in the laws until the reign of agis who restored gold and silver money which encouraged avarice and its attending evils this is not the agis whose life forms part of this volume but one of his early ancestors the body of lycurgus was burned at crete and the ashes were scattered into the sea he had requested this because he feared that if any part of himself went back to sparta the people would consider themselves released from their oath a temple was erected in honor of the lawgiver and sacrifices were yearly offered to him by his grateful and loving countrymen end of section three chapter four of our young folks plutarch this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our Young Folks Plutarch by Rosalie Kaufman. Chapter 4 Romulus. No author has stated with certainty how the city of Rome received its name, which signifies strength, but it is supposed to have been called after Romulus, who built it. Romulus and his twin brother Remus were the sons of a priestess named Rhea Silvia, and of Mars, the god of war. Rhea Silvia was the daughter of Numitor, who was the rightful king of Alba, but the throne had been taken away from him by his wicked brother Amulius. Amulius, being afraid that the children of Numitor might try and take his crown as he had taken their father's, had killed Numitor's sons, and obliged his daughter, Rhea Silvia, to become a vestal virgin. 
Vestal virgins were the priestesses of Vesta, one of the heathen goddesses, and their chief duty was to look after the sacred fire that burned in her temples, and to see that it never went out. There was a severe law against their marrying and having children. So, when Amulius made Rhea Silvia a Vestal virgin, he thought there would be no fear of any one after her doing him any harm. He was therefore very angry when Rhea Silvia became the mother of Romulus and Remus, and declared that Mars was her husband. He had her buried alive, and the two little infants were put in a basket and thrown in the river Tiber to be drowned. It happened, however, that the river had overflowed its banks, and covered part of the land near, and the basket was carried by the tide till it reached a place where the water was very shallow. Here it rested on the ground, and so the children were saved. But they would have perished of hunger and cold, had it not been for a she-wolf, who fondled and fed them as if they were her own offspring, until a shepherd named Faustulus found the two boys, and carried them home to his wife. Romulus and Remus were unusually robust and beautiful infants, and as they grew into boyhood they were noted for their bravery. In public games both showed remarkable skill, and their manners were so kind and affable that everybody loved them. In course of time they became famous because of their readiness to defend the oppressed, and their courage in punishing robbers and other wicked people. Thus they were led to take part in a quarrel between the herdsmen of Amulius and those of Numitor because the latter had stolen some of the king's cattle. Romulus and Remus attacked the offenders and got back nearly all the cattle, but Numitor vowed vengeance against them. One day, when Remus was taking a walk, some of Numitor's herdsmen seized him and carried him before their master. He was determined that the young man should be punished, and so led him to the king for sentence. Now this placed Amulius in an embarrassing position, for it was in defending his rights that Remus had gotten into trouble. While he was still hesitating, the officers of Alba, who surrounded his throne, cried out that as Numitor was the person who had been insulted, Remus ought to be placed into his hands to be used as he saw fit. This was accordingly done, and Numitor departed for home with his young prisoner. But he was struck with admiration for the young man's fine face and robust form, and for the courage and coolness he displayed in so trying a position. He therefore resolved to be kind to Remus, and he encouraged him to talk, and asked him who he was and whence he had come. "'I will hide nothing from you,' answered the prisoner, "'for you seem to be of a more princely nature than Amulius, since you are willing to hear and examine before you punish. He has delivered me over into your hands without even inquiring as to the nature of my offence. Remus then told all he knew about his birth, and how he and his twin brother Romulus had been nourished and tended in their infancy by a wolf. Numitor became more and more interested as Remus continued his story, and after hearing all that the young man could tell of his parentage, he at last discovered that Romulus and Remus were his own grandchildren. Meanwhile Romulus had not been idle. No sooner did he hear of the fate that had befallen his brother than he gathered together a large force, which he divided into companies of a hundred men each, and marched on Alba. So many of the citizens either feared or hated Amulius that as Romulus advanced with his army they hastened to join his ranks, while Remus, on his part, excited those in the city to revolt. So violent was the attack, both within and without the walls of Alba, that Amulius was incapable of defending himself or his subjects, and he was easily seized and put to death. Order was soon restored, but Romulus and Remus did not wish to stay at Alba, because so long as their grandfather lived, they would not assume the reins of government. So, after placing Numitor on the throne, they resolved to return to the spot where their infancy had been passed, and there try to build up a city. They were accompanied by their soldiers, many of whom had selected wives from among the women of Alba, and as soon as the foundation of the city was laid, a sanctuary, called the Temple of the God Asileus, was opened to serve as a place of refuge for all fugitives. There a servant could find protection from his master, a debtor from his creditor, or a murderer from the magistrates, for it was proclaimed that the oracle had declared the temple a privileged place. So many availed themselves of this asylum, that the city soon became very populous. Romulus and Remus occupied themselves at once with the laying out of their city, but a dispute arose as to its site, for the former selected a square which he called Rome, while the latter chose a piece of ground on the Aventine Mount, which he called Remonium. 
neither was willing to yield, for each thought that the spot he had chosen possessed more natural advantages than the other. At last, no amount of argument proving of any avail in bringing the brothers to an agreement, it was decided to settle the question by means of an augury. Placing themselves at a considerable distance apart in the open air, Romulus and Remus waited to see what would happen. After a while, the latter announced that he had seen six vultures, whereupon the former declared that he had seen twelve, and the contest was therefore decided in favor of Romulus. These birds were so scarce, and their young were so seldom seen, that they were regarded by the ancients with superstitious awe. It is said that if Hercules, when setting out upon an important expedition, chanced to behold a vulture, he was seized with joy because he considered it a good omen. The ancient soothsayers believed that vultures came from another world, and that they were divine messengers. Such being the case, their appearance just when Romulus and Remus were on the lookout for an augury was quite opportune. But Romulus told an untruth, for he did not really see more vultures than his brother did. When Remus discovered the cheat, he was so angry that he ridiculed the ditch that Romulus had dug for his foundation wall, and jumped over it, contemptuously exclaiming, Just so will the enemy leap over. And in this manner will our citizens repulse the enemy, cried a bystander, as he dealt Remus a deadly blow. Romulus buried his brother, and then proceeded with the building of his city. He sent to Tuscany for workmen, because they understood all the ceremonies to be observed, and were just as particular concerning them as if they had been religious rites. First they built a circular ditch around the spot where the Comitium, or Hall of Justice, afterwards stood. In this ditch the first fruits of all things good and useful were solemnly deposited, then every man threw in a handful of earth brought from his own country. Romulus marked out the bounds of the city with a brazen plowshare, to which he yoked a bull and a cow, and as he drove along, making a deep furrow, those who followed were careful to see that all the earth turned up was thrown inwards towards the city, so as not to lose a single clod. The line thus made described the wall, which was called the pomerium. Wherever it was intended to make a gate, the plow was carried over, and the earth left unbroken. It is supposed that on the 21st of April the building of Rome began, and the Romans always regard that day as their country's birthday. As soon as the city was built, Romulus formed militia companies, numbering 3,000 foot and 300 horse soldiers, and called them legions. A hundred counselors from among the most influential citizens were selected, under the title of patricians, and their assembly was called the Senate, or Council of Elders. The patricians shared in the government and took care of those beneath them in station, and the people were taught to respect them and look to them for advice. Each man could select his own patron, whom he was bound to serve, and to whom he applied for protection and help, and the ties of affection and loyalty between patron and client were as strong as those between father and child. Now Romulus had proved himself a benefactor by offering an asylum to those who had neither house nor home, but there were many lawless, depraved men among those who flocked to Rome who did not make good citizens. Romulus thought to improve their morals by providing them with wives, and this is how he managed it. First he gave out that he had discovered an altar of a certain god hidden underground, and in order to celebrate the discovery he appointed a day for a splendid sacrifice, public games, and shows of all sorts. Neighbors were invited to witness the grand display, and flocked to the pleasure grounds in great numbers. Among these were the Sabines, a tribe of people settled near Rome, who were accompanied by their wives and daughters. By a previous understanding, it was arranged that Romulus, who sat on a platform, clad in a purple robe, should at a certain stage of the performance rise and gather his garment about him, whereupon his men were to draw their swords, rush forward, and each secure for himself a wife. The signal was duly given, and the Sabine girls were carried off. Their fathers and brothers were, naturally enough, exceedingly angry, and they declared war against Rome. After several severe struggles, peace was made, one of the conditions being that the stolen wives should be compelled to do no meaner work for their Roman husbands than spinning. Meanwhile, several powerful armies were sent against Romulus by neighboring kings, who feared his increasing power but he defeated each in turn, and forced them to surrender their cities and territories, and become citizens of Rome. 
All the lands thus acquired, Romulus distributed among the inhabitants, with the exception of those that belonged to the parents of the stolen virgins. It so enraged the rest of the Sabines that such partiality should be shown, even to their own people, that, choosing Tatius for their captain, they straightway marched against Rome. But the city was so well fortified that, had it not been for the treachery of Tarpeia, the daughter of Tarpeius, captain of the Roman guard, the Sabines would have been totally defeated. Tarpeia coveted the gold bracelets she observed on the left arms of the Sabines, and promised Tatius that she would assist him if he would give her what her soldiers wore on their left arms. He promised to do so, and at night she opened the gate of the citadel and admitted the enemy. But the traitress did not enjoy the reward of her base deed, for Tatius was so filled with contempt and hatred of her that he tore off his bracelet and dashed it at her feet, then threw his buckler against her with all his strength and commanded his soldiers to follow his example, and she was soon killed. In this way he fulfilled his promise, for the soldiers wore their bucklers also on their left arms. Romulus was so enraged when he found the Sabines in possession of the Capitol Hill that he offered them battle, though the field on which the conflict was to take place was so surrounded by lofty hills that there seemed little chance for either army to escape. However, Tatius was under the impression that his was the better position. He and his forces were on the point of marching across a plain that had been under water a few days before, through the overflow of the river, when Curtius, a brave, gallant soldier, dashed on in advance. His horse sank so deep into the mire that it became impossible to extricate him, and the rider was forced to abandon him and save himself as best he could. An army so placed would have been thrown into confusion and probably destroyed. The Sabines felt much elated on account of their escape from this danger, and, looking upon it as a good omen, they fought all the more desperately. Many were slain on both sides, and for a long time there was doubt as to the result of the battle. At last, Romulus was struck on the head by a stone that almost felled him to the ground. Then his soldiers, being driven out of the level plain, fled towards the Palatium, but Romulus soon recovered from his shock and encouraged them to return to the fight. They dared not do so, however, until Romulus stretched his hands towards heaven and prayed aloud to Jupiter to assist the Roman cause. Then the fugitives felt ashamed of their cowardice and determined to stand by their commander. Another fight ensued, and the Sabines were repulsed. Both armies were preparing to attack again when the stolen Sabine wives came running towards them in a body, crying and lamenting like creatures possessed, and with their babies in their arms, made their way among the dead bodies strewn upon the ground, entreating both sides to desist. The soldiers fell back in amazement, whereupon the women placed themselves between the armies. So eloquent were they in their appeals that a truce was made, and the chief officers decided to hold a council of war. Meanwhile the women presented their husbands and children to their fathers and brothers, gave meat and drink to those that were hungry, and carried the wounded home to be cured. They took special pains to prove to their countrymen that they governed in their own houses, and that their husbands were the kindest and most indulgent in the world. Finally it was agreed that those women who chose to stay should do so, providing that they continued to do no work but spinning, that the Romans and Sabines should inhabit the city together, that the city should be called Rome, and that both Romans and Sabines should govern and command in common. The place where this treaty was made was called the Comitium. Thus was the population of the city increased. A hundred Sabines were added to the senators. The legions were increased to six thousand foot and six hundred horsemen, and the people were divided into three tribes, called the Ramnenses, from Romulus, the Tatienses, from Tatius, and the Luceres, from the grove where the asylum for refugees stood. At first each of the princes took counsel with his own hundred representatives in the Senate, but afterwards all assembled together. The house of Tatius was where the temple of Manita afterwards stood, while that of Romulus was close by the steps that led from the Palatine Hill to the Circus Maximus. It is said that near the house of Romulus grew the holy cornel tree, which had been planted in this wise. Once, to try his strength, Romulus threw a dart which struck so fast into the ground that nobody could withdraw it. The soil being fertile, the wood took root, and in course of time grew into a good-sized tree. Posterity worshipped it as a sacred object, and placed a wall around it for protection, 
and if any one chanced to observe that it was not flourishing, or that it looked somewhat wilted, he would raise the alarm, when all those within hearing would run to fetch buckets of water, as though they had been warned of a house on fire. The tree withered when Collis Caesar ordered the garden steps to be repaired, because some of the workmen dug too close to the roots and destroyed them. The Sabines adopted the Roman months, and Romulus, on the other hand, introduced into his army the armor and long shields that the Sabines used, instead of the Greek buckler which he and his soldiers had worn before. The feasts and sacrifices of both nations were continued and partaken of in common, and some new ones were added to the list. One of these was the Matronalia, instituted in honor of the women who put an end to the war. During this feast, the married Roman women served their slaves at table, and received presents from their husbands. Another was the Carmentalia, a very solemn feast kept on the 11th of January. Carmenta was supposed to preside over the birth of babies, therefore all mothers worshipped her. The Lupercalia, or Feast of Wolves, was celebrated in February, and one of the rites consisted in the killing of a dog. The meaning of this is that dogs are enemies to wolves, and the Romans honored the latter, because it was a wolf that nourished Romulus. We have seen that the mother of Romulus was a Vestal Virgin. It was probably in memory of his mother that Romulus introduced the sacred and perpetual fire into his city, and appointed the Vestals to tend it. He was a religious man, and so skilled in divination that he carried the crooked rod used by soothsayers when observing the flight of birds. The one that belonged to Romulus was kept in the capital, but it disappeared when Rome was taken by the Gauls. Long afterwards, it was found buried beneath a pile of ashes, uninjured by the fire that had destroyed everything about it. For five years there was peace and harmony under the two rulers at Rome, and it did not seem probable that any disturbance would arise. But one day some of the friends and kinsmen of Tatius chanced to meet certain ambassadors from a neighboring town called Laurentium, who had gone to Rome to complain of incursions made upon their territories, and attempted to rob them. The ambassadors made a bold resistance, but, being unarmed, were put to death. Romulus was indignant at this cowardly crime, and demanded that the offenders should be punished forthwith. Tatius objected because they were his friends. He could not with justice declare that they did not deserve punishment, but he hesitated to give the order, whereupon the relatives of the murdered ambassadors became so indignant that one day when Tatius was engaged in offering sacrifices, they set upon him and put him to death. The Sabines took no steps towards avenging the fate of their ruler, but peaceably submitted to Romulus. Not long after this event, a dreadful plague broke out and caused the death of a great number of people as well as cattle. Even the grain was blighted, and it was universally believed that the gods used this means to express displeasure. When Laurentium was similarly visited, the belief was strengthened, and no further proof was needed to convince the Romans that the murderers of the ambassadors, as well as those of Tatius, ought to have been punished. They were accordingly put to death, and it is said that the pestilence soon ceased. But, while it lasted, several nations, taking advantage of the distress it occasioned, made attacks on the Romans, under the belief that they were not in condition to resist. They found that they were mistaken, however, for Romulus conquered so many of them that they were forced to accept whatever terms he chose to dictate. Of course, so much prosperity had its effect on Romulus, as it would have on almost any man whom fortune favors to such an extent, and he became exceedingly haughty and arrogant. The people who had adored him now began to hate him, particularly as he assumed grand airs and made a display of his power. For he dressed himself in scarlet, and wore a regal, flowing purple robe. Then he would lie on a couch of state, and give audience to those who sought him, while young men, called celeries from their swiftness and running errands, stood by ready to do his bidding. When he went out, these celeries preceded him with long staves to make way for him and they had leather thongs tied around their waists with which to bind anybody Romulus saw fit to punish. His conduct was entirely different from what it had been at the beginning of his reign, and he had become so despotic that the patricians no longer had a share in the government. They retained their honorable title, and met at the Senate House, but this was a mere matter of form, for they heard the king give orders without daring to offer an opinion, or to interfere in any way. At last this behavior became intolerable, 
and when Romulus went a step further and divided the conquered lands among his soldiers and restored hostages without the consent of the Senate, that body openly expressed profound indignation. Shortly after, Romulus suddenly and mysteriously disappeared. Suspicion of foul play fell upon the senators, and many were under the impression that when they had assembled at the Temple of Vulcan on a certain day, they had killed the king and cut up his body, each senator carrying away a portion and concealing it. The excitement caused by this event was increased by a total eclipse of the sun, accompanied by a windstorm, vivid flashes of lightning, and loud peals of thunder. The nobility gathered together in the Senate House, but the common people were so terrified that they fled to their homes and hid themselves. They did not understand the laws which governed an eclipse, and always looked upon one with superstitious awe. When the sun shone forth again, inquiries about the fate of Romulus were renewed, and the people insisted upon knowing what had happened to him. But they got little satisfaction, for the patricians gave them no answer, except that they were to honor and worship Romulus, because he had been a good and wise king, who had gone to heaven, where he would henceforth prove a propitious deity to the Romans. Some went away, expecting now to have special favors and protections, but others accused the patricians of imposing an absurd tale on them for the sake of concealing a crime, for they felt certain that Romulus had been murdered. The excitement became so great that considerable uneasiness was felt as to the result. At last Julius Proculus, a distinguished senator, who had come from Alba with Romulus and had been his faithful friend, went into the forum and declared upon oath before all the people assembled that as he was travelling along the road he met Romulus, looking more noble and august than ever, and clad in bright, glittering armour. He further declared that, in his astonishment at the sight, he said, For what misbehavior of ours, O king, or by what accident have you left us to labor under the heaviest calumnies, and the whole city to sink under inexpressible sorrow? To this Romulus answered, It pleased the gods, my good Proculus, that we should dwell with men for a time, and after having founded a city, which will be the most powerful and glorious in the world, return to heaven whence we came. Farewell, then, and go tell the Romans that by the exercise of temperance and fortitude they shall attain the highest pitch of human greatness, and I, the god Quirinus, will ever be propitious to them. Proculus was so highly esteemed by the Romans that they did not doubt a word of his recital. All suspicion concerning the murder of Romulus vanished forever, and from that time the devotions of the Romans were addressed to the god Quirinus, who they believed had power to extend towards them special benefits. End of chapter 4 Recording by Owen Cook in Potawatomi Ceded Land Chapter 5 of Our Young Folks Plutarch This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our Young Folks Plutarch by Rosalie Kaufman. Chapter 5. Numa Pompilius. No sooner had the disturbance caused by the death of Romulus ceased than a new cause for trouble arose, for a new king had to be chosen, and the patricians were so jealous of one another that it was hard to decide which of their number was worthy of the honor. The Sabines, as we know, after being made citizens, composed half of the Senate, but the original Romans, who had helped Romulus to lay out and build the city, were not willing to submit to any person who had been raised to the citizenship afterwards. On the other hand, the Sabines argued that as they had peaceably suffered Romulus to rule after their king Tatius had been killed, they ought to have the privilege of naming the new sovereign, particularly as they had united with the Romans as equals, and were in no way their inferiors. This seems fair. But the older men of Rome would not listen to such a proposition, and it was a long time before the matter could be settled. While it was pending, it was agreed that each of the two hundred senators in turn should wear the robes of state for one day, and transact all public business. Of course, no one could feel jealous of a ruler whose reign was to last only a few hours, but it was impossible that such a system of government could last. The necessity for a permanent king soon made itself felt and the senators arranged that a member of one party should be chosen by the other party, 
Thus, if a Roman were named, he would without doubt favor his own countrymen on the one hand, and he would feel kindly towards the Sabines for favoring him on the other. But no Roman would have been satisfied to be elevated to the throne by the Sabines, so their senators announced their decision to name a Sabine for the honor, and this arrangement gave perfect satisfaction. It seemed that at last there was to be an end of party spirit, and that peace was to be established in Rome. The choice fell on Numa Pompilius, a man of high standing to whom no objection could be raised by either Roman or Sabine. Representatives from both nations were appointed to wait upon him with the news of his elevation to the throne, for he was then living at Curies, a city of the Sabines, from which they and the Romans afterwards called themselves by the common name of Quirites. Numa was born on the 21st of April, the birthday of Rome. Tatius, whose subject he was, had considered him such a wise good man that he had chosen him for the husband of his only daughter. Numa, though grateful for such an honor, could never be induced to go to Rome to live, even while Tatius was ruling there. He preferred to stay at Curies, and take care of his aged father, who was too infirm to be moved. His duty as a son would not permit him to neglect his parent for the sake of the honors that awaited him at court. Fortunately, Tatia, his wife, shared his fancy for a retired life, and so the two lived happily together for thirteen years. Then Tatia died, and Numa was so grieved that he left the city and passed his time wandering about alone in the sacred groves and other solitary places. The ambassadors who were sent to offer the kingdom to Numa willingly undertook a task that seemed an easy one, for they had no idea that any man would hesitate to accept the government of so famous a city as Rome. They therefore stated their errand in a few words, but, much to their surprise, Numa was not so elated at their proposition as they had anticipated. He listened quietly, and then replied, Every change in life has its dangers, and it would be madness in a man who is satisfied with all he has, and who needs nothing, to abandon a course that at least has the advantage of certainty for one wholly strange. I know some of the difficulties of your government, for was not Romulus accused of plotting against the life of Tatius? And was not the Senate suspected of having treacherously murdered Romulus? Yet Romulus was thought to be of divine origin, and miraculously preserved in his infancy for a great future. I am only mortal, and men whom you all know have been my instructors. I am not fit to be a king, for I love retirement. I am fond of study, and have no knowledge of business. I prefer the study of those whose lives are spent upon their farms and their pastures, and I have studiously avoided warlike occupations. Your people have made many conquests, and desire to increase them. They have more need of a general than of a king. I should be a laughing-stock, therefore, were I to go among them to promote the worship of the gods, and preach lessons of religion and justice to men who love violence and war. The Romans were greatly perplexed at Numa's thus refusing the crown, and assured him that it would certainly plunge them into a civil war, because there was no other man whom both parties would unanimously elect. They begged him, therefore, to reconsider his decision. Then his father and his friend Martius, who were present, drew him aside, and privately argued the matter with him. Though you are content with what you have, they said, and desire neither riches, fame, nor authority, because you prize the virtues you have above these, yet you must not forget that as a king you will always be acting in the service of the gods, who call you from your retirement to exercise your qualities of justice and wisdom. Therefore do not turn your back on an office in which you may perform great and honorable deeds. Tatius was beloved by the Romans, though he was a foreigner, and Romulus has received divine honors. Perhaps the people have now had enough of war, and are ready to rejoice at the prospect of peace, and anxious to have a just prince who will preserve order and quiet for them. These and other arguments, added to the persuasions of his fellow citizens, had their weight, and Numa yielded. The ambassadors were delighted, and immediately accompanied him to Rome, where he was received with loud shouts and joyful acclamations by the senate and people, who came out on the road to meet him. Sacrifices were offered in all the temples, and great rejoicings marked the arrival of the new king. He was forthwith conducted to the forum, where Spurius Vedius, who happened to be the senator in power that day, put it to the vote whether Numa Pompilius should be king. With one voice the citizens exclaimed in his favor, 
The regalia and royal robes were then brought, but Numa refused to receive any distinctions of office until he had first consulted the gods. So, accompanied by the priests and augurs, he went up to the capital, which at that time the Romans called the Tarpeian Hill. Then the chief of the augurs covered Numa's head and turned his face toward the south. Standing behind Numa, the augur placed his right hand upon his head and prayed, while he looked around for some signal from the gods. Meanwhile, perfect silence was maintained by the multitude assembled in the forum. Presently their suspense was relieved by the appearance of a flock of birds that flew towards the right. This was regarded as a favorable omen, and Numa immediately put on the royal robes in which he descended the hill. As he approached the forum, he was greeted with shouts of welcome from the people, who proclaimed him a holy king, beloved of the gods. Numa's first act after assuming office was to discharge the celeries, or bodyguard of three hundred, which Romulus had always kept near him. He explained that he neither chose to distrust those who put confidence in him, nor to reign over people that could distrust him. The next thing he did was to add to the two priests of Jupiter and Mars a third in honor of Romulus, whom he called Flamen Quirinalis. Numa saw that these acts pleased his subjects, so he resolved to go a step further and try to make them less bold and warlike, and more like gentle, reasonable human beings. For this purpose he called in the aid of religion, offered frequent sacrifices, formed processions, and instituted religious dances, in which he generally took part himself. His idea was to calm the people by associating their social pleasures with their religious ceremonies, which would render their festivities of a more refined nature. Sometimes he found it necessary to excite their imaginations by telling them of the dreadful apparitions he had seen, and the strange, threatening voices he had heard. Their terror was thus aroused, and superstition made them humble and lowly. Numa pretended that a certain goddess or mountain nymph was in love with him, and that it was through her and the muses that he received all his revelations. He desired the Romans to show special veneration to one muse in particular, and that was Tacita, the silent, no doubt with the belief that if his subjects talked seldom they would not give utterance to much nonsense. He made reforms in religious observances, the most important of which were these. All images representing the deity in any form whatever, whether of man or beast, he ordered to be removed from the temples and chapels, and declared it impious to represent the divine being by anything capable of being created or destroyed by man. He put a stop to the shedding of blood upon the altars, and ordered the sacrifices to consist instead of flour, wine, and other inexpensive things. Next he instituted an order of priests called pontifices, or bridge-makers, because not only did they perform their religious ceremonies on bridges, which were considered sacred spots, but it was their duty to keep the structures in perfect order. It was accounted a sacrilege for anybody to deface a bridge, because they were supposed, in obedience to an oracle, to have been built of timber, and fastened with wooden pins, not a single bit of metal having been employed in any part. Numa himself was Pontifex Maximus, or chief of the priests, and it was his duty to explain the divine law, preside over sacred rites, and make rules for both public and private worship, so that no one might alter the prescribed form of any of the ceremonies. He increased the number of Vestal Virgins, who kept the sacred fire alive. This fire might not be kindled in the usual way, so if by accident it became extinguished, it was only by concentrating the rays of the sun that it could be relighted. At first there were only two Vestal Virgins, but their number was doubled by the new Pontifex Maximus. The rules laid down for the Vestals were these. They had to promise not to marry for thirty years. The first ten were devoted to learning their duties, the second ten to performing them, and the third to instructing others. At the end of the term, the Vestals were permitted to marry or choose any condition of life they pleased, but very few ever cared to make a change, preferring to remain single until death. It was observed that those who did marry were never happy, but always seemed sad and dissatisfied, which is perhaps one reason why so many preferred to remain Vestals even after their thirty years of service had expired. They had privileges, however, that were not accorded to other women. For example, they could make a will while their fathers lived, and were permitted to manage their own affairs without a guardian or tutor. When they went abroad, the fasces was carried before them. 
The fasces consisted of an axe tied up with a bundle of rods, and they were used by the Roman magistrates as a badge of authority. If a vestal chanced to meet a criminal on his way to execution, his life was spared, but she had to swear that the meeting was purely accidental. If a person pushed against the chair in which one of these holy women was carried, he was put to death. Great honors were paid to the Vestal Virgins, but their punishments were very severe. For trifling faults, the high priest had power to scourge them, which he did in a dark place, with a curtain drawn between him and the offender. If one of them broke her vow and married, she was buried alive in this way. Being securely fastened to a litter by ropes, she was first carried to the forum, the priests following in solemn procession, and everybody either making way for them or accompanying them with downcast and sorrowful mien. When the procession arrived at the place of execution, not far from the forum, the officers cut the ropes which bound the prisoner, and the high priest raised his hands to heaven, pronouncing certain prayers. Then the prisoner, covered from head to foot with a loose white robe, was made to descend a flight of steps that led underground to a cell, in which were a bed, a lighted lamp, and a small supply of food. The stairs were then drawn up, and the entrance to the cell was securely closed with earth, care being taken that no mark should distinguish the spot. Numa founded several orders of priests besides the pontifices, but we shall mention only the Fasciales and the Salii. The Fasciales were the peacemakers, whose duty it was to settle all quarrels, and not allow two parties to go to war until it became impossible to reason with them. If any nation offered the Romans an insult, the Fasciales were sent to demand satisfaction. In case it was refused, they called on the gods to curse them and their country if they were acting unjustly, and then declared war. Neither king nor soldiers dared take up arms until the Fasciales gave their consent. The origin of the Salii was as follows. In the eighth year of Numa's reign, a terrible pestilence overspread the whole of Italy. Rome was greatly afflicted by it, and the citizens became dreadfully despondent. To rouse their drooping spirits, Numa called them together and showed them a brazen target, which he declared had fallen from heaven into his hands, while his mountain nymph and the muses had assured him that it was sent to stop the pestilence and save the city. In gratitude, he commanded that the spot where he had received the target, as well as the surrounding fields and the spring which watered them, should be hallowed to the use of the Vestal Virgins, who were to wash their temple and holy vestments with the waters of the spring. In a short time, the pestilence disappeared. Fearing that the wonderful target might be stolen, Numa ordered eleven others to be manufactured, exactly like the one he had received from heaven, and so perfect were they that it was impossible to distinguish the original. It was to guard the twelve targets that the Order of the Salii was founded. In the month of March each year, these priests, clad in short purple frocks, with broad brass belts at their waists and helmets on their heads, danced through the city, carrying the sacred targets and beating time on them with short daggers. Near the Temple of Vesta, Numa built a house where he spent much of his time performing divine services, instructing the various orders of priests, and conversing with them on sacred topics. Whenever there was to be a public procession, criers went along the streets through which it was to pass, to give notice to the people, who were expected to lay aside whatever occupations they were engaged in, and turn their attention wholly to religion. On such occasions, the streets were cleared to make way for the priests, all signs of labor disappeared, and profound silence was observed. Such discipline had the effect of making the people look up to Numa with a feeling of awe and reverence. They honored him for his great virtue and had such confidence in him that whatever he said, no matter how fabulous it might appear, was received with perfect faith. Nothing seemed impossible to them where Numa was concerned. There is a story of how he invited a great number of citizens to an entertainment. When they assembled, they were surprised to find a meal spread out for them, consisting of the poorest and plainest food, and the table appointments of the roughest and ugliest sort. No sooner were they seated than Numa entered, and announced that the goddess with whom he always consulted had just made him a visit. While he spoke, presto, change! The humble table disappeared, and was replaced by one loaded with the choicest viands, served on gold and silver dishes, costly wines, and all sorts of magnificent drinking vessels. There are many other such wonderful tales about Numa, but none are more absurd than his conversation with Jupiter. Before Mount Aventine was enclosed within the city walls, it was inhabited by two demigods, named Picus and Faunus, who were said to have wandered among its shady groves unmolested. 
These demigods were skilled in drugs and magic, and went about in different parts of Italy astonishing the people with their remarkable tricks. By mixing wine and honey in the fountain from which they drank, Numa caught them. Then they changed themselves into various forms, some of them most strange and terrible, still they could not escape. At last, in despair at being held imprisoned, they took Numa into their confidence and taught him a charm for thunder and lightning, composed of onions, hair, and a kind of fish called pilchard. But some historians say that Picus and Faunus did not teach this charm to Numa themselves, but that they used their magic to bring Jupiter down from heaven and the god was so angry when he found himself on earth that he ordered the charm to consist of heads. Numa, who had been instructed by his mountain nymph what to say, asked, Heads of onions? No, human, began Jupiter, but anxious to avoid so cruel a charm, Numa interrupted and said, Hairs! No, exclaimed Jupiter, with living pilchards, suggested Numa quickly. Finding that he could not have his own way, the god went off, and so the charm remained onions, hair, and pilchards. Though superstition led the Romans to believe all such fabulous tales about their king, he nevertheless exerted a most wise and healthy influence over them in many respects. Numa placed his confidence in the Almighty and wished them to do the same. Once, when word was brought to him that the enemy was coming, he only smiled and said, And I am sacrificing. He meant by this that while he was engaged in religious exercises, no harm could come to him nor could he turn his attention to other matters. Numa built temples to faith, and taught his subjects that to swear by faith was the greatest of all oaths, because he wished them to consider their word as binding as any contract in writing could be. He was the first person who marked out the boundaries of Rome by stones, so that no man could trespass on the land that belonged to his neighbor. Thus the poor, as well as the rich, felt that their rights were protected. They therefore devoted themselves to agriculture, anxious to make their land as profitable as possible. In this way, too, Numa increased their desire for peace, because, of course, they had no wish to fight with neighboring tribes who could be sure to destroy the crops they had taken pains to cultivate. The land was divided into portions, and over each was placed an overseer or governor. Sometimes Numa would inspect them himself, and praise and reward those farmers who were thrifty and industrious while he would severely censure those that were indolent and careless. But of all his institutions, the one that had the best effect was the division of his people into companies, according to their occupations. The musicians formed one company, the carpenters another, the shoemakers another, and so on, each having its own separate court, council, and religious observances. Before these companies were formed, there had been two parties, who were always quarrelling about their rights, the Sabines and the Romans, not being willing to unite in any movement. By the new institution, party distinction was lost sight of, and harmony was the result. The law which gave fathers the power to sell their children was changed, for Romulus had permitted a master to sell his slave but once, while a father could sell his son three times. It seemed unjust that a woman should marry a man whom she considered free, and then have him sold if his father so determined. Therefore, Numa ordered that any man marrying with his parents' consent should thenceforth be considered free. Another reformation that Numa attempted was the making of a calendar, in which he displayed a great deal of skill, although he was not quite correct. During the reign of Romulus, some of the months had contained twenty-five days, others thirty-five, and others even more, and the year was made to contain three hundred and sixty days. Numa first observed that there was a difference of eleven days between the lunar and the solar year. Of these he disposed by introducing an extra month of twenty-two days, after the February of every second year. He likewise changed the order of the months, making March the third, it had been the first, January and February, which had been eleventh and twelfth, becoming first and second. Romulus had placed the month of March first because it was dedicated to the god Mars. April is derived from a Latin word which means to open, it being the spring month when blossoms unfold. May and June take their names from two words meaning old and young. The succeeding months were called by their number, according to the order in which they stood, but later July was named in honor of Julius Caesar, and August in honor of Augustus, the second emperor of Rome. Numa preferred January for the first month of the year, because its name was derived from the god Janus, who was called the god of a good beginning. Janus was represented with two faces, 
because it was thought that he had altered the rude state of the world and had given life a new aspect by establishing peace and cultivating society. The Romans never undertook an important step without asking Janus to bless the beginning. There was a temple with two gates, called the Gates of War, dedicated to this god. While peace reigned, these gates were closed, and in time of war they were kept constantly open. Numa's reign being distinguished for peace, the temple of Janus remained shut for a space of forty-three years. For not only were the people of Rome influenced by their just and wise king, but their neighbors too began to improve, and all Italy was benefited. Holidays were observed, friendly visits were interchanged, the love of justice and virtue grew day by day, and all plots and conspiracies ceased. There had never been known so long a season of harmony and prosperity, but it only lasted as long as Numa lived, for peace and goodwill vanished at his death. The temple of Janus was opened, and Italy was again drenched with blood. Numa was eighty years of age when he died. The neighboring states united with the Romans in doing honor to his memory, all taking part in the funeral rites. The senators carried the bier on which laid the corpse, and the priests followed in solemn procession, while men, women, and children walked behind, weeping as though each had lost a near and dear relation. Numa had ordered two stone coffins to be made, in one of which his body was enclosed, and in the other all his sacred books. He desired his writings to be buried, because the priests knew them by heart, and he feared that if they were permitted to circulate freely, they would cease to be regarded with the mysterious awe and reverence that had helped to impress them on the minds of his disciples. End of chapter 5 Recording by Owen Cook in Potawatomi Ceded Land Chapter 6 of Our Young Folks Plutarch this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our Young Folks, Plutarch by Rosalie Kaufman, Chapter 6. Solon. This philosopher was descended from a noble stock. His father was Exocestides, a man whose power was great in Athens, though his means were small. So generous was he in the benefits he conferred on others that he actually ruined his own estates thereby. When this happened, his son Solon resolved to leave home and become a merchant. He had friends enough who would have been pleased to assist him, but as he came of a family who were in the habit of conferring favors, he would not consent to receive any. Besides, Solon lived at a time when the merchants was considered a noble calling on account of its bringing different nations in contact with each other, encouraging friendship between their kings and serving as a means of, for increasing one's experience. Solon was always anxious to gain knowledge, and when he grew old, he used to say that each day of his life he learned something new. There can be no doubt of this, for he made excellent laws and became one of the seven sages of Greece. His reputation for wisdom extended so far that learned men from other parts of the world often sought his acquaintance. Once, Anacharsis, a Scythian philosopher who was on a visit to Athens, knocked at Solon's door and announced that he wished to become his friend. It is better to make friends at home, said Solon, then you that are at home form a friendship with me, replied Anacharsis. Solon was so pleased at the readiness of this answer that he admitted the stranger and kept him in Athens for several years. At that time, Solon was engaged in writing his code of laws and often asked the advice of Anacharsis as he proceeded. The Scythian laughed at him for supposing that men could be restrained from acts of dishonesty by written laws, which he likened to spider's webs that might catch the weak and poor, but would be easily broken by the powerful and rich. Solon's argument against this was that men would certainly keep their promises if nothing could be gained by breaking them, and he meant so to frame his laws that the citizens of Athens would find it to their advantage to observe them. Anacharsis was nearer the truth in his judgment of men than Solon was, as later events proved. 
and he further showed his discernment when after attending an assembly he said that the wise men pleaded causes and the fools decided them once when solon was visiting thales of miletus one of the seven wise men of greece he asked thales why he had no family thales did not answer immediately but a few days later he introduced to solon a stranger who said that he had returned from athens ten days before solon inquired what news he had brought none replied the man in accordance with the instructions he had received from thales but i saw the funeral of a young man which the whole city attended they said he was the son of an honourable person of high standing who was travelling what a miserable man is he exclaimed solon but what was his name i heard his name but do not recollect it said the stranger all i remember is that there was much said about his wisdom and justice solon's fears were aroused and becoming extremely anxious he at last mentioned his own name and asked the stranger in a trembling voice whether it was his son that was dead on hearing that such was indeed the case the philosopher gave way to a transport of grief then thales took his hand and said these things which strike down so firm a man as solon have kept me from marrying and having children but take courage my good friend for not a word of what has been told to you is true no doubt solon thought as all sensible people must think that thales gave proof of great weakness for a man ought to be reasonable enough to arm himself against misfortune and to remember that he may be deprived of wealth glory or wisdom as well as of objects of affection yet he would not on that account object to having them it is not excess of feeling but lack of moral strength that causes men to sink under affliction solon was not so successful with his writings as many of the ancients but his poem called salamis is considered very beautiful and he wrote it under peculiar circumstances after the athenians had grown tired of the war they had carried on in vain for so long a time with the megarians for the island of salamis they made a law condemning any one to death who should write or speak in favour of the renewal of hostilities solon was vexed at their failure and knew that there were thousands of young men ready to fight if only somebody would lead them on so he pretended to be insane and his own family spread the news of his misfortune throughout the city he then composed his verses urging his fellow-citizens to renew the war and learn them by heart having done this he proceeded to the market-place mounted the herald stand and sang his composition to the crowd that gathered to hear him pisistratus his kinsman was in the secret and went about urging people to obey solon's directions the result was that the law was repealed and the war began again solon himself took the command and with five hundred athenian volunteers a number of fishing boats and one thirty oared ship anchored in the bay of salamis as soon as the megarians heard of this they began to prepare for battle but meanwhile sent out a ship to ascertain whether the report they had received was true solon captured the ship secured the megarians on board of it and replaced them with his own men who had orders to sail to the island as privately as possible at the head of the rest of his soldiers solon marched against the megarians by land and whilst they were fighting those from the ship took possession of the city the battle was a furious one and many were killed on both sides but the athenians claimed the victory and dedicated a temple to mars in honour of it the achievement made solon famous throughout the land and his glory was heightened still more by the part he took in the sacred war in defence of the delphic oracle against the people of syra syra is a town on the bay of corinth the inhabitants coveting the riches contained in the temple of apollo besieged the city of delphi where it stood in order to get possession of them solon pronounced this an infamous deed and persuaded amphictyons who were the representatives of the various nations of greece to declare war against the syrians they did so and the army laid siege to syra for a long time but without success at last becoming greatly discouraged they consulted the oracle 
The answer was that they should not be able to reduce the place till the waves of the Syrian Sea washed the territories of Delphi. As that seemed impossible, the soldiers were struck with surprise. But Solon helped them out of the dilemma by advising them to consecrate the whole territory of Syria to the Delphic or Apollo, when the sea would be sure to wash the sacred soil. Thus was the problem solved, and victory was the result. Now, there was a strong party in Athens opposed to the government and anxious to have their ancient system of laws restored. Cylon, a man of quality and son-in-law of the tyrant of Megara, headed this party, being himself ambitious for power. Accordingly, he formed a conspiracy to seize the fortress on a certain day when many of the citizens had gone to the Olympic Games. Megacles, who was chief magistrate, immediately called those Athenians who had remained at home to arms and proceeded against the conspirators. Cylon managed to escape, but his men, finding themselves likely to be overcome, sought refuge in Minerva's temple. Megacles dared not pursue them into the holy place, but he ordered them to come forth like men. At first they refused, but it suddenly struck them that if they fastened a string to the shrine of the goddess and kept hold of it, they would still be under divine protection. So they left the temple, but as Megacles and his men rushed upon them, the string broke, and the butchery that followed was kept up to the very altar for some of Silon's men returned to the temple, and both sides were too excited to remember that they were on sacred soil. The conspirators, who were fortunate enough to escape, won many over to their side, and kept up a constant quarreling with the Megacles faction. Thus two parties were formed, and the disturbances became so serious that Solon advised the magistrates, who had polluted the temple of Minerva, to submit to public trial hoping thereby to appease the indignation of the populace and restore quiet. The magistrates were accordingly tried, found guilty of sacrilege, and condemned to death. Still, Athens was in a state of tumult, which the priests increased by announcing that the sacrifices gave proof of divine displeasure. Solon knew that reforms were needed, but not feeling powerful enough to produce them alone, he entreated his countrymen to call in the aid of Epimenides of Crete, another of the sages of Greece, who was supposed to have intercourse with the gods. So Solon and Epimenides worked together, and the result was the establishment of a more sensible form of religious worship, as well as of funerals and mourning ceremonies. Various barbarous customs were abolished, and the Athenians were taught to purify themselves, their houses, and their roads. They were encouraged to build shrines and temples, and to live together in harmony by dealing honestly with one another. The good effect of the Cretan sage's visit was felt by all, and when he returned home, valuable presents were offered to him, but he would accept nothing but a branch of the sacred olive, which he took as a memento. Much work still remained for Solon to do, because no sooner were the troubles springing out of Silon's conspiracy settled than new ones arose among the political parties. The people of the mountains, those of the plains, and those of the sea coast represented these parties, and each desired a separate form of government. The state was in a dangerous condition, because the poor suffered so severely at the hands of the rich. Bad times and disasters had tended to increase poverty and to render the aristocrats tyrannical. So deeply were the poor in debt to the rich that they were compelled to pay a sixth part of their produce of their land or to engage their persons for the debt. In the latter case, their creditors had the power to make slaves of them or to sell them to foreigners. Some parents were even forced to sell their own children and fly from the country to escape the cruelty of their oppressors. Time came when the bravest of these poor people resolved to bear imposition no longer. They declared themselves ready to stand by one another, to liberate their friends, and to alter the government. But first of all, they needed a leader. They were eager for a change and preferred to be ruled by one despot rather than be tyrannized over by a great number of lords. After a great deal of discussion, Solon was unanimously chosen by both parties as mediator. The rich favored him because he was nobly born and wealthy, the poor because he was honest. 
Under the title of Archon, he was invested with full authority to frame a new set of laws. He did not abuse his power, nor did he go to extremes. He merely made such alterations as were just and expedient. And afterwards, when he was asked if he had left the Athenians the best laws that could be given, he replied, the best they were capable of receiving. First of all, Solon relieved the poor by diminishing the rate of interest. Next, he raised the value of their money so that they might with greater ease pay off their debts. Then he abolished the law which enabled a creditor to enslave his debtor and recall those unfortunate creatures who had been sold into slavery merely because they were not rich. Everybody was dissatisfied. The wealthy because they had not been specially favored and the poor because the land had not been divided as they had hoped it would be, and all men placed on an equality as the Lacedaemonians had been under the laws of Lycurgus. However, as time rolled on, the good results of Solon's laws began to be felt, and grumbling gradually ceased. Indeed, such a change took place in the feelings of the people towards the sage that they chose him to govern their magistracies, their assemblies, their courts, and their councils. Draco had made statutes for the Athenians, but they were so severe that Solon found it necessary to repeal a great many of them, and that was the next task to which he devoted himself. According to Draco, a man convicted of idleness was to be punished with death, and one who stole a cabbage or an apple was made to suffer as severely as a villain who had committed the most heinous crime. It was said long after that Draco's laws were written not with ink, but with blood. When he was asked why he made death the punishment for most offenses, he said small ones deserve death, and I have no worse punishment for greater crimes. Solon did not agree with him, however, and preferred milder measures. He also desired to give all the people a share in the government, and this is how he managed it. Those who were worth 500 measures of fruit he placed in the first rank of magistrates. Those who could afford to keep a horse or were worth 300 measures of fruit constituted the second class. Those who had 200 measures, the third, and all others, though not admitted to office, could go to the assembly and act as jurors. At first this seemed a trifling matter, but it proved to be a great privilege, because almost every subject of dispute was brought before the jurors. Any man who considered himself injured might appeal to the courts, and this tended to make the citizens resent one another's abuses. When Solon was asked what city was best modeled, he answered, that where those who are not injured are no less ready to punish the unjust than those who are. He next re-established the court of Areopagus, which had lost much of its power under Draco. This council had always consisted of men noted for wealth, power, and honesty. But Solon made it a more imposing body by stipulating that it should consist only of those who had borne the office of Archon, and he himself became a member. The Archon stood so high in the public estimation that their decrees were never questioned, so it is easy to understand how powerful the Areopagus must have been. But besides, there was a council of 400, selected from four different Greek tribes, whose duty it was to consider all matters previous to their being placed before the people, and to take care that nothing but what had been first examined should be brought up in the general assembly. Thus one council acted as a check upon the other, and neither could have absolute power. One of the most remarkable of Solon's laws was that which pronounced a man unfit for the privileges of citizenship if he failed to take a decided stand when disputes arose, for the lawgiver would not permit any one to be so absorbed in his own personal affairs as to lose sight of the public good or fail to fight in defense of justice. With regard to marriages, the new laws required that an heiress who chanced to lose her husband should marry one of his relations so that the money might remain within the family. No bride was permitted to have a dowry, and her trousseau was allowed to consist of three suits of clothes only. She brought to her husband's home, besides, a few inexpensive household utensils, 
merely to signify that she would do her part towards providing for the family solon desired marriages to be contracted out of pure love and not for the sake of gain hence the laws that governed them it was forbidden to speak ill of the dead for as they could no longer defend themselves it was not considered just to do so nor was it wise to encourage the unkind feelings of others towards those that were no more one dared not speak evil of the living either in public without paying a fine for solon pronounced it ill-bred and a proof of great weakness not to be able to bridle one's tongue and temper the laws regarding the making of wills were regulated as well as those that appertain to journeys feasts and funerals when we consider the reforms instituted for mourning ceremonies we shall see how necessary they had become for the women were forbidden to tear themselves as they had previously done for the purpose of exciting pity mourners could no longer be hired to weep and wail at the funeral of a person for whom they cared nothing only three garments might be buried with the corpse and the sacrifice of an ox at the funeral was prohibited women were required to dress modestly to behave in a quiet decent manner and to go out at night only in a chariot before which a torch was to be carried to show that they were entitled to respect as attica was rather a barren country a husbandman's labours scarcely rewarded him therefore solon turned the attention of the citizens towards manufactures and no son was called upon to support his father unless he had taught him some sort of trade laziness was regarded as a crime and considered the mother of mischief so the council of the areopagus inquired into every man's means of support and severely chastised the idol solon's laws controlled even matters that at first sight appear trifling such as the digging of wells the planting of trees the money value of sacrifices and the raising of bees but they were important for they influenced the welfare and comfort of the citizens and were not made without a great deal of knowledge and forethought they were written upon wooden tables which could be turned around in the oblong cases that contained them and the whole council bound themselves by oath to observe them each man swore that if he should be guilty of breaking one of them he would place a golden statue of the same weight as himself at delphi this would have been no trifling penalty for gold was very scarce in greece it must not be supposed that all these new laws were put into practice without considerable annoyance to the founder of them for such was not the case solon was daily interviewed by visitors who sought him to condemn or to criticize certain points that happened to affect their interest many praised the laws it is true but so much explanation was called for that solon found himself likely to incur the ill will of a great number of people whom he could not possibly satisfy he therefore resolved to seek relief in flight so making an excuse for a journey he bought a trading vessel and obtained leave of absence for ten years hoping that by the expiration of that period his code of laws would be firmly established he went first to egypt and then to lydia where he was received by croesus the king by whom he had been invited the magnificent solon beheld at this wealthy court surprised him but he did not betray this to croesus who made the most gorgeous display in honour of his visitor nor did he compliment and flatter the grand monarch he seemed rather to despise such gaudy display and when asked by croesus have you ever known a happier man than i he answered boldly yes tell us a few citizen of mine who died on the battlefield bravely fighting for his country and left behind him a family of good children croesus was much vexed at this reply and considered his visitor a very ill-bred fellow however he ventured another question besides tell us do you know another man as happy as i yes again returned solon clebus and biton two loving brothers and most dutiful sons who when the oxen were late harnessed themselves to the wagon and drew their mother to the temple of juno amid the blessings of all the people who beheld the act then after sacrificing and feasting they went to rest and never rose again but died in the night without sorrow or pain in the midst of their glory what cried croesus angrily and do you not then rank me among the numbers of happy men at all 
not wishing to excite his anger further solon replied the gods o king have given the greeks a moderate proportion of everything even of wisdom and we have no taste for the splendors of royalty moreover the future carries in its bosom various and uncertain events for every man the good fortune of to-day may change therefore he who is blessed with success to the last is in our estimation the happy man he who still lives and has the dangers of life before him appears to us no better than the champion before the combat is decided then solon departed leaving the king displeased but no wiser than before aesop who wrote the famous fables happened to be on a visit to the court of croesus when solon was there and felt very unhappy at the unkind feeling croesus showed towards that sage he therefore ventured to give a little advice solon he said you should either not converse with kings at all or make it a rule to say only what is agreeable to them whereupon solon replies no i shall either not speak to kings at all or say only that which ought to benefit them when croesus was defeated in his wars with cyrus his city taken and himself made prisoner and bound upon a pile to be burned he cried aloud in the presence of all the persians o solon 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 what god or man is that upon whom he calls when on the eve of so great a calamity asked cyrus he is one of the wise men of greece answered croesus for whom i sent not for the purpose of learning anything but that he might witness my glory and increase my reputation for wealth but the loss of what i once possessed is a misfortune for which the pleasure it gave me did not compensate my miserable end must have been foreseen by that great man for he warned me not to rely on uncertainties or to call myself happy until the day of my death cyrus who was a much wiser man than croesus was so impressed by what he heard that he at once set his prisoner at liberty and honoured him with his protection as long as he lived thus solon was instrumental in saving the life of one king while teaching a useful lesson to another when solon's leave of absence expired he returned to athens he found his law still observed but the citizens were clamouring for a change of government because there had been quarrelling among the leaders of the plain the seaside and the hill parties now solon was an old man and could no longer take so active a part in public affairs as he had done however he was distressed at the disturbances and did all in his power to reason with the leaders privately pisistratus who headed the hill party seemed the most tractable and moderate of men to an ordinary observer but solon was a good judge of human nature and did not take him long to find out that pisistratus only pretended to yield to argument though he was really obstinate in his desire for absolute power he had gained the good will of the multitude by his smooth persuasive language adroitly concealing the ambition which prompted all his actions and speeches at this time thespis began to act tragedies which became so popular that the people flocked in crowds to witness them solon was leading a life of comparative leisure but with his innate desire to learn anything new that presented itself he too went to see the play after it was over he asked thespis whether he was not ashamed to tell so many lies before such a number of people thespis answered that since it was all in jest there could be no harm in it i said solon striking on the ground with his staff that is all very well but if we encourage such jesting we shall soon find it entering into our contracts not long after persistratus appeared at the market-place in a chariot with a wound on his body that he had inflicted with his own hand his object was to inflame the minds of the populace against his enemies who he declared had attacked and wounded him on account of political differences great indignation was expressed on all sides but solon was not deceived he approached persistratus and said son of hippocrates you act homer's ulysses but indifferently for he wounded himself to deceive his enemies but you have done it to impose upon your countrymen in spite of this the rabble were ready to fight for pisistratus who was immediately supplied with a guard consisting of fifty clubmen solon was very much opposed to this but finding that he could not alter the determination of the citizens he retired declaring that he was wiser than those who did not see through the design of pisistratus 
and stronger than those who did not understand it but were afraid to oppose the tyranny solon was right for not satisfied with fifty clubmen pisistratus increased the number until he could control a powerful body and then took possession of the acropolis great consternation was the result and megacles who headed the seaside party fled with his whole family then solon appeared once more in the marketplace and pointed out to the populace how misfortune had overtaken them because they had not acted with proper decision and spirit they listened attentively for they knew that he was right after making a lengthy speech he concluded by urging them to stand up like men for their liberty and not tamely submit to a tyrant still they were afraid to act and solon was too aged a man to take the lead he therefore returned to his own home and placing his weapons at the street door wrote over them i have done all in my power to defend my country and its laws his friends begged him to leave athens but he refused to do so and wrote poems in which he thus reproached his countrymen if now you suffer do not blame the powers for they are good and all the fault was ours all the strongholds you put into his hands and now his slaves must do as he commands people assured solon that the tyrant would certainly put him to death for daring to express himself so plainly and asked him to what he trusted for protection to my old age he replied instead of condemning solon however pisistratus had no sooner established himself firmly in power than he sent for the lawgiver treated him with the greatest consideration and respect and asked him to become his adviser not only did pisistratus do this but all his actions were guided by the laws which solon had made and he obliged his friends to observe them also it is said that solon lived only a couple of years after pisistratus usurped the government and that when he died his ashes were strewn over the island of salamis as he had ordered but neither of these statements is to be received as positive fact though some very reliable authors vouch for the latter one end of chapter six chapter seven of our young folks plutarch this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org our young folks plutarch by rosalie kaufman chapter seven publicola publicola's real name was publius valerius but we shall see why the surname which means protector of the people was given to him at an early age he was noted for his eloquence which he used in defending the injured and his father left him a large fortune which was employed by valerius in relieving the wants of the needy he was a young man when tarquinius superbus by an illegal act placed himself on the throne the romans groaned under the tyranny and brutality of tarquinius but they did not revolt until lucretia one of their matrons killed herself because of the shameful treatment she had received from a member of the royal family then they rose in arms and with lucius brutus and valerius to lead them drove out the cruel king with his whole family brutus succeeded to the throne and collatinus husband of the injured lucretia was elected consul valerius was disappointed at not having the latter office himself but the romans were so much in fear lest the tarquins might return that they preferred one who could not help hating them valerius then left the senate and for a while took no part in public affairs this gave rise to the suspicion that he might be induced to act in the interest of the banished royal family there were others besides whom brutus had cause to fear so he appointed a day for solemn sacrifices and when the people were assembled made them swear allegiance to the state on that occasion valerius was one of the first to take the oath to defend the roman liberty with his sword not long after when ambassadors came from tarquinius with proposals that sounded fair it was valerius who stood up against the senators most of whom were disposed to favour them for he feared the effect upon the populace should they hear what tarquinius offered 
a second time ambassadors arrived at rome to announce that tarquinius was willing to give up his crown and lay down his arms if only he and his friends might have their money and estates restored to them many were inclined to consent colatinus being of the number but brutus would not hear of such a thing he rushed into the forum and pronounced the consul a traitor for so much as thinking of allowing supplies which might be used for war to enemies who ought not even to be allowed means of subsistence in their exile all the citizens were assembled and great excitement prevailed at last it was decided that brutus was too harsh and that it was better since they had secured the liberty for which they had fought to let the treasures go to the tyrants who owned them now tarquinius had not sent his ambassadors because he set any particular store by his effects what he wanted was to sound the people and to prepare for an act of treachery that he had planned after it was decided that he should have his property his men took their time about collecting it pretending that some was to be sold and the rest to be sent away this gave them an opportunity to move about freely among the people and to carry their scheme into effect they took pains to worm themselves into the good graces of two of the best families in rome the aquili of whom three were senators and the vitilili of whom there were two members in the senate these families were relations of Colatinus the consul and as brutus had married a sister of the older vitellii some of the younger ones were his own sons two of these were persuaded to join in a plot for the re-establishment of the tarquins hoping that if they met with success they would have more freedom because brutus was very harsh and strict with them as well as with all his subjects a meeting was held at an out-of-the-way building which belonged to the aquilii for the purpose of perfecting the arrangements there in a dimly lighted apartment each conspirator bound himself by a dreadful and solemn oath to do his part of the work touching the entrails and tasting the blood of a murdered man as he swore the room in which this scene was enacted was seldom used but it happened that just before the conspirators arrived a slave named bendicius had entered it he was so awed by the mysterious manner of the men that he dared not make his presence known so hiding behind a large wooden chest that stood in one corner he saw and heard all that happened having declared their determination to kill the consuls the conspirators wrote letters giving all the details of their intentions to tarquinius and placed them in charge of the ambassadors when vindicius was left alone he stole out of his hiding-place and began to reflect upon what he had heard to go to brutus and Colatinus with the intelligence that their relations had planned to kill them seemed impossible for it would be difficult to get a private audience and perhaps more difficult to make himself believed suddenly he remembered valerius whose gates were always open to those who sought him and who was ever ready to advise and aid the poor and helpless fully alive to the fact that not a moment ought to be lost vindicius hastened to the house of valerius and told him all about the dreadful discovery he had made valerius was amazed but without losing his presence of mind for a moment he locked the slave in a room and placing his wife to guard the door until he had ascertained the truth of the story just related to him he ordered his brother marcus to surround the palace that tarquinius had occupied seize all the letters to be found there and secure the servants meanwhile valerius with a large number of friends and attendants repaired to the house of the aquilii none of them were at home and an entrance had to be forced through the gates papers containing a full account of the conspiracy were found upon a table in the ambassador's apartment these were rolled up and taken in charge and the party had reached the outer gate just as the aquilii returned a desperate fight took place and after several moments valerius's men at a given signal took off their gowns threw them over the heads of their opponents and twisting them tightly about their necks dragged them to the forum while this scene was being enacted another almost as exciting took place at the king's palace which marcus in obedience to orders had attacked 
having possessed himself of all the letters to be found there marcus with his men made prisoners of the royal servants whom he marched to the forum just in time to meet valerius as he came up with his victorious party the tumult caused by the assembling of the prisoners was so great that all the efforts of the consuls were required to restore quiet but when that was accomplished an order was given for vindicius the slave to be brought forth standing erect upon the platform he made his accusation in a loud clear voice the confiscated papers were next produced and read the traitors standing with bowed heads while the people present listened with amazement and sorrow Colatinus shed tears valerius remained silent and whispers of banishment passed among the crowd whose eyes were fixed on brutus that unhappy father looked stern and unforgiving as he rose and drawing himself up to his full height thus addressed his sons canst not thou o titus nor thou tiberius speak out boldly and defend thyself against this shameful charge there was a painful silence the question was repeated but still there was no answer brutus spoke once again then turning to the lictors or executioners he exclaimed what remains is your duty the lictors thereupon seized the youths stripped off their clothes bound their hands behind them and scourged them with rods the scene was so terrible that strong men turned aside unable to witness it but brutus showed no signs of weakness or pity he watched the agony of his children until the bitter end when the lictors laid them on the ground and cut off their heads with an axe then leaving the punishment of the other traitors to Colatinus, brutus rose and walked away for a long time after brutus had left the forum horror and astonishment kept the people silent seeing that Colatinus inclined towards forbearance the aquilii gained confidence and requested that their servant vindicius should be delivered up to them and that they should be granted time to answer the charge against them Colatinus was disposed to consent and began to dismiss the assembly but valerius would not listen to such a thing and declared against the injustice of allowing any of the traitors to escape punishment particularly as brutus had set them a terrible example by witnessing the death of his own sons then the consul lost his temper and ordered vindicius to be removed the lictors pushed through the crowd prepared to obey but the friends of valerius attacked them and surrounded the slave determined that he should not be lost sight of during the conflict loud cries arose for brutus and some people ran to fetch him his reappearance acted like magic the fighting ceased silence ensued and every eye was directed towards his face all he said was that he had been able to pass sentence upon his own sons supposing that the free citizens would see justice done with regard to the other traitors and added that any one might plead for them who chose no man spoke until it was decided to put it to the vote when with one voice the traitors were condemned to death they were beheaded on the spot Colatinus had been suspected for some time of favouring the royal family particularly as tarquinius superbus was his second cousin he had therefore become unpopular and this last affair had not tended to make him less so finding such to be the case he resigned his consulship and retired from the city valerius was elected to succeed him and his first act was to reward vindicius by making him a free man and a citizen of rome with the privilege of voting the king's palace was torn down and all his valuables were taken by the state tarquinius superbus though disappointed at the failure of the conspiracy by no means abandoned hope on the contrary he interested the tuscans in his cause to such an extent that they raised a great army for the purpose of restoring the kingdom to him the romans headed by their consuls collected their forces on the battlefield ready to resist the enemy in the first action aarons the son of tarquin and brutus the roman consul sought each other out and engaged in a terrible hand-to-hand -hand encounter they fought until they fell dead together the rest of the warriors on both sides engaged with similar fury and the loss was very great a tremendous storm put an end to the fighting at last when night came on neither army knew 
which was victorious but each was dismayed at the number of dead that lay upon the field valerius was greatly perplexed for he could not find out how the enemy regarded the conflict nor could he guess what they would do when day dawned while he pondered a strange thing happened it was midnight and both camps were hushed in silence and repose suddenly the grove shook and a loud clear voice was heard announcing that the tuscans had lost one man more than the romans no one was to be seen but every living soldier heard the voice from the roman camp arose shouts and cheers while the tuscans were filled with fear and disappointment and at once began to desert their camp about five thousand of them less fortunate than the rest were taken prisoners by the romans who lost no time in renewing the battle after plundering the tuscan camp the victors set about the task of numbering the dead when it was discovered that the tuscans had lost eleven thousand three hundred and the romans just one man less as the mysterious voice had declared then valerius had a triumphal entry into rome in a magnificent chariot drawn by four horses he was the first consul who had ever done this the citizens gathered in crowds to welcome the return of the victorious army whom they received with cheers and exclamations of delight while receiving these honors valerius did not forget brutus who had fought so nobly for his country but assisted at his funeral and delivered an oration filled with praises of the dead warrior the romans were so well pleased with this idea that from that time they adopted the custom of having speeches made by their best men at the funerals of remarkable citizens setting forth their virtues and great deeds among the greeks funeral orations were not in use until the battle of marathon sixteen years after the death of brutus they honored in this manner only those heroes who fell on the battlefield but the romans were publicly eulogized a man who had served his country in any capacity after a while valerius gave offence by assuming too much authority the romans remembered that brutus whom they regarded as the father of their liberty would not consent to rule alone but had always associated some other consul with himself what is the use they ask in this man's praising brutus as we all heard him do and then imitating tarquinius he walks about with all the stateliness and pomp of that tyrant and occupies a house not less magnificent than his was it is true that valerius's house was a very handsome one it was situated on the bellian hill overlooking the forum so that when the consul descended he could be seen nearly all the way at that time his insignia were those of the kings except the crown and he was preceded by twelve lictors who walked one by one in a line carrying axes the procession made a very imposing show and the citizens began to question whether they had not again placed their heads in a tyrant's yoke valerius heard their murmurings but said nothing one morning when a crowd assembled at the forum great was their surprise to find that the beautiful mansion on the Velian hill had vanished it was soon made known that valerius had engaged workmen to destroy it during the night now the citizens felt heartily ashamed to think that their grumblings and jealous fears had caused their consul to leave himself without a roof to cover his head they immediately set to work to select another piece of land and put up a less pretentious house valerius meanwhile being dependent on the hospitality of his friends his power was not diminished in the least but valerius thought best to have it appear as if it were and for that reason ordered his lictors to lay aside their axes and for the future to carry the long poles only to which they had been attached these they were instructed to lower whenever valerius went to a great assembly as a sign that supreme power was lodged in the citizens and not in the consul that is the consul wished to intimate that he no longer had the power of life or death valerius declared that any citizen was free to apply for the consulship but before any one had the chance of doing so he made his most important regulations first he supplied the vacancies left by the senators who had been put to death by tarquinius or had perished in the late battle with the tuscans then he made several laws which increased the liberty of the people lightened their taxes and encouraged them to work all the new laws were popular and moderate except one which was very severe 
it declared that any man who should attempt to set himself up for a king might be killed without trial or hearing of any sort and the person who took his life should be excused providing he could prove the intended crime money for purposes of war had to be raised out of the estates of the citizens and valerius made an excellent arrangement for this fund he would not take charge of it himself nor would he permit any of his relations to do so but ordered it to be placed in the temple of saturn and chose two worthy young men for quaestors or treasurers their position was considered a very lofty one and they were required to give a yearly account of the funds it was at this period that valerius was called publicola protector of the people and so we shall henceforth designate him having regulated affairs of state publicola appointed marcus horatius to share the consulship with him tarquinius now began to prepare for another war against the romans but it was abandoned for a very strange reason while he was king of rome it suddenly occurred to him that a porcelain chariot would look well on the top of the jupiter capitolinus temple and the artists of vei in tuscany who excelled in such work were ordered to mould one it was not completed when tarquinius lost his crown but the artists did not abandon their task they made the chariot and put it in the furnace to bake instead of contracting by the evaporation of moisture the clay used on this occasion swelled until the chariot became so large and so hard that it could only be removed with difficulty even after the furnace was pulled to pieces the soothsayers believed that power and success would attend the possession of this wonderful chariot so the tuscans determined not to let the romans get hold of it but a few days later there was a race at Bae with all the usual ceremonies and when the victorious charioteer with his garland on his head was quietly driving out of the ring his horses took fright from no apparent cause and dashed at full speed towards rome the driver pulled the reins and called to the animals in vain they whirled along until they came to the capital where he was thrown out by the gate called ratumina this occurrence so surprised and terrified the people of vei that they forthwith sent the chariot tarquinus had ordered to the romans it was placed on top of the temple of jupiter capitolinus when publicola desired to dedicate it but certain of the nobles were so jealous of him that taking advantage of his absence with the army they procured an order from the people of horatius to do so instead accordingly he was conducted to the spot and the usual ceremonies were performed just when horatius took hold of one of the gateposts to pronounce the prayer of consecration marcus their brother publicola hoping even at the last moment to interrupt the ceremony cried out consul your son lies dead in the camp then cast out the dead where you please i admit of no mourning on this occasion answered horatius who showed great presence of mind for the statement was as he suspected a falsehood and so the first temple to jupiter capitolinus was dedicated and publicola had no share in it let us return to tarquinius superbus when his son was killed in single combat with brutus he fled to clusium and sought aid from lars porsena a man of worth and honour and one of the most powerful princes of italy porsena was interested in the tarquins because they were countrymen of his being of tuscan descent as he was so he immediately sent word to rome that tarquinius was to be received as king a prompt refusal was the only reply he got whereupon he declared war proclaimed the time and place of his in intended attack and approached with a powerful army publicola who had been re-elected consul and titus lucretius who shared the government with him took command of the roman army porsena made such a spirited assault that he drove his opponents back to their city which they entered in such haste and confusion that the enemy came very near getting beyond the gates also it was publicola who prevented such a catastrophe by rallying his men and giving battle to the enemy on the banks of the tiber he fought until being dangerously wounded he was carried out of the battle the same fate overtook titus lucretius and the romans finding that both their consuls were disabled lost courage and retreated to rome the city would certainly have been taken had it not been for the heroism of horatius cocles this surname was given to horatius because he had only one eye having lost the other in the wars those who named him so meant cyclops but miscalled the one-eyed giants and made it cocles instead 
with the aid of herminius and Lartius, two of the first men in rome horatius cocles defended the wooden bridge over the tiber and kept back the enemy until his own party cut it down behind him then he plunged into the river with his armor on and swam back although he had been wounded in the hip by a tuscan spear publicola was so pleased at the courage shown by horatius on the bridge that he at once proposed that every roman should present him with one day's provisions afterwards he gave the hero as much land as he could plough around in one day and erected a statue in his honour in the temple of vulcan horatius cocles would never be made consul because of his lameness and of his having only one eye while persenna besieged rome another body of tuscans laid the country waste fearing they would produce famine publicola marched against them without giving warning and killed five thousand a roman warrior named mucius who was distinguished for his valor resolved to go quite alone and kill persenna disguised in the tuscan attire and speaking the tuscan language mucius went to the enemy's camp and made his way straight to the spot where the king sat among his nobles on arriving there he was at a loss to decide which was porsena and fearing to betray himself by making inquiries he drew his sword and slew the man who he thought had most the appearance of king but he made a mistake and was seized on the spot during the examination which followed porsena threatened mucius with torture by fire in order to make him name his accomplices thereupon to show how indifferent he was to pain mucius thrust his right hand into a blazing fire prepared upon a portable altar for purposes of sacrifice while his flesh was burning he kept his eyes fixed on the face of porsena without once flinching the king was lost in admiration of such fortitude and graciously returned to the prisoner the sword that had been taken from him mucius received the weapon with his left hand and said to porsena i regarded not your threats but i am conquered by your generosity and will now tell you what you could never have forced from me there are three hundred romans who have taken an oath as i did to kill you they are now walking about your camp waiting for an opportunity it was my lot to make the first attempt but i am not sorry that i failed for so brave and good a man as you ought to live to be a friend to rome rather than an enemy porsena did not fear the three hundred who wanted to take his life but he was so favourably impressed by the example of courage mucius had shown that he was willing to come to terms and soon ceased to have any regard for tarquinius indeed so kindly disposed was he towards the romans that he ordered his forces to quit camp with nothing but their arms and to leave their tents full of provisions as a gift to them this generous act was rewarded by the senate with a present to porsena of a throne adorned with ivory a sceptre a golden crown and a superb robe a brazen statue was also erected near the senate house in his honour publicola was made consul a third and a fourth time then the sabines threatened a war and preparations were made to oppose them among that race was a man named appius clausus noted for his wealth his excellent character and his great eloquence clausus did all he could to prevent the war and thus came to be suspected of favouring the romans he did not care to stand a trial when this accusation was made because although he knew that many would be delighted if peace could be preserved the army would be angry however he had numerous friends and allies who helped him in disputing the question of war thus causing a delay meanwhile publicola sent messengers to tell clausus that he was assured of his honesty and good intentions and that if he pleased to secure himself against his enemies and come to rome he would be most cordially received clausus considered the proposition seriously and con concluded to accept it five thousand of the best sabine families determined to accompany him and all set out together for rome on being informed of their approach publicola went out to meet them and gave them a hearty welcome the advantages of citizenship were bestowed on them and each family was presented with two acres of land but clausus received twenty-five acres and an invitation to become senator he soon rose in political power and established such a fine reputation that the claudian family of which he was the founder became one of the most illustrious in the city the sabines who remained at home 
would have settled down quietly after the departure of Clausus with his party, but their leaders were determined upon war, and told them it was disgraceful not to resent the desertion of so large a number of their race. A grand army was therefore equipped and gathered at Fidenae, not far from Rome. Then an abbot of two thousand men was stationed in a wood on the outskirts of the city with this design. As soon as day dawned, a few horsemen were to set forth and ravage the country up to the very gates, and then suddenly to retreat and draw the enemy, who would be sure to follow into the ambush. But Publicola was informed of this by deserters, and so prepared his forces. The night before the attack was to be made, Posthumius Balbus, son-in-law of Publicola, went out with three thousand men and stationed them on top of the hills beneath which the Sabines were hidden for the purpose of watching their movements. Lucretius, with a body of the boldest and most active Romans, was appointed to meet the Sabine cavalry, while the consul himself and the rest of the forces surrounded the enemy in the rear. Taking advantage of fog that settled at dawn, Posthumius, with loud shouts, assailed the enemy from the hills. Lucretius cut off the retreat of the cavalry, and Publicola attacked the camp itself. The Sabines were completely taken by surprise, and the slaughter was tremendous. There was so much confusion among them that those in the camp ran to the ambuscad, and those in the ambuscad flew to the camp, each expecting protection from the other. Had not the city of Fidelii been so near, all the Sabines would have been killed or captured but as it was, some of them escaped. The plunder and sale of the prisoners brought great wealth to the Romans, who gave all the credit of the victory to their general. While at the height of his glory, Publicola resigned from office. He lived only a short time after that, and when he died, he did not leave money enough to pay the expenses of his funeral, a good proof that he had honorably used the public funds. Each citizen contributed a piece of money towards paying for the funeral, and the women mourned a whole year for Publicola, one of the greatest generals and the most popular consul Rome ever had. End of chapter 7Chapter 8 of Our Young Folks Plutarch this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our Young Folks Plutarch by Rosalie Kaufman Chapter 8 Caius Martius Coriolanus Caius Martius Coriolanus belonged to the noble Marcii family, and was early distinguished for his courage and for his deep interest in all that pertained to war. So when Tarquinius Superbus tried to replace himself on the throne, as has been related in the life of Publicola, young Martius gladly embraced the opportunity of appearing on the battlefield. In one of the engagements, he distinguished himself by stepping into the place of a Roman soldier who had been disabled and killing his assailant. For this brave deed he was crowned after the battle with a wreath of oak leaves, it being the custom in Rome so to adorn any soldier who saved the life of another. This crown could be worn whenever the owner chose and entitled him to marked respect. After that, Martius performed so many exploits that there was scarcely a battle from which he did not return crowned. This only fired his ambition to do better, and his mother's warm embrace, as she received him crowned with laurels, delighted his heart. His father had died when Martius was an infant, so all his love was bestowed on his mother, from whom he never lived apart, even after he was married and had a family of his own. Martius added much to his glory during the war between the Romans and the Volscians. Cominius, the consul, surrounded Corelli, the principal city of the Volscians, whereupon the rest of the nation sent all their forces so that an attack might be made upon the enemy from within and without the walls at the same time. But Cominius would not risk such an encounter. He therefore divided his army, and leaving part under the command of Titus Lartius, one of the bravest Romans of his time, to continue the siege, 
he led the other part out to meet the approaching Volscian troops. Those within the walls of Corrieli thought they could easily manage the small army that remained, and so gave them battle, and drove them into their trenches. Then Martius, with a few selected warriors, flew at the Volscians, and cut to pieces all that he encountered, calling at the same time on his countrymen to renew the battle. Encouraged by his voice and example, the Romans rallied and fought the enemy to their very gates. Thousands of darts rained down upon the besiegers from the walls, and they were on the point of retreating when Martius cried out in tones remarkable for their power, Fortune has opened the gates of Corali to receive the conquerors. Followed by a handful of brave men, he pushed his way through the crowd into the city. A combat followed, which resulted in victory for Martius. Some of the citizens of Corioli sought refuge in the interior, while the rest laid down their arms. Then Lartius led in the rest of the Romans, who at once began their work of pillage. But Martius was not satisfied. He approached the soldiers and told them that it was disgraceful for them thus to spend their time, when the consul and his troops were perhaps engaged with the other Volscians, Drawing about him the few who were willing to sacrifice the booty that lay before them, he hastened along the road Cominius had taken, praying to the gods as he went that he might arrive before the fight was over. It was the custom among the Romans just before going to battle, while girding on their bucklers, to make a verbal will in the presence of three or four hearers. The army of Cominius was thus engaged with the enemy in sight when Martius entered the camp all besmeared with blood and attended by his small train. All thought that he had come to report defeat, but when, after a moment's conversation, Cominius embraced and saluted him, they knew that Corrieli had fallen and cried out to be led to battle. Martius inquired where the best soldiers among the enemy were stationed, and on being told in the center said, Let me be granted the favor of being posted against them. He had his wish, and wherever he went he broke the Volscian ranks. Once he was completely surrounded, when seeing the danger, the consul sent home some of his choicest men to the rescue. These fought so hard that they drove the enemy from the field. Martius was then urged to retire to the camp and rest, for he was faint from loss of blood, but he said weariness is not for conquerors, and joined in the pursuit of the Volscians until part were killed and the rest captured. The next day, when Martius Coriolanus presented himself at the tent of Cominius, he received a hearty welcome and loud praise for his remarkable achievements. The soul then told Martius to choose the tenth part of the booty, the horses and the captives, as his reward before the regular division was made among the soldiers, and presented him with a fine horse covered with rich trappings and ornaments. The whole army applauded, but the hero only accepted the horse, and after thanking Cominius for his approval of his deeds, refused any other reward except what fell to his share. I have one special favor to ask, he added, which I hope will not be denied me. It is that one of the prisoners, a worthy man, whose hospitality I have enjoyed, now reduced from wealth and freedom to captivity, may not be sold as a common slave. Applause, louder and longer than before, greeted this request, for the men were most impressed by Martius's refusing the rich reward offered to him, and by his kind remembrance of his friend, than they had been by his bravery on the battlefield. As soon as quiet was restored, Cominius said, It is useless, fellow soldiers, to force gifts upon one who is unwilling to receive them, but let us offer him that which he cannot reject. Let us pass a vote that he shall henceforth be called Coriolanus on account of his actions at Corioli. This is how he came by his third name. When the war was over, there was such a scarcity of provisions in Rome that a famine was feared and great disturbance was the consequence. There had been frequent quarrels between the rich and the poor, and now the orators stirred up the latter to the belief that the patricians, as the noble class was called, had brought about the scarcity of food out of revenge. 
the senate did not know what to do but martius did not wait for them to decide he secured as many volunteers as possible marched into the territory of the entieties and returned to rome with a rich supply of corn cattle and slaves no part of which he kept for himself those who had stayed quietly at home were filled with envy when they saw martius again victorious and began to talk about the danger of his growing power not long after he presented himself in the forum as a, a candidate for consul this was a period of purity a golden age when bribery had not been resorted to and a man solicited the votes of his fellow-citizens on account of his merit so martius appeared in the forum wearing only a loose gown or toga and no tunic thus attired the scars he had received during his seventeen years service in battle could be plainly seen and the people told one another that they could not help creating him consul when he displayed such marks of merit if the election had taken place then and there martius would have received the office he desired but he made this mistake when election day came he appeared not displaying his scars but handsomely clad and attended by a train of senators the other patricians made such efforts to secure his election that the common people rejected him merely for the sake of opposition coriolanus was so indignant that he burst into a violent fit of rage which the angry remarks of his friends among the young noblemen encouraged he vowed that he would be avenged and they promised to uphold him in all he did his time came when grain was brought in large quantities to rome from various parts of italy and from the king of sicily who sent it as a present the senate assembled to distribute it and the people flocked in crowds expecting to buy very cheap and to get what the king had sent without charge then coriolanus stood up and declared boldly that he was opposed to any favors being shown to the plebeians as the common people were called he said that they were no longer to be trusted since they were unwilling to obey magistrates not of their own class that they were traitors whose insolence ought to deprive them of any favors whatsoever he added much more but the most aggravating part of his speech was the proposition to keep the price of corn as high as ever and thus prevent the people from becoming independent when the crowd heard what coriolanus had said they were so angry that they wanted to break in upon the senate thereupon the tribunes assured them that the offender should be punished and that they should be fairly dealt with regarding the price of food after a short consultation sicinius the boldest of the tribunes announced that martius coriolanus was condemned to die and ordered the magistrates to take him to the top of the tarpeian rock and throw him down the precipice even his enemies were shocked at such a sentence but his friends closed around him and would not allow the officers to come near while he stood prepared to make a desperate resistance finding that he could not be taken without a great deal of bloodshed the tribunes decided to leave his fate to the people and let them say what should be done with him Sicinius then turned to the patricians and asked what do you mean by rescuing martius when he is on the eve of punishment they answered what do you mean by thus dragging one of the worthiest men in rome without trial to a barbarous execution if that be all returned sicinius the people grant you what you desire the man shall have his trial as for you martius we request you on the third market day to appear and defend yourself the roman citizens will then decide your case by vote several charges were brought against coriolanus some just some unjust when the trial took place and he was condemned by a majority of votes to perpetual banishment this sentence was received by the plebeians with loud expressions of joy but the patricians felt and looked sad and depressed martius alone appeared unmoved because he was too indignant to show what he suffered he went to his own home bade farewell to his mother and his wife and then left rome being accompanied to the city gate by the patricians in a body the next few days he spent at one of his farms in the neighborhood turning over in his mind the best method of revenging himself at last he decided to stir up some nation to a cruel war against the romans and fixed upon the vulcans 
been defeated but they were still strong in men and money which they would he did not doubt be ready to use against rome so one evening he went secretly to the town of antium in disguise and made his way to the house of tullus alphidius a man of wealth influence and noble birth among the volscians he entered without speaking to anybody proceeded straight to the hearth seated himself there and covered up his head as the household gods of the romans were always placed on the hearth it was considered a sacred spot and any person desiring assistance no matter of what character went there for refuge something impressive in the appearance and the silence of coriolanus prevented the people of the house from disturbing him but they went to tullus who was at supper and told him that a stranger had come who probably desired to speak with him tullus rose from the table and going towards the visitor asked who he was and upon what business he had come uncovering his face coriolanus looked for a moment at the volscian and spoke thus if thou dost not know me tullus i must be my own accuser i am caius martius who have brought so many misfortunes on your people and as a proof of that i bear the additional name of coriolanus which is all the reward i have for the labours and dangers i have undergone of everything else i am robbed by the envy of the people on the one hand and the cowardice and treachery of the magistrates on the other driven from rome as an exile i come as a suppliant to thy household gods not for protection but were i afraid to die i should not come here but for vengeance on those who have wronged me i begin by putting myself in thy hands if thou art disposed to attack the enemy brave tullus take advantage of my misfortunes let my personal distress be the happiness of thy countrymen and be assured that i shall fight much better for thee than i ever fought against thee but if thou hast given up all thoughts of war i neither desire to live nor is it fit for thee to preserve one who has been thine enemy and is not able to do thee any sort of service tullus was delighted with this address taking the hand of the roman in his he said rise martius and take courage the present you make us of yourself is of great value and you may be sure that the volscians will not prove ungrateful he then feasted him and the two men spent several of the following days consulting together about the war they took the principal men of antium into their confidence also and all felt the difficulty of invading rome because of a treaty of peace which had been sworn to for two years coriolanus was not a man to stop at trifles having resolved to fight he managed in this way to make the romans themselves furnish a pretext he sent a message to the consuls that it was the intention of the volscians residing in rome to fall upon the citizens during the public games and set the city on fire the consequence was a proclamation ordering the volscians to depart before sunset that was enough such an indignity was not to be borne patiently and tullus did what he could to work on the feelings of his countrymen until he persuaded them at last to send ambassadors to rome to demand that the land taken from the volscians during the late war should be returned the reply they received was that the volscians were the first to break the treaty and take up arms but the romans would be the last to lay them down then tullus called an assembly and the majority voted for war by this advice martius was chosen to share the command of the army with him and so impatient was the latter to begin operations that before all the arrangements were completed he marched with part of the troops to the confines of rome and created such a panic by his unexpected appearance that the volscians took more booty than they could carry away or use in camp but this was not all that martius desired he had wickedly made up his mind to increase the ill feeling that existed between the patricians and the plebeians so he ordered his soldiers to destroy right and left everything that they could not carry away but on no account to lay hands on a patrician estate the consequence was that the people accused the rich of encouraging coriolanus to attack rome because they knew that he would offer them no injury while disorder reigned and the two parties in rome quarrelled and disputed coriolanus was marching about from city to city plundering killing and increasing the wealth and number of his army 
at last he laid siege to lavinium where the images and sacred things of the gods were kept then the romans became so terrified that they demanded the recall of coriolanus at first the senate refused but when the enemy advanced to within five miles of rome they sent ambassadors to ask coriolanus to forget the past and return he received them seated in state surrounded by volscian officers and replied as general of the volscians i demand all the territories seized by the romans in the late war also the same rights and privileges for the people i command as are granted to the latins otherwise peace cannot be lasting i give you thirty days to decide the volscian forces were then led out of the roman territory but attacks were continued on other cities in italy and coriolanus took possession of seven important ones when the thirty days had passed the ambassadors were sent again not to agree to the terms proposed by coriolanus but to ask him to withdraw the volscian army and then to make any proposals he thought best for both parties he refused but granted to the romans three days more for consideration of the matter the senate were in despair for the city was in a perfect uproar and with a powerful enemy at their very gates ready to pounce down upon them at a moment's notice nobody had the heart to engage in regular pursuits here was a case that called for extraordinary measures so a decree was issued that the whole order of priests so soothsayers and priestesses should go in full procession attired in their sacred robes and carrying all the emblems of their holy offices to see what impression they could make on the now terrible marshes they were admitted to the camp received with mildness and patiently listened to but nothing was granted to them they were sent away with this choice either to yield to the terms proposed or to fight so much had been expected from the intercession of the holy ambassadors that their failure made matters worse than before in their despair the romans resolved to remain within their walls and merely defend themselves when the attack should be made trusting to the friendliness of the gods to put off the evil day in this dreadful season of uncertainty the women of rome daily congregated at the various temples to pray for the safety of their homes and families those of the highest rank met at the altar of jupiter capitolinus and it was one of their number who hit upon a plan that no member of the senate would ever have thought of her name was valeria and she was sister of the great publicola whose services were of so much value to his country come said she to her companions as though suddenly seized with divine inspiration let us go to volumnia the mother of martius she and virgilia his wife may succeed where all others have failed on arriving at the house they found the mother sitting with her daughter-in-law and her grandchildren valeria stepped forward from amidst the score of ladies who accompanied her and spoke thus we have come to you volumnia and you virgilia as women to women not by the direction of the senate or an order from the consuls but prompted by the divine being himself to entreat you to do a thing that will save us and raise your glory above that of the sabine women who won over their fathers and husbands from mortal enmity to peace and friendship arise and come with us to coriolanus help us to bear testimony in behalf of our country that in spite of the many wrongs that have been put upon her she has never once done you an injury but now restores you safe into his hands though she may not on that account obtain better terms for herself volumnia made answer virgilia and i my countrywomen not only share with you the common misery but we have the sorrow besides of knowing that martius is lost to us his glory dimmed his virtue gone for we behold him surrounded by the arms of the enemy not as their prisoner but as their commander it is the greatest of all misfortunes that our country has become so weak as to rest her hopes upon us for since martius has no regard for the country which he used to love better than mother wife or child we can scarcely hope that he will listen to us however lead us if you please to him if we can do nothing else we can at least expire at his feet pleading for rome 
having thus spoken she took virgilia and the children by the hand and after gaining the approval of the senate and consuls proceeded with the roman matrons to the volscian camp their appearance touched the sympathies of the enemy and when they approached the general he was overcome at the sight of his dear ones who headed the line he came quickly forward embraced his mother then his wife and children and burst into tears after a few moments volumnia spoke as follows in the presence of the volscian counsellors who had drawn near you see my son by our attire and miserable looks to what a forlorn condition your banishment has reduced us now ask yourself whether we are not the most wretched of women volumnia who beholds her son and virgilia her husband in arms against rome even prayer whence others gain comfort in misfortune only adds to our distress for we cannot ask the gods at the same time for our country's victory and your preservation your wife and children must see either rome or you perish as for myself i shall not wait for war to decide for if i cannot prevail with you to prefer peace to hostility and become the benefactor of both parties rather than the destroyer of one rest assured that you shall never reach your country unless you trample upon the dead body of her who gave you life it would ill become me to wait for the day when my son should come into rome as the conqueror of his fellow-citizens or be led into it as their captive if i desired you to save your country by ruining the volscians the case would be hard for it would be quite as dishonourable to betray those who have put their trust in you as to destroy your countrymen all we ask of you is a deliverance that will be most to the honour of the volscians though equally beneficial to them and to us we ask of them the blessing of peace and friendship which their superiority enables them to grant if our petition meets with your favour you will be regarded as the chief cause of it if we are repulsed you alone must expect to bear the blame from both nations the chances of war are uncertain if you conquer rome you will have the reputation of having undone your country but if the volscians are defeated under you all the world will say that to satisfy your revenge you brought misfortune to your friends and benefactors martius listened to his mother but said not a word wondering at his silence she spoke again my son why are you silent is it an honour to yield everything to revenge and a disgrace to grant your mother so important a petition does it become a great man to remember injuries done him and to forget the reverence he owes his parents surely you of all men should take care to be grateful who have suffered so much from ingratitude yet you have not made your mother the least return for her kindness and devotion the most sacred ties of nature and religion require you to indulge me in this reasonable and just request but if it must be so this only is left she fell on her knees at his feet and valeria and his children did the same o oh, mother what is it you have done cried coriolanus as he raised her from the ground and tenderly pressed her hand you have gained a victory fortunate for the romans but ruinous to your son by you alone am i defeated although he knew that the volscians would never forgive him for granting a favour to their enemies he broke up the camp the next morning and led them homeward when the roman matrons returned home all the temples were thrown open and people crowned themselves to prepare for the sacrifices as it was their custom to do when the news of a great victory was brought to them the extent of their rejoicing showed how great their misery had been the senate passed a decree that the women who had saved their country should have any honour or favour granted them that they chose to ask they simply demanded that a temple should be erected to female fortune offering to pay for it themselves if the city would furnish the cost of sacrifices and other matters necessary to do honour to the goddess the senate praised their generosity but ordered the temple to be built at the public expense then the women set up a second statue of fortune which was said to have uttered these words when placed o women most acceptable to the gods is your pious gift 
we need not believe that an image spoke but the ancient romans had so much superstitious faith that they accepted many improbabilities as facts when martius returned to antium he was accused of treachery by tullus who was jealous of his victories and his fast-growing popularity so when he stood up before the public assembly to defend himself tullus and his party cried out we will not listen to a traitor volscians want no tyrant amidst such exclamations he set upon martius and killed him on the spot in a subsequent battle with the romans tullus was slain and the volscians became their subjects End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of Our Young Folks Plutarch This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our Young Folks Plutarch by Rosalie Kaufman Chapter 9 Themistocles As a boy, Themistocles was remarkably bright and intelligent, and showed such deep interest in everything pertaining to public affairs that his master often said to him, Boy, you will certainly make your mark either as a blessing or a curse to your country. He was not disposed to study those branches that most of his companions preferred, and when they jeered at him for not desiring accomplishments, he would get angry and say, I may not know how to tune a harp or play upon a lute, but I understand the art of raising a small and unimportant city to glory and greatness. Most of his leisure moments were passed in imagining cases of dispute among citizens and composing orations bearing upon them. He could not be taught graceful manners, for they seemed of little consequence to him, though his countrymen attached great importance to the art of pleasing. Themistocles was an unruly boy and carried on his mad pranks without much restraint. When taken to task for them, he said, the wildest colts make the best horses when they come to be properly trained. So ambitious of power and position was he that as he grew older, he became involved in many quarrels with people of high rank and influence. Among these was Aristides, a man of mild disposition and unusual honesty, who was frequently annoyed by the way Themistocles would stir the people up to enterprises that seemed unjustifiable. The great battle of Marathon, in which the Athenians had won such a magnificent victory, was ever in the mind of the young man, and he burned to crown himself with glory, as Miltiades had done by entirely defeating the grand Persian army. Ambition rendered him sleepless by night, and absorbed his thoughts by day. He became absent-minded and reserved and lost interest in the recreations he had before enjoyed. His friends questioned him as to the cause. He said, The trophies of Miltiades will not suffer me to sleep. Few supposed that an opportunity would arise for him to gain such trophies, for it seemed as though the signal defeat of the Persians had put an end to the war. But Themistocles advised the Greeks to prepare their ships for an attack which he foresaw Darius, the Persian king, would make by sea, with the hope of restoring the fortunes lost at Marathon. This wonderful foresight proved that Themistocles had at least one of the qualifications of a great general, and we shall see that he had others besides. The most flourishing people in all Greece were the Aegeanitans, and Aegina, their city, situated on an island near Attica, was one of the principal seaports. An old feud had existed between the people of Athens and Aegina, the effect of which was felt for many years. Taking advantage of this feeling of enmity, Themistocles found little difficulty in persuading his countrymen to make war on their powerful neighbours, whose ships rendered them masters of the sea. His real object was to prepare a navy to resist the Persians, but he thought best not to say so, knowing that little attention would have been paid to him if he had. The Persians at a distance did not seem formidable, nor was there much probability that they would so soon recover from Marathon as to make another attack. So long as he accomplished his desire, Themistocles was satisfied to keep his opinions to himself. A large sum of money was required for shipbuilding, and this is how Themistocles managed to raise it. 
In the public treasury, there happened to be an ample surplus that had been accumulating for many years from the rich silver mines of Larium. A proposition was on foot to distribute this fund among the Athenians, but Themistocles used his utmost efforts in order to persuade them to appropriate it for the purpose of increasing their maritime power. He succeeded, and in a very short time had at his command a formidable fleet of 200 ships, well equipped to resist any invaders. There was at that time no other man in Greece who could have accomplished so much. Themistocles loved his country, and possessed all the brilliant qualities of a great statesman, yet he had his faults. His passion for distinction had never been surpassed, and he was so avaricious that he would accept bribes and stoop to various other dishonest actions for mere love of gain. Most of his countrymen were displeased at his fondness for display, which in a man of humble birth was regarded as evidence of bad taste. On the other hand, he won the hearts of the lower classes by the pains he took to salute each person by name, as though he were deserving of special consideration. Besides, he was just in his decisions when business transactions were submitted to him, and generally settled them satisfactorily. So anxious was he for notoriety, that long before he became famous he prevailed upon a young musician who played well upon the lyre to practice at his house, that people might inquire who lived there and seek for admittance. Later, he appeared at the Olympic Games in such splendid equipage, furnished his tent gorgeously, and gave the most sumptuous entertainments, all for the purpose of making himself the observed of all observers. At this period, the Athenians had great taste for tragedy, which had been brought to a high standard. Prizes were given to those who produced the best, and no pains were spared to make them attractive. Themistocles competed for one of these prizes, produced a play entirely at his own expense, and won. In memory of his success, he put up this inscription. Themistocles exhibited the tragedy, Phrenicus composed it, Adimantus presided. We have said that Themistocles and Aristides frequently quarrelled. Two men so entirely opposed in character could scarcely be good friends. Aristides was the inferior in ability, but vastly superior in honesty and integrity. His one desire was to benefit his country, regardless of party or self-interest and for this very reason he gained enemies among those who managed public affairs. His uprightness and justice were acknowledged by all who knew him, and he received the surname of The Just. But he always opposed Themistocles, and in the course of three or four years they became such bitter enemies that he was banished by ostracism, his rival being so popular as to influence the multitude to this end. Banishment by ostracism was managed in this way. Every citizen took a piece of pot or shell, on which he wrote the name of the person he would have banished. These were collected and counted by the magistrates. If the number amounted to 6,000, they were sorted, and the man whose name appeared the greatest number of times had to leave Athens within 10 days and remain in exile 10 years. Xerxes had succeeded Darius as king of Persia by this time. He was not a man of much ability or experience, but he was anxious for military glory, and so resolved to invade Greece, as his father would have done a second time, had he lived long enough. It was fortunate for the Greeks that Xerxes was such an inferior general as he proved himself, for he came with a mighty army, the sight of which spread terror among the enemy. But he passed the winter at Sardis, and during that season gave the Greeks a chance to prepare for resistance. Themistocles undertook the command of the Athenian forces, and tried to persuade the people to go out on the ships and fight the Persians as far away from the coast of Greece as possible. But this plan met with so much opposition that he joined his army with that of the Lacedaemonians, and marched to the Pass of Tempe, which forms the entrance to northern Greece. This was found to be an unsafe position, being open to attack from the rear, so the army returned without having accomplished anything. And then, the Thessalians, and all of the northern Greeks as far as Boeotia, being left to themselves, went over to Xerxes. Thus, the proposition of Themistocles to fight by sea gained favour, and he was sent to guard the Straits of Artemisium, which formed the entrance to the Gulf of Thessaly. When the forces assembled, there arose a dispute as to who should take the lead. The Lacedaemonians wanted to command, and to have Eurybiades for their admiral. Themistocles showed his wisdom by persuading his countrymen to yield, and assured them that if in this war they behaved like men, they need not fear, but all the Greeks would be willing enough to submit to them for the future. Eurybiades was astonished when the Persian armada hove in sight, for he had never seen such an array of ships. But when he was informed that 200 more were coming around the island of Skiathus, his heart misgave him and he determined to retire to a position where the land army and the fleet of the Greeks could unite. 
The fights that took place in the Straits of Euboea were not so important as to decide the war, but they served as experience to the Greeks, which proved of great benefit to them. They had shown themselves brave soldiers on land, but it remained to be seen what sort of seamen they would become. While defending Euboean Straits, the Greeks resolved to make a stand at Thermopylae also. This was a narrow pass about a mile in length, lying between the lofty mountains of Eta, and considered, after Tempe, the most important point for defence against an invading army. A small band of Spartans under Leonidas was sent there. History tells us of the brave resistance they made against the mighty hosts of Xerxes, and how they were overcome at last by the treachery of Malian, who led the Persian army by a secret path across the mountains. When the dreadful news was brought to Artemisium that King Leonidas and all his soldiers were slain, and that Xerxes was master of the passage leading into Greece, a panic seized upon the army, and they returned to the interior of the country. Xerxes advanced, burning and ransacking the cities of the Phoetians without mercy. The Athenians were desirous that the northern Greeks should unite with them and make a stand at Boeotia for the protection of Attica. But, they were intent upon defending Peloponnesus and resolved to gather all their forces within that district and build a wall from sea to sea across the narrow isthmus which connects it with central Greece and thus defend themselves. The Athenians were very angry at being deserted by their confederates because they knew how useless it would be to attempt to fight the numerous armies of Xerxes alone. There seemed nothing left for them but to leave their city and take to their ships. But this plan met with opposition from the majority, who declared that they could not hope for success if they forsook the temples of their gods and exposed the tombs of their ancestors to the fury of the enemy. All the arguments that Themistocles brought to bear were of no avail, so he employed oracles to convert the people to his opinions. The dragon of Minerva suddenly disappeared from her temple, and, at the suggestion of Themistocles, the priests made it known that the offerings set before the holy place remained untouched, and that the goddess had forsaken the city and preceded the army to the sea. The voice of the oracle constantly urged the people to trust to walls of wood, which meant ships, and pronounced the island of Salamis divine, which was interpreted as meaning that the Athenians would meet with good fortune there. Superstition prevailed, and it was soon settled that all who were old enough to fight should embark, and that the women, aged men, children and slaves should be removed for protection to treason. It was heartrending to see the whole city of Athens deserted, and the cries and sobs of the women and children who were leaving their husbands, brothers and fathers, perhaps forever, filled the air. Even the domestic animals were objects of pity as they ran about the town and in their dumb way showed their eagerness to be carried along with their masters. One poor dog jumped into the sea and swam beside the ship all the way to Salamis, falling dead from sheer exhaustion as he reached the shore. In spite of these pathetic scenes, the Athenians, who were going forth to fight, stood firm and resolute. The Trezenians offered a hearty welcome to those who were placed in their care, and passed a vote that they should be maintained at the public expense. The children were free to gather fruit wherever they pleased, they had many other privileges besides, and schoolmasters were provided to attend to their education. Themistocles showed himself wise by recalling Aristides at this time. He had been banished before the war, but it was clear that the people wanted him back, and even feared that to revenge himself, he might be induced to join the Persian army, which would have been a dreadful blow to the cause of Greece. A decree was therefore proposed recalling all those who were banished, so that they might give aid to their fellow citizens in this trying period. Now when the fleet had assembled off Salamis, Eurybiades grew faint-hearted and wanted to set sail for the Isthmus, where the Peloponnesian army was encamped. But Themistocles would not listen to such a thing, and his opposition led to a serious quarrel. Some sided with one commander, some with the other, but Themistocles boldly maintained his ground, and while he spoke, an owl was seen, which, after flying to the right of the ship, came and perched on top of the mast. This was considered a happy omen, for the owl was sacred to Minerva, the goddess of the Athenians, and everybody eagerly prepared at once to fight. The enemy's fleet advanced and covered the neighbouring coasts, while Xerxes himself was observed marching towards the shore with his land forces. Such a prodigious armament struck terror to the hearts of the Greeks, and many of them gave orders for their pilots to steer that very night for the Isthmus. Determined to retain the position he held in the straits, and not to allow any of his confederates to desert, Themistocles contrived a stratagem for carrying out his plans. There was in the Athenian army a Persian captive named Sicinus, who was warmly attached to Themistocles and ready to obey any of his commands. Themistocles sent him secretly to Xerxes, with the assurance that the commander of the Athenians desired to join the Persian army, and was therefore the first to inform him of the intended flight of the Greeks. 
He begged the king not to let them escape, but advised him to take advantage of their confusion to attack and destroy their whole navy while they were at a distance from the land army. Of course, Themistocles did not intend to turn traitor to his country, but Xerxes was completely deceived by his message and ordered the commanders of his fleet to set out at once with 200 ships and so surround all the islands as to prevent the Greeks from escaping and added that the rest of the ships would follow at their leisure. Aristides was one of the first to observe this movement of the enemy, and at great personal risk made his way to the tent of Themistocles to inform him of it. The Athenian commander was touched by the generosity of the man whom he had long regarded as his enemy, and told him of the message he had sent to Xerxes, at the same time urging him to entreat the Greeks to stay and fight. Aristides approved of the stratagem, and went among the different officers of the navy with words of encouragement and hope but they would not believe that the enemy's vessels were upon them until a galley deserted from the Persians and came in to confirm the report that all the straits and passages were threatened. Then the Greeks were forced to fight whether they would or not, and this was just what Themistocles had striven for. As soon as day dawned, Xerxes had a golden throne placed on an eminence and seated himself thereon to watch the movements of his army. Secretaries stood near to write down all the details of the fight which was to decide the fate of Greece. Xerxes and the princes who were with him felt sure of victory, but there was one person present who saw at what a disadvantage the large Persian ships would be in the narrow straits of Salamis. And this was Artemisia, the queen of Halicarnassus, who tried to dissuade the king from engaging, but her argument had little weight and the order for attack was given. Meanwhile, Themistocles had not only chosen the most advantageous place, but he also managed not to begin the fight until the time of day when the fresh breeze from the open sea began to blow and produce breakers in the channel. They were not inconvenient to the Greek ships, but rendered the cumbrous Persian ones quite unmanageable. The Greeks kept their eyes fixed on their commander, not only because they were eager to follow his lead, but because at the very beginning of the battle, Ariamenes, brother and admiral to Xerxes, began to oppose his ship and to shower down darts and arrows upon it as though he had been stationed on a castle. After a time, the Persian and the Athenian galley stuck their prows into each other so that they were fastened together. Then, Ariamenes attempted to jump on the Greek vessel, but he was run through the body with a pike and thrust into the sea. His corpse was recognised and picked up by Artemisia, who commanded one of the ships. Although the Persians had a tremendous fleet, only a part of it could enter the narrow arm of the sea at a time, and their ships fell foul of one another. We need not follow all the details of the Battle of Salamis, one of the most memorable in history. It is only necessary to say that when the day declined, the Greeks had gained a complete victory. The Queen of Halicarnassus distinguished herself by such daring deeds of bravery that day that Xerxes, indignant at his defeat, contemptuously exclaimed, My men are become women, and my women men. Now Themistocles and Aristides had a consultation, and decided that the best thing they could do was to try to get Xerxes and his army out of Greece, for if permitted to remain there, they would certainly seek to avenge their recent defeat. The sagacity of Themistocles was again brought into play to accomplish this object. Among his captives was one of the king's slaves, named Arnaces, who was sent to his master with this message that the Greeks, who were now victorious, were determined to sail to the Hellespont and destroy the bridge of boats there. But Themistocles, being a friend to Xerxes, sent to reveal this secret to him, in order that he might hasten to his own dominions before it was too late, promising that he would cause delays and hinder his confederates from pursuing him. Xerxes was so frightened that he hurried out of Greece with all the speed in his power, never for a moment doubting that Themistocles was really his friend. The city of Aegina was considered to have done the best service in the war, and to Themistocles was awarded the prize among the commanders. The Lacedaemonians took him with them to Sparta, where they rewarded Eurybiades their commander for bravery, but crowned the Athenian general with an olive wreath for his wisdom and good management. They also presented him with the best chariot in the city, and sent an escort of 300 young men with him to the border of their country. The next time he appeared at the Olympic Games, everybody stared at him, and he was pointed out to the strangers present as a hero. He was so gratified by the clapping of hands that greeted his appearance that he confessed to his friends he then reaped the fruit of all his labours for Greece. Many anecdotes are told of Themistocles, which prove how fond he was of having honours shown to him. When he was chosen admiral by his countrymen, he would not quite arrange anything until the day of sailing, so that he might appear full of important business and seem powerful to those who stood about him. 
When he saw the bracelets and necklaces on the dead bodies cast ashore by the sea after the battle of Salamis, he said to a friend, You may take these things, for you are not Themistocles. To Antiphates, a handsome young man who had once treated him with disdain, but was ready to court him when he became famous, he said, Time, young man, has taught us both a lesson. He declared that the Athenians did not honour or admire him, but made a sort of plane tree of him, under which they would shelter themselves in a storm, and which they would rob of its leaves and branches when fine weather appeared again. An officer, who thought he had done the state some service, boastingly compared his actions with those of Themistocles, whereupon the latter answered him with this fable. Once upon a time a dispute arose between a feast day and the day after the feast, said the latter, I am full of hurry and bustle, whereas with you folks enjoy quietly everything already provided. Very true, returned the feast day. But if I had not been before you, you would not be at all. So if Themistocles had not come first, where would you be now? When his own son persuaded his mother, and through her means himself also, to grant a favour, Themistocles said laughingly, You, child, are greater than any man in Greece. For the Athenians command the Greeks, I command the Athenians, your mother commands me, and you command your mother. When two young men courted his daughter at the same time, he preferred the worthy man to the rich one, saying, I would rather have you marry a man without money than money without a man. Someone offered to teach Themistocles the art of memory, but he answered, Ah, teach me rather the art of forgetting, for I often remember what I would not, and cannot forget what I would. There are many more anecdotes related to this great general, but we have quoted enough to show that his ready wit equalled his military skill. Having secured Athens from all danger of an immediate attack, Themistocles next devoted himself to rebuilding and fortifying it. He did the same to the harbour of Piraeus, which provided seacoast accommodations for the city. Then he had another scheme, which shows the immoral side of his character. He alluded to it before a large assembly of citizens, but said at the same time that he could not explain it in detail before so many people. Then communicate it to Aristides alone, they said, and if he approves, we agree to carry it into execution. This is a proof of the confidence still reposed in Aristides, in spite of the injustice and ingratitude that had been shown him. Themistocles took him aside and told him that what he wished was to destroy the whole Greek fleet that had gone into harbour for the winter his object being to make the Athenians stronger on the sea than their neighbours. Aristides was shocked at such a shameful proposition, and told his fellow citizens that the enterprise which Themistocles had in view would indeed be advantageous, but most dishonourable. The Athenians then ordered it to be abandoned at once. After that, Themistocles was guilty of accepting bribes and of resorting to other dishonourable deeds, which made him so unpopular that he was publicly reprimanded, Thereupon he haughtily reminded the citizens of the numerous services he had performed in the interests of his country, and of the gratitude due him. At length his pride and vanity became unbearable, and he was banished by ostracism. He proceeded to Argos, and shortly after his arrival there certain papers found among the effects of one Porcinius, who had been put to death for the crime of treason, cast suspicion upon the banished general. He was accused and his enemies were so eager for his punishment that they refused to listen to the defence which he made by letter, and dispatched officers to fetch him back to Athens to stand trial. But he had been warned in time to make his escape, and, after wandering about under an assumed name in disguise, he at last reached Persia in safety. By that time Xerxes was dead, and his son, Artaxerxes, had succeeded him on the throne. Themistocles first sought an interview with Artabanus, a military officer high in command to whom he said, I am a Greek and have travelled a great distance on purpose to speak with your king about matters of the greatest importance to Persia. The officer replied that if he was willing to conform to the customs of the country and to prostrate himself before the king, he might be permitted to see him and speak to him. Themistocles promised to do so. But, returned Artabanus, who shall we say you are? Nobody must know that before the king himself answered Themistocles. Thereupon he was introduced to the royal presence, and upon being questioned, answered, through an interpreter, in the following contemptible manner. The man who now stands before you, O king, is Themistocles the Athenian, an exile, 
persecuted by the Greeks. The Persians have suffered much by me, but it must not be forgotten that after I had saved my own country, I did them a service. I come to you now, prepared to receive your favour and to offer my submission. Believe what my enemies have said of the service I have done the Persians, and make use of the opportunity my misfortunes afford you to show your generosity, rather than to satisfy your revenge. If you save me, you save your suppliant. If you kill me, you destroy the enemy of Greece. The king made no answer, but he congratulated himself upon his good fortune, and prayed secretly that the gods might always influence his enemies thus to drive off their ablest men. In his sleep that night, he was heard to exclaim three times, as in an ecstasy of delight, Themistocles the Athenian is mine. The next day, the exile was ordered to appear before the king and his council. After graciously saluting him, Artaxerxes spoke thus, I owe you two hundred talents, for that is the price I set upon your head, and as you have delivered yourself up to me, it is but just that you should receive the reward. In addition, I promise you my protection. Now, speak freely and let us hear what you have to propose with regard to Greece. A man's discourse is like a piece of tapestry, which when spread out displays figures that were concealed among its folds. Therefore, let me have time, returned the Athenian. This flowery, mysterious manner of expressing oneself was customary among Oriental nations, and the king was so pleased with the bearing of Themistocles that although he did not understand him, he granted him all the time he desired. Themistocles demanded a year, and during that period he studied the Persian language until he could converse without an interpreter. He won the king's favour beside, and became so popular at court that the nobility grew jealous of the favours that were shown him. The king took him hunting, talked with him freely, and introduced him to the queen mother, who honoured him with her confidence. Once he was sent on business of importance to the sea coast, and stopped at a city called Leontocephalus, or Lion's Head. The governor of Upper Phrygia hated him, and engaged some men to kill him, but he was saved in this way. He was taking a nap one afternoon when the mother of the gods appeared to him in a dream and said, Beware, Themistocles, of the lion's head, lest the lion crush you. For this warning I require your daughter for my servant. Themistocles awoke in terror, devoutly returned thanks to the goddess, and left the place of danger. As he travelled on, one of his horses that carried his tent happened to fall into a river, and at night the servants spread out the wet hangings to dry. The would-be assassins mistook these hangings in the moonlight for the tent of Themistocles and advanced with drawn swords, expecting to kill their victim while he slept. But they were repulsed by his servants, who killed some and captured others. In honour of the goddess who had saved his life, Themistocles built a temple at Magnesia and appointed his daughter priestess of it. After that, he behaved with great prudence and lived for a long time at Magnesia in peace and security. This was not to continue, however, for Egypt revolted, the Athenians took sides with her, and Simon, the great general, was master of the seas. Then the king of Persia called on Themistocles to make good his promise and help him to oppose Greece. That he could not do, for he still loved his country, too well to fight against her. He resolved, therefore, to put an end to his existence. Having offered sacrifices to the gods, he assembled his friends, bade them farewell, took a dose of poison, and expired almost immediately. The people of Magnesia erected a handsome monument to his memory, and the king's admiration was excited to such a degree by the cause and manner of his death that special honours and privileges were granted to his descendants. End of chapter 9「Chapter 10 of Our Young Folks Plutarch. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maggie Travers in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Our Young Folks Plutarch by Rosalie Kaufman. Chapter 10 Aristides. In the life of Themistocles, there is a great deal said concerning the character of Aristides and comparing the traits of the two Greek statesmen. They were never friends. 
Some historians say that the first ill feeling between them arose on account of a love affair, both, when very young, forming an attachment for the same girl. She died, but the rival lovers never forgave each other. When they grew older and took prominent parts in public affairs, Aristides was so honest, and Themistocles so tricky, that they could never agree on any point. Once, when Aristides had carried a case against Themistocles, who had fought hard for it, he said, quote, The affairs of the Athenians can never prosper unless they throw Themistocles and me into the Barathrum. This was a deep pit into which criminals were thrown headlong. Aristides did not mean to call himself or his opponent a criminal, but it was his belief that so long as two men guided by such different principles controlled Athenian politics, there could be no peace or prosperity. He was a thoroughly conscientious man, and always put himself and his personal interest out of the question in the cause of right. Even when one of his enemies was about to be condemned for a criminal action, Aristides stood up and begged the judges to give the man a chance to defend himself. When he was called upon at one time to settle a quarrel between two private citizens, one of them tried to influence him by telling him what injurious things the other had done to him. Quote, "'Tell me rather, good friend,' he said, "'what wrong he has done you, for it is your cause, not my own, that I am judging.'" Aristides, upon being appointed treasurer of the public funds, accused those who had held the office before him of having stolen some of the money. Thereupon, Themistocles, who was among the accused, turned the tables upon him and got him condemned. But the court of the Areopagus defended him, and not only secured his release from the fine imposed, but had him chosen treasurer again. He then changed his tactics and allowed those who were under him to steal the public money without appearing to know it. This made him very popular with the few who were benefited, and when his term of office expired, they begged that he might be reappointed. When this was about to be done, he thus addressed the Athenians, quote, While I managed your money like an honest man, I was loaded with abuse. But now, when I suffer a lot of thieves to rob you, I become a good citizen. But I assure you I am more ashamed of the present honor than I was of the former disgrace. For I see that you prefer to oblige bad men rather than to take proper care of the treasury. End quote. Thus he turned the dishonest men against him, but gained the praise and confidence of the worthy ones. It was about this time that a Persian fleet arrived at Marathon and began to destroy all the neighboring country. Miltides was appointed first in command of the Athenian forces to oppose the enemy, and Aristides second. It was the custom for the generals to serve in turn, but Aristides cared so much more for the welfare of his country than he did for personal glory, that, feeling Miltides to be a more able general than himself, he gave up his right, and showed the inferior officers that he considered it no disgrace to submit to the directions of wise and able men. His example was followed by the other generals, and Melitides took the whole command. The Mystocles and Aristides fought together with such success that the Persians were driven back to their ships. The Greeks then hurried to Athens, fearing an attack there while the city was not properly defended. Aristides was left at Marathon to watch the prisoners and the spoils, and although there was much gold and silver scattered about, as well as rich garments and other booty, he neither touched them himself nor permitted his men to do so. In course of time, Aristides was called the Just, because it was his love of justice that had more weight with the common people than any of his other virtues. Strange to say, this very surname, which added to his popularity at first, caused his unhappiness later. For the Mystides became envious of the weight attached to his decisions, and raised a report that Aristides was trying to abolish courts and get supreme power in his own hands. This made the Athenians so uneasy that Aristides was banished by ostracism, a proceeding that we have explained in the life of Themistocles. When the people were inscribing their names on the shells for the ostracism, 
an ignorant countryman, who did not know Aristides and could not, handed his shell to him with the request that he would write Aristides upon it. "'Has Aristides ever injured you?' asked the good man. "'No, and I don't even know him,' answered the countryman. "'But it annoys me to hear him called the just all the time.' Without another word, Aristides wrote his name upon the shell. As he quitted Athens, he raised his hands towards heaven, and prayed that his countrymen might never see the day which should force them to remember Aristides. Three years later he was recalled because Xerxes marched into Attica, and it was feared that Aristides might go over to the enemy and induce many of his countrymen to do likewise. But he was incapable of so base a deed, and after his recall he risked his life one night by going to the tent of Themistocles with a piece of important news. Quote, Let us lay aside our childish enmity now, he said, and work together to save Greece. You may rule, but let me advise you to engage the enemy in the straits without delay, for the sea all around us is covered with their fleet. We cannot escape, so let us fight and prove ourselves men of courage. End of quote. Themistocles replied, quote, I would not be outdone by you in generosity, Aristides. My future actions shall be as noble as this one of yours. End quote. He then revealed to him the stratagem he had planned, which was to send a messenger to inform the Parisians that the Greeks were going to quit the Straits of Salamis, and if they desired to crush them, there was no time to lose. Aristides gave his hearty approval and did all he could to aid Themistocles. Perceiving a body of the enemy collected on a small island in the straits near Salamis, he selected the bravest of his countrymen and went there in small boats. Challenging the Parisians to battle, he slew all except a few distinguished persons, whom he took prisoners and sent to Themistocles. He received high praise for this great service, and Themistocles sought his advice still further as soon as the battle was over. He said, You have performed a remarkable deed, Aristides, but much more remains to be done. If we sail quickly to Hellenspont and destroy the bridge there, the enemy will not be able to escape, and we can conquer them completely. Quote, Let us not think of such a thing, returned Aristides. It will be better for us to devise some means of driving the Persians out of Greece without delay, for should we destroy their only means of escape, they will fight so desperately that we shall be made to suffer no end of misery. End quote. Themistocles saw the wisdom of this advice, and his busy brain soon conceived a plan not only for getting rid of the enemy, but at the same time for placing himself in a favorable light before the king. This is what he did. He sent one of the prisoners secretly to Xerxes to inform him that the Greeks were preparing to advance to the Hellenspont and destroy the bridge, but that out of regard for his royal person, Themistocles was doing the very best he could to prevent it. The message had the desired effect, for Xerxes was so terrified that he hurried home, leaving Mardonius, his commander-in-chief, behind, with a force of three hundred thousand of his best troops. Now, although the king was out of the way, the Greeks still had much to fear, for with such an army at his command, Mardonius was very powerful, and constantly made his presence felt by the threatening messages he sent the various Greek tribes. But the king's advice he tried to win over the Athenians, and offered, if they would take no further share in the war, to provide them with plenty of money, rebuild their city, and make them sole rulers of Greece. The Lacedaemonians were so afraid that they might accept the tempting proposal that they sent ambassadors to offer protection and support to their wives and children, so long as the war should last. It is true that the Athenians were in dire distress, having lost their city, but they understood the offer and were so indignant that they sent the following reply. We could forgive the Persians who worship gold, for supposing that we might be bought. But we are offended that Lacedaemonians, who are, like ourselves, Greeks, should imagine us capable of deserting our country under any pretext whatsoever. We are poor and wretched, 
but we would not exchange all the treasures either above or underground for the liberty of greece this was dictated by aristides to the persians he said pointing to the heavens quote, as long as that sun shines so long will the athenians carry on war with the persians for their country which has been ruined and for their temples which have been profaned and burnt End quote. when mardonius entered attica the second time aristides met him with an army and in the first skirmish that ensued Mecistius was killed this was a terrible blow to the persians because Mecistius was their cavalry general and a man of remarkable courage strength and personal beauty when he fell and they saw that he was mortally wounded they fled and left the greeks masters of the field their loss had not been great in numbers but they could have spared many in place of their general for whom they mourned very deeply they filled the air with their lamentations and as a sign of mourning cut off their hair as well as the manes of their horses and mules after this engagement there was no fighting for a long time because both the persian and the greek priest announced that all the omens promised victory to the side that stood ready for defence but defeat to the one who made the attack at length mardonius felt obliged in spite of the omens to fall upon the greeks because his stock of provisions was getting very low and he saw fresh troops joining the enemy every day and increasing their strength so one night he gave orders for an attack to be made at break of day thus expecting to take the greek unawares and he would have succeeded had it not been for the warning the athenians got in this way at midnight a man approached the grecian camp on horseback and bade the sentinels call aristides to whom he had something important to say aristides came immediately and the man spoke thus quote, i am alexander king of macedon who for the friendship i bear you have exposed my life to save you from a surprise for mardonius will give you battle to-morrow not because he expects to succeed but because his provisions are scarce the soothsayers give him no encouragement but he must either risk a battle or see his whole army perish from want prepare yourself but do not reveal what i have said to you End quote. Aristides thanked the king and promised to tell nobody until after the battle except Pausanias, who was commander-in-chief. As Alexander rode off, therefore, he hastened to the tent of Pausanias, who, on receiving the warning, summoned his captains and gave orders for the army to be put in battle array. The Athenians felt certain of victory. Let us fight, they said, not only in defense of our country, but that the trophies of Marathon and Salamis may belong to the people of Athens, and not to Miletides alone. The first day passed without decisive action, and during the night the Grecian camp was removed to a spot that offered greater advantages. The Lacedaemonians made no alteration in their position, and they were the first to be attacked. For a while they allowed themselves to be slain without offering resistance, because Pausanias, who was sacrificing at a distance, could get no favorable signs, though he prayed aloud and entreated the gods with tears in his eyes. Suddenly the soothsayers announced a change and gave promise of victory. Then, with shouts and yells of delight, the Lacedaemonians rushed to the fight like wild beasts, so furious were their actions. They struck their pikes into the breast and faces of the enemy, and killed many, though they, too, fought desperately. Meanwhile, the Athenians, hearing of the engagement, marched back to assist the Lacedaemonians just as they were beating off the Persians. A Spartan named Armnestus killed Mardonius by a blow on the head with a stone. The Persian camp was taken, and their men were slain by thousands. The Greeks had gained a splendid victory, but it nearly caused their ruin, both because the Athenians and the Spartans claimed the honor of the day, and would have settled the question at the point of the sword. But Aristides did all he could to pacify the generals, and at last persuaded them to leave it to the judgment of the whole country. A council was called, 
and it was decided that in order to prevent a civil war the honor should be conferred neither on the spartans nor on the athenians but on the platinians aristides yielded at once and pausanias followed his example both the spartans and the athenians built temples in honor of the victory and sent to consult the oracle at delphi as to what sacrifice they should offer the answer directed them to build an altar to jupiter the deliverer but not to offer any sacrifice upon it until all the fires in the country had been put out because they had been polluted by the barbarians pure fire was then to be brought from delphi the greek generals visited every part of the country and caused the fires to be extinguished while a man named eucetus hastened to delphi for a fresh supply on arriving there he purified himself with water put a crown of laurel on his head, took fire from the altar, and hurried back to Plataea, where he arrived before sunset. But he had exhausted himself by traveling so fast, and had only time to salute his fellow citizens and deliver the sacred fire, when he fell down dead. A monument was erected to him in the temple of Diana, on which was inscribed, Here lies Eucetus who went to Delphi and back in one day. When the first general assembly of the Greeks was called after peace had been restored, Aristides proposed that priests from all the states should meet at the Plataea each year to offer sacrifices to the gods, and that every fifth year the Eulatheria, or Games of Freedom, should be celebrated there. Also that ships, men, and horses should be annually supplied for war against the Persians, but that the Platanians should devote themselves to religious services and never again stain their hands with human blood. This became a law, and the yearly procession for the sacrifice began at break of day. First, a trumpeter appeared, sounding the advance. Then followed chariots loaded with mirth and garlands. Next, a black bull, followed by young men carrying wine and milk in large vessels, jars of oil and precious ointments. No slaves could appear in this procession because it took place in honor of men who died fighting for freedom. Last of all came the chief magistrate of Plataea. It was considered unlawful at other times for this dignitary to touch iron or to wear any but a white garment, but on this occasion his robe was purple and he carried a sword and a large jug. Drawing water from a spring, he washed with his own hands the little pillars of the monuments over the dead, and rubbed them with essence. Then he killed the bull upon a pile of wood, prayed to Jupiter and Mercury, and invited the brave men who had fallen in the cause of Greece to the banquet, at the same time filling a bowl with wine and saying, I present this bowl to the men who died for the liberty of Greece. This was the ceremony observed by the Plataeans. Another law that Aristides caused to be passed was that of the Archons should be chosen from among the Athenians, because he thought that the commons should have a voice in the government as well as the upper classes. As we have said, the people had great regard for the judgment and honesty of Aristides, and were always willing to refer to his decision. Once, when Themistocles told the assembly that he had a plan to propose for the benefit of Athens, which ought to be kept secret, he was requested to tell it to Aristides. It was to burn the whole fleet of the other Greeks, so that the Athenians might become supreme rulers. Aristides was shocked at such a dishonorable proposition, and assured his countrymen, quote, that nothing could be more advantageous than the project of Themistocles, nor anything more unjust. End quote. So the matter was dropped without the particulars being given, simply because Aristides had pronounced against it. Eight years later, Aristides was sent again to fight the barbarians, sharing the command with Simon. His gentle, courteous manners formed such a striking contrast to the harshness and severity of the Spartan commanders, that in course of time several of the Greek nations placed themselves under him and joined the Athenians. Aristides made himself more popular still by lessening the taxes all over the country. Notwithstanding his great influence and power, he was always poor, but he was prouder of poverty than of his trophies. He died at Athens, 
well advanced in years and greatly lamented by his countrymen. Great honors were shown to his memory, and a monument was erected to him after his death. End of chapter 10 Recording by Maggie Travers in Murfreesboro, Tennessee Chapter 11 of Our Young Folks Plutarch This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maggie Travers in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Our Young Folks Plutarch by Rosalie Kaufman. Chapter 11. Simon. Simon had the misfortune to lose his parents at so early an age that his education was seriously neglected, and he became in consequence a very immoral young man. But he was blessed with a noble and generous disposition, besides other good qualities, which led to his becoming later in life the ablest general of his day. He was as brave as Miltiades, his father. His judgment was considered as good as that of Themistocles, and he was more upright and honest than either. Simon was a handsome man, being tall and well-built, and he possessed what was looked upon as a great adornment among the Greeks of his time a profusion of thick curls that covered his head and fell around his neck. Miltiades left an unpaid fine, which his son felt bound in honor to settle, but he had not the means, and was sorely puzzled where to turn for them. It was his sister, Alpinus, who helped him out of the difficulty in this way. Callias, a rich Athenian, wanted to marry her but could not get Simon's consent, However, he secured it by promising in return to pay the fine, and so it was arranged. When the Medes and Persians invaded Greece, Themistocles urged his countrymen to carry all their arms on shipboard and meet the enemy in the Straits of Salamis. The Athenians were amazed at this advice, but Simon immediately went to the citadel with a bridle in his hand, which he offered to the goddess, to show that seamen were needed, not horsemen. Then, taking a shield, he proceeded to the seashore, and thus inspired his fellow soldiers with so much confidence that they did not hesitate to follow him. He distinguished himself at the Battle of Salamis, and ever after his countrymen loved and admired him very much, and when he became interested in politics, he was preferred to Themistocles. Aristides prized him highly, and did what he could to advance him to the highest offices in the state knowing that his honesty would prove a safeguard against the deceit and boldness of Themistocles. When the Medes were driven out of Greece, Simon was elected admiral, when he immediately set to work to make his seamen superior to all others. He was so kind and good to the allies that without fighting for it, he gained the command of all of Greece. He then sailed for Thrace with the forces, because the Persians had seized the city of Eon and were giving the Greeks in the neighborhood a great deal of annoyance. He defeated the Persians in battle, shut them up within the walls of the town, then set upon the Thracians and drove them out of the country to prevent their lending supplies to Eon. Thereupon Butes, who commanded the Persians, set fire to that town and burned himself, his property, and all his relations. So Simon did not get much booty, but he put the Athenians in possession of the country about, and it was so rich and fertile that it was a good place for them to settle. The people of Athens were so pleased with what Simon had done that they permitted him to erect three marble monuments, with appropriate inscriptions, in honor thereof. He next went to the island of Skyros, which was inhabited by the Dolopes, a nation of pirates and took possession of it. That done, he recollected that Theseus, the ancient hero of Athens, had been treacherously killed on the island Skyros by King Lycomedes, and that an oracle had requested the Athenians to take back his remains and to honor him as a demigod. So Simon set to work to search for the tomb, which he found after a long time. He put the remains of Theseus on his own vessel and took them back to the home that hero had left, eight hundred years before. 
The Athenians were so gratified to have the bones of Theseus among them that they prepared games to celebrate their return. One feature of the entertainment was the reading of tragedies by Sophocles and Aeschylus, two of the best composers of their day. These tragedies were written for this occasion, and it was universally agreed that Simon should award the prize, though heretofore it had been decided by lot. Sophocles was the fortunate competitor, and Aeschylus felt so distressed because he was not successful that he went to Sicily where he spent the rest of his life. An interesting story is told of Simon by an ancient author who chanced to meet him at a supper given at the house of Laomedon. After the meal, Simon was asked to sing. He amiably complied and was much praised for his musical talent. Then the guest went further and recounted the various public actions he had performed, until, interrupting them, he said, You omit the very exploit for which I give myself most credit. What is it? Tell us, urged one after another. And Simon then told the following story. When our Grecian allies had secured the prisoners at Sestos and Byzantium, they gave me the privilege of dividing the booty. I therefore placed the prisoners in one lot, and their jewels, rich clothing, and arms in another, telling the allies to take their choice, and assuring them that we Athenians would be contented with what they left. Thinking that I had made an absurd division, they naturally chose the pile of costly chains, bracelets, rich gold collars, and robes of scarlet and purple, laughing in their sleeves at me for being satisfied with a lot of slaves, who, being unaccustomed to work, seemed perfectly useless. Not long after, the friends and countrymen of my prisoners offered large sums for their ransom. Then I appeared in a more favorable light, for I got money enough for my slaves to purchase at least four months' provisions for my ships, and to send a quantity besides to the Athenian treasury." The guest acknowledged that Simon's management on that occasion was indeed worthy of praise. In course of time Simon became a rich man, and he deserved it, for he used his means, as every man of wealth ought to do, in giving pleasure to others. He ordered the fences of his fields and gardens to be removed, so that strangers as well as his own countrymen might help themselves to all the fruit and flowers they wanted. A supper of plain but good and plentiful food was spread at his house every evening, and all the poor citizens were invited to partake of it, so that instead of devoting time and thought to money-making, they might turn their attention more to public affairs. When he took a walk, Simon was always attended by a party of young men well clothed, and if they happened to meet an aged citizen in mean attire, one of them was ordered to exchange with him. They carried money besides, which was slipped into the hands of the better class of poor citizens who stood about in the marketplace. This was done as privately as possible, so as not to give offense. It was said of the generous-hearted Simon that he got riches that he might use them, and use them that he might get honor by them. This was the more remarkable, because all the men of his day, except Aristides and one or two others, enriched themselves out of the public money. But to the very end of his life Simon's hands were clean, and he was never known to do or say anything for the sake of private gain. Once, when a certain Persian revolted from his king and fled to Athens, he sought the protection of Simon and placed in his doorway two cups, one filled with gold and the other with silver coin. Simon cast his eyes upon them and then asked, with a smile, do you desire my hired services or my friendship? Your friendship without doubt, was the reply. Go, then, and take these things back, ordered Simon. For if I be your friend, your money will be mine whenever I need it. Now the time came when the allies objected to furnishing more ships or men for the navy. They said that they were tired of war, and that, as they were no longer troubled by a foreign enemy, they preferred to turn their attention to agriculture. But the Athenian generals would not listen to them and tried to compel them to supply their quota by fines. Simon, as soon as he was in power, adopted a different course. He took ships and money from the Grecian allies, but forced no man to serve in the army or to pay fines. The consequence was that in course of time they were more fitted for manufacturing and tilling the soil than for war. 
The Athenians, on the other hand, were compelled to serve on the ships, and became so thoroughly disciplined and so powerful that, instead of being their fellow soldiers as before, the allies, by their own mistaken short-sightedness, became their subjects. This was when, on account of certain changes, they were forced to pay a tribute or fight, and they had lost all taste for the latter occupation. No man ever did more than Simon to humble the pride of the Persian king, for he was not content with driving him out of Greece, but followed him to Asia Minor, and in one day gained a victory by sea that surpassed Salamis in glory, and won by land that outdid Palatia. The Persian army was completely routed, and the king was so humbled that he made the celebrated treaty of peace, by which he promised that his army should approach no nearer the Grecian sea than a day's journey on horseback, and that none of his ships of war should appear between the Cyanian and the Celiadonian isles. The spoils of this war were publicly sold, and yielded so much that, besides raising the south wall of the citadel of Athens, the conquerors were able to lay the foundation for the long walls called the legs. And this was no trifling matter, for they were built on soft, marshy ground, and it was necessary to sink great stones before a firm support could be attained. All this was done out of the money Simon supplied, and he adorned the city besides. He laid out the fine places of exercise and resort, which became much frequented spots. He planted trees in the public parks, and made of the academy, a barren, dirty field about two miles north of the city, a delightful grove, with shady walks and an open race course. Later the academy became a favorite resort for philosophers, who pursued their studies there. The Persians still kept possession of the Thracian Chersonese, but Simon was sent to drive them out, which he did so successfully that he made the whole of the Chersonese the property of Athens also the gold mines of the island of Thasius. This opened a passage for him into Macedon, but that nation being at peace with the Athenians, he returned home without following up his advantage. Therefore he was accused of having been bribed by Alexander, the king of Macedon, but he made such an able defense of his conduct that he was acquitted. His public life, after that, was devoted to keeping the common people in check, for they wanted to put down the nobility and get the government into their own hands. So long as his power was felt, all went well, but when war broke out again and he was sent in command of the army, the ancient laws and customs were overthrown and the populace, with Pericles at their head, insisted upon trying offenders themselves, instead of leaving them to the court of Aragopagus. This state of affairs grieved Simon when he returned to Athens, but with the leaders to oppose him he was powerless to make any improvements. Besides, he had openly expressed admiration of the simplicity and temperance of the Spartans, and that had, for the moment, rendered him unpopular with his own countrymen. Just then a most fearful earthquake visited Sparta. The ground opened in great chasms, and every house in the city except five was destroyed. It happened that the boys and young men of the city were exercising in the portico at the time, but many of them had started in pursuit of a hare an instant before the shock occurred. The building fell and killed all who were in it. Archidamus, the ruler of Sparta, foreseeing a still greater danger, ordered the trumpets to be sounded to give an alarm to battle. At this all the citizens flocked about him armed, and it was well they did, for taking advantage of the dreadful tumult, the helots flocked in from the fields, bent on murdering the Spartans whom the earthquake had spared. Finding them armed, however, they repaired to the neighboring villages and declared open war. Thereupon the Lacedaemonians sent to Athens for aid, and Simon was sent with an army. After restoring peace, he returned home, but the Spartans had occasion to ask again for the assistance of the Athenian army. But when the Athenians arrived, instead of being received with open arms, they were accused of dishonorable designs and sent back. Of course, they were very angry at such an affront and declared that they would have nothing further to do with the Spartans. Part of their indignation they vented on Simon because he had openly expressed admiration of their new enemy and so banished him by ostracism for ten years. 
He soon had an opportunity, however, to prove that he preferred his country to all others, for when the Athenians went to fight the Lacedaemonians at Tanagra, he joined them. The Council of Five Hundred, on hearing that Simon had joined his tribe, commanded the officers not to receive him. So he retired, after enjoining his companions to fight bravely. They were a hundred in number, and fought in a body until all were killed. The Athenians regretted the loss of such a brave set of men, and began to believe that they had perhaps wronged Simon. For had he been so good a friend to the Spartans as they suspected, his tribe would scarcely have fought them so desperately. The following spring, therefore, when there was a prospect of another war, Simon was recalled, because the Athenians loved their country so much that their first consideration always was the public good. He put an end to the war and restored peace between the two cities. After a while, the Athenians became restless, and fearing that they might begin another war at home, Simon fitted out two hundred galleys to make an attack on Egypt and Cyprus, wisely concluding that if his countrymen must fight, it had better be against their natural enemies. When everything was ready and the army was on the point of embarking, Simon dreamed that a furious dog barked at him and mixed with the barking was a horrible kind of human voice that uttered these words, Come on, for thou shalt shortly be a pleasure to my whelps and me. This dream was hard to interpret, but a man skilled in the art said that it presaged Simon's death. A dog, he said, is the enemy of him who barks at, and one is always most a pleasure to one's enemies when one is dead. The mixture of the human voice with the barking signifies the Medes, whose army is made up of Greeks and barbarians. Simon had another bad omen. When he was sacrificing to Bacchus, and the priests were cutting the animal in pieces, a number of ants took up little congealed particles of blood and laid them about Simon's great toe. He observed this only at the moment when the priest called his attention to the fact that the part of the liver known as the head was missing, another very bad sign. Nevertheless, he could not withdraw, and so he set sail. On arriving at Cyprus, Simon sent messengers to consult the oracle at the temple of Juniper Ammon about some secret matters that have to this day never been made known. It is not known what their question was, but they got for answer that Simon was already in the land of the gods. Without understanding the meaning of what they had heard, the messengers returned to the army and were surprised to hear that their general had died before they could have reached the temple. Simon's remains were carried to Athens and buried with honors, a monument being afterwards erected to his memory. End of chapter 11. Recording by Maggie Travers in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Chapter 12 of Our Young Folks Plutarch. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maggie Travers. Our Young Folks Plutarch by Rosalie Kaufman. Chapter 12 Pericles Pericles was fortunate in being the son of people who were not only nobly born, but who knew the advantages of a good education for their child. They therefore took pains to have him well taught, and engaged learned masters for that purpose. It seems strange that a philosopher should give music lessons, but one who bore the name of Damon actually taught Pericles to play upon the lyre. To be sure, he was something besides a musician, for he gave his pupil instruction in politics as well, and in course of time he came to be regarded as such a dangerous meddler in state affairs that he was banished for ten years by ostracism. Zeno, another learned man, taught Pericles natural philosophy, but it was Anaxagoras who did him the greatest service by developing the noblest traits of his character and instilling into his mind the best of principles. He taught his people how to find natural causes for events which frightened the ignorant, and showed him the absurdity of putting faith in anything supernatural. 
The superiority of Pericles was felt by all who came in contact with him, and he had the gift of oratory, which was an immense advantage. He was so eloquent, and his voice was so well trained, that he could hold the attention of his hearers by the hour, and never failed to produce the effect he desired. For many years Pericles took no decided stand in state affairs, but proved himself a brave soldier on the battlefield. When Themistocles was banished from Athens, however, and Aristides was dead, he came forward as the leader of the common people in opposition to Simon, who headed the nobles. He had never been a member of the Aragopolis, which we know was composed of archons, and he had not been appointed to that position. He lessened the power of that court and had more trials conducted by the people. This was all very well so long as Pericles lived, but the effect was bad, because it encouraged bribery, and as those who had not been accustomed to power gained wealth in this way, they became extravagant and luxurious. This led in time to the downfall of the Athenian commonwealth. We have mentioned the eloquence of Pericles and the influence it had on its hearers. Thucydides was once asked which was the better wrestler, Pericles or himself. He answered, When I throw him, he says he was never down, and persuades the very spectators of his fall to believe him. His power was so great that he caused the banishment of Simon by accusing him of treasonably favoring the Lacedaemonians, though he had won several glorious victories, had filled Athens with money and spoils of war, and had made an able defense when the charge was brought. Simon was banished by ostracism, as we have seen in his life, but before the ten years expired a war broke out between the Athenians and the Lacedaemonians, and he entered the ranks of his countrymen, anxious to prove his loyalty. The friends of Pericles forced him to retire, but when the Athenians were defeated, the majority clamored so loudly for the recall of Simon that Pericles was obligated to gratify them. Besides, Simon was so popular with the Lacedaemonians that he induced them to make peace, which Pericles, whom they hated, could not have done. Simon died at the Isle of Cyprus while conducting a fleet, and then Thucydides, a near relation of his, was chosen to lead the opposition, partly because a wise politician was needed to prevent the power of Pericles from becoming absolute. Thucydides did not possess Simon's talent for war, but he was an able statesman, and preserved the balance of power in the government by composing his party of men superior in rank and dignity. So there were two distinct parties in Athens, one called the people, the other the nobility. The former was headed by Pericles, who did his best to retain his popularity by means of shows, games, feasts, and processions. His aim was to keep the populace amused and occupied. He sent out six vessels every year on an eight-month's voyage, manned with a large number of citizens, who were paid for their services and were given this opportunity to become experienced seamen. Many colonies were established in the neighborhood by him, not only to keep foreign nations in awe, but to get rid of those Athenians who had no occupation and were likely to become mischievous in consequence. The name Pericles will be remembered forever in connection with the magnificent temples and public buildings he caused to be erected. In this way, he gave employment to a vast number of mechanics and tradespeople who vied with one another in producing beautiful and good work. Thus money circulated freely among persons of every rank and condition, and a taste for magnificent designs was encouraged. The work was done well, and at the same time with marvelous rapidity. The Thucydides party saw Athens daily growing in beauty, but they complained of the expense and accused Pericles of wasting the public funds simply for the sake of opposing him. When the charge was brought, he rose in the open assembly and asked the people whether they thought he had laid out too much money. A great deal too much, they replied. Then let it be charged to my account, said Pericles, and let the inscription on the buildings stand in my name. He was a good judge of human nature, and knew perfectly well that the vanity of the Athenians would not let them submit to his having the glory alone. So he was not surprised when they exclaimed, No, spend on, use what you please of the public treasure, spare no cost until the work is done. A final contest took place between Thucydides and Pericles to see which would be banished by ostracism. It resulted in the defeat of the former, and the breaking up of his party, leaving Pericles in absolute command, which continued during forty years. He governed wisely, 
never stooped to a bribe, and influenced his people, often against their will, to take steps that he knew to be of advantage to them. With all his power he did not enrich himself, yet he knew the value of money, and was careful that the sum his father had left him should not be wasted or lessened. He had a valuable servant, named Evangelus, who managed his private purse excellently, took care that the proper economy was practiced in his household, and superintended the cultivation of his lands. Pericles gave proof of a good heart once when his old tutor, Anaxagoras, fancied himself neglected, determined to put an end to his life. It was the custom among the ancients when they resolved, for one reason or another, to die, to cover up their heads and starve themselves. When Pericles heard of the resolution of Anaxagoras, he hastened to his house, entreated him to change his mind, and used every argument he could think of to make him do so. At last he asked what would be the fate of his administration if he should be deprived of so valuable a friend and counselor. Then the old man uncovered his head and said, Ah, Pericles, those that have need of a lamp take care to supply it with oil. The ruler never forgot to provide for the sage after that. Pericles gained confidence by the caution he displayed in military matters, for he would never engage in a fight unless sure of success, and he made so many expeditions with his powerful fleet that the kings and the chiefs of the various barbarous nations in the neighborhood of the Euxon Sea were forced to feel the power and greatness of the Athenians. He was wise in restraining his countrymen from seeking foreign conquest, and always told them that they would find occupation enough at home if they would keep the Lacedaemonians in check. They were soon convinced that he was right, for various Greek nations invaded their territory, but they were so successful in repulsing them all that Lacedaemonians consented to a truce with them for thirty years. As soon as this was done, Pericles ordered an expedition against Samos. The pretext he gave was, when he had commanded the Simeans to put an end to war with the Milesians, they had not obeyed. But it is probable that he was persuaded to take this step by Aspasia, who was a Milesian woman. Aspasia was a very remarkable woman, and Pericles was in love with her. She was noted for her wisdom and political ability, and the most learned Athenians flocked to her house with their wives, considering it a privilege to be allowed to listen to her discourse. Socrates was one of her visitors, and Pericles often sought her advice. He was victorious as usual, established a popular form of government in the island, and then returned to Athens, taking with him fifty of the principal men and fifty children as hostages. But the Samians revolted again, and by some secret means recovered their hostages. Then Pericles went to fight them a second time, gained another victory, took possession of their harbor, and laid siege to the city of Samos. But he made a mistake, as even the wisest will at times, and, leaving a small part of the fleet to guard the harbor, he sailed out to give battle to the Phoenicians, who were coming to the relief of the enemy. While he was gone, Milesus, a distinguished philosopher, persuaded his countrymen not to wait quietly and merely defend themselves when an attack came, but to rise and give battle to the Athenians. They did so and gained the victory, taking many prisoners and destroying the greater part of the enemy's fleet. No sooner did the sad news of defeat reach Pericles than he returned with eighty ships, completely routed the Samians, and blocked up their town by building a wall around it. But his men murmured at the waste of time, and it was so difficult to keep them from making an assault that Pericles divided his army into eight parts and ordered them to draw lots to see which should fight. The division that drew a white bean were to feast and enjoy themselves while the others fought. In allusion to this custom, a day of happiness and festivity was called a white day by the ancients. The siege lasted nine months before the Samians surrendered. On his return home, Pericles had a very imposing ceremony performed in honor of those Athenians who had fallen in the Samian War, and delivered a remarkable funeral oration, which certain chroniclers state was composed by Apasia. Some time after this, the Peloponnesian War broke out, and there can be no doubt that Pericles was the author of it. Many causes are given for this war, but it is not easy to discover the real one. Some historians say it was connected with Phidias, the great sculptor, who superintended the splendid buildings for which Athens is indebted to Pericles. 
They tell us that when the sculptor was engaged upon a statue of Minerva, he was accused by a rival who was envious of him of stealing some of the gold intended for the adornment of the statue. Pericles was a good friend to Phidias, and knew that the charge was false. He therefore ordered the gold to be weighed, and Phidias had so disposed of it around the figure of the goddess, which was of ivory, that the task was easy. The innocence of the sculptor was proved, but then fault was found with him for introducing a likeness of himself and of Pericles in a prominent position among the figures that adorned the walls of the Parthenon, or Temple of Paulus, which was built under his supervision. The principal objection was made to a figure of Pericles, who was represented fighting in Amazon, because it gave a false idea of history, and took from Theseus, the founder of Athens, the glory of having combated with the race of warlike women. Phidias was thrown into prison where he died. Aspasia was accused of impiety, because she believed in one god, and had formed new opinions about the appearance of the heavenly bodies. Pericles pleaded for her, and she was acquitted, but he knew that he could not succeed so well in the case of his old tutor, Anaxagoras, who had believed in the unity of God, so he caused him to leave the city. Pericles now began to fear that, as his friends were attacked one after another, his turn would come next, and therefore, to engage the public attention in a different quarter, he hurried on the war. This he did by refusing certain demands made by the Lacedaemonians, who soon showed themselves resolved upon violating the Thirty Years' Truce in consequence. They invaded Attica with a tremendous army under the command of Archidamus, and the Athenians would have given them battle on their own territory if Pericles had been willing. But we know that he never went into any engagement unless he felt sure of success. He did not feel so on this occasion, and said to his countrymen when they urged him, when trees are trimmed, they will grow again, but when men are cut off, the loss is not easily repaired. It required great firmness to withstand all the unjust charges that were brought against him, but Pericles would not move until he felt sure that he was right. He fitted out a hundred ships and sent them against Peloponnesus, but he chose to stay and keep the reins of government in his own hands until he was rid of the enemy. However, after the fleet had gained some victories, he attacked Megara and laid the whole country in ruins. The war would soon have come to an end had it not been for the breaking out of a terrible pestilence, which carried off no less than a fourth of the population. It was a strange disease introduced from Asia, and the Athenian physicians did not know how to treat it. Those who were fortunate enough to recover from an attack were often entirely deprived of memory. And while the fever lasted, many raved against Pericles, who they declared had brought an epidemic by crowding such an immense number of people together during the summer. Of course, those who lived outside the walls had flocked to the city for protection when the war began, and were pinned up in huts and cabins, there not being houses enough to accommodate them. These had no occupation, and it was believed that their mode of life, which encouraged laziness and kept them indoors instead of in the pure open air to which they had been accustomed, had gone far towards increasing the plague. Hoping to remedy the evil, and at the same time to annoy the enemy, Pericles manned a hundred and fifty ships, and when all were ready went on board his own galley prepared to lead them. Suddenly there was an eclipse of the sun. This was regarded by the superstitious soldiers as a bad omen, and caused the greatest consternation. Observing that his pilot was affected like the rest, Pericles took off his cloak, held it over the man's eyes, and asked him whether he found anything to terrify him in that, or considered it a bad omen. The pilot answered in the negative. Then, what is the difference between this and the other darkness, except that something bigger than my cloak has caused that one? Nothing remarkable resulted from this expedition, and the Athenians were so disappointed on account of it, and so many of them died of the epidemic, that Pericles was requested to resign his command. This was decided by vote, as well as the fine he was required to pay. Cleon, who afterwards became general, opposed Pericles more than anyone else. After a time, the people began to see the importance of the policy of Pericles, and he was re-elected general. But he was not long to enjoy his return to favor, for the loss of many friends by the epidemic as well as several members of his family, besides other serious domestic troubles, kept him at home for a year, 
and at last he was struck down with the disease himself. When he was dying, some of the principal citizens who sat by his bed spoke of his virtues, his exploits, his victories, and the splendid buildings he had erected in Athens while he was commander-in-chief. After listening in silence to all they said, he replied, I am surprised that while you praise me for acts in which fortune did her share, you take no notice of the greatest and most honorable thing of all, that no Athenian through my means ever put on mourning. This great general died in the third year of the Peloponnesian War, and his loss was greatly felt by his countrymen. Even those who chafed under his authority when he was alive were forced to acknowledge after he was gone that where severity was required no man had ever been more moderate, and that in cases where mildness would answer no man had better preserved his dignity. What had been termed tyranny had supported the state, and after the death of Pericles wickedness and corruption set in, which there was no one capable of checking. All historians do not agree that he was a great politician, but none can deny that he was a man of genius, and a liberal patron of the arts and of literature. End of chapter 12. Recording by Maggie Travers. Chapter 13 of Our Young Folks Plutarch. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maggie Travers. Our Young Folks Plutarch by Rosalie Kaufman. Chapter 13. Nicias. On the death of Pericles, the rich and powerful men of Athens exerted themselves to place Nicias at the head of the government, feeling convinced that he would be the best person to keep Cleon, an insolent, daring politician, in check. Cleon was in high favor with the common people, who liked his off-hand, familiar way of addressing them, and he had won the good will of some of the poorest of them by liberal presence. Nicias was favored by them because he always treated them with due consideration. This being the case, he was likely to prove an offset to Cleon. But he had one serious fault for a statesman, and that was excessive timidity, which often prompted him to shirk responsibility and remain in retirement instead of taking a decided stand. In one sense, this weakness was a drawback to Nicias, but it rendered him popular, because no one felt awed in his presence. Nicias was noted for his piety, and made offerings of the most costly character to the gods. This he was enabled to do because he was a very wealthy man, being the owner of some rich silver mines. Once, a handsome slave of his represented the god Bacchus at a religious ceremony, and the audience applauded him loudly. Thereupon Nicias rose and said, I should think it impious to keep a slave whom the public voice seems to consecrate to a god. I therefore give him his freedom. It was the custom for the principal cities of Greece to send a select band of musicians to Delos every year to sing praises to Apollo. The procession was called Theoria, and it was considered a great honor to have the management of it. When the musicians landed, the people of the island would flock to the shore and press them to sing, so that they were forced to do so even while putting on their robes and garlands, and otherwise preparing for the ceremony. In order to prevent the disorder which this caused, Nicias, when taking charge of the Theoria, landed first on the Isle of Rhenia in the Aegean Sea, now called Stille, with the choir, the victims for the sacrifices, and all the necessary matters. Then, during the night, he had a bridge, which he had brought from Athens, thrown across the narrow channel to Delos. This bridge was gaily decorated and hung with garlands and tapestry. At break of day he marched over it at the head of the choir, who, dressed in the costliest of robes, sang hymns to the gods as they moved decorously along. After the sacrifices, games, and feasts were over, Nicias consecrated a palm tree of brass and a large open field to Apollo, and arranged that the interest on the sum of money he paid for the field should be used in purchasing sacrifices, and that the Delians should always pray for the blessings of the god on himself as the founder. Nicias was so sensitive about what people might say of him that he kept aloof as much as possible. He would never attend parties of pleasure, 
nor would he stop to converse with anybody in the street. When he was an Arkan, he was the first to enter the court and the last to leave, and if he had no public business on hand, he would shut himself up at home and refuse to see anyone. If persons came to his gate and demanded to see him, his friend Hirio, who was brought up in his house, would go out and say that he was occupied with important public affairs and had no time for repose or pleasure. Whether this was true or not, it had its effect. The people honored a man who was so occupied for their welfare and did nothing to prevent his advancement to glory. Nicias possessed great military talent, and when he took command of the army he proved this by making it his study to do nothing rash. For this reason he was generally successful, and though the Athenians met with many misfortunes in those times, Nicias was not to blame for them. He won some very important victories and gained a large amount of territory, but once, when at war with the Lacedaemonians, he prolonged a siege until his soldiers lost all patience. Then Cleon undertook it, and within the time he had fixed for victory came back with all the Spartan soldiers who had not fallen in the field as captives. This threw some disgrace on Nicias and made Cleon more arrogant than ever, but when Cleon was killed in battle some time afterwards, Nicias worked so hard to bring about a peace between the Lacedaemonians and Athenians that he became famous. Then nothing was talked of but Nicias, who was said to be beloved of the gods on account of his great piety. It was decided that the long-wished-for blessing should bear his name, and so the peace agreed to for fifty years was called the Nicenian Peace. All Athens rejoiced at the return of peace, but it was not to be enjoyed very long, for it was soon broken by those who wanted to be always engaged in war. Alcibiades was the principal of the war party, because he was not willing to form an alliance with the Lacedaemonians, being angry with them for having once treated him with neglect. So, taking advantage of Nicias's absence when he was sent on a public errand to Sparta, he had himself appointed general, and then did not rest until the war broke out again. When Nicias returned, he and Alcibiades kept up such a constant quarreling that it was proposed to banish one of them by ostracism, which process we have already explained. The younger men, who were for war, one and Nicias banished, while the older ones, who had learned the value of peace, desired to get rid of the warlike Alcibiades. While this matter was under discussion, one Hyperbolus, a wicked wretch, who hoped to gain influence with one of the generals as soon as the other should be removed, went about Athens secretly abusing both, because it made little difference to him which got the number of votes that were necessary for banishment. Nicias and Alcibiades heard of the man's doings, so they had a private interview and agreed to work together to turn the ostracism against him instead of themselves. This was a punishment that had fallen on some of the greatest patriots, such as Thucydides and Aristides, but it was a great deal too easy for a creature who deserved the gibbet, and no one was more surprised than Hyperbolus himself when he found that his name was to appear among those of good and honest men. He was the last person ever banished by ostracism. Hipparchus had been the first. Then Alcibiades persuaded the Athenians to join other Greek nations and undertake the Sicilian expedition, and this was considered very important, because he told them it would open the way to Carthage and to all Africa. Such a glorious picture did he paint of the victories that awaited them, that very few, either of the commons or the nobility, openly sided with Nicias, though many of the more sober-minded Athenians did so privately. Nicias worked for peace even after the decree for war was passed, but he worked in vain, and he was appointed to command with Lamachus and Alcibiades. The priests were opposed to the expedition, but Alcibiades had his own diviners, who promised great glory for the Athenians in Sicily, and those who were sent to consult the oracle of Jupiter Ammon returned with the answer that the Athenians would surely capture the whole Syracusian nation. It is true that there were some unfavorable signs, but those who knew of them tried to conceal them, not thinking it worth while to object to an expedition that nearly all their countrymen were determined upon. 
One of these unfavorable signs was that during a certain night all the statues of Mercury had their heads cut off. This was the most remarkable because there was one in the gateway of each temple and before most of the private houses in Athens. Another bad omen was this. The golden statue of Phallus, which had been put up to celebrate the victory of the Athenians over the Medes, had been pecked at by crows for several days. There were other signs that made the cautious shake their heads when they thought of the splendid army fitted out at so great an expense and likely to come to grief. Socrates, the learned philosopher, said that the expedition would prove fatal to Greece, and he probably had reasons for his opinion grounded on a more important basis than bad omens. But Alcibiades and the majority of the Athenians would listen to no objections, and so the army started. Before anything had been accomplished, Alcibiades was called home to stand his trial, an account of which is given in his life. Lamachus was killed on the battlefield shortly after, and Nicias was left to command alone. Meanwhile, he had astonished the Syracusians by building a wall almost around their city in a very short space of time, and when this was done his success seemed sure, for the inhabitants began to send messages offering terms of peace and ceased to show themselves outside their walls. If Nicias had been active and energetic, he would soon have brought the war to a close, but he delayed until his troops lost confidence in him. Meanwhile, Gylippus, the Spartan commander, went to the relief of the Syracusians with a large force, and soon brought about such a change in the condition of affairs that the Athenians found themselves besieged instead of being the besiegers. Nicias became so much discouraged, and his health was so bad, that he wrote home desiring to be recalled. This was refused, but large reinforcements were sent to Sicily under Nemosthenes and Eurymedian. Before they arrived, Nicias had lost a naval battle, which proved that the Athenian fleet was not so powerful as it had been. Demosthenes came with fresh troops and plenty of energy, but he too was defeated again and again, and then preparations were made for the Athenian army to depart secretly. But on the very night when this was to be carried into effect, there was an eclipse of the moon, and the soothsayer said that the army must not leave its position for three times nine days. Of course, Nicias obeyed, because he was too pious and superstitious to do otherwise. So he gave up all thought of war, and passed his time in prayer and sacrifices, while the enemy took possession of the walls and forts, and filled the harbor with their vessels. Not only the men from the ships, but the boys from the fishing boats challenged the Athenians to come and fight, and offered them every kind of insult they could think of. At last the Syracusians made an attack, and a furious sea fight took place which resulted in the defeat of the Athenians, who, as it was out of the question for them to escape by sea, wanted to do so by land. But their force was still large, and Hermocrates, the Syracusian general, fearing that if they escaped they might make a stand in some other part of Sicily and renew the war, resorted to this stratagem. He sent persons whom he could trust, bidding them to pretend friendliness for Nicias, and to warn him not to march in the night, because the Syracusians had laid several ambushes for him, and had seized all the passes. Nicias believed them, and stayed where he was. The next morning the enemy got off before he could do so, and then really did take the passes, break down the bridges, and place their cavalry everywhere, so that the Athenians could scarcely advance a step without fighting. They were in a dreadful condition, and, what was worse, they were forced to leave their sick and wounded friends and comrades behind them. Nicias was more to be pitied than anyone, for not only was he ill and suffering bodily, but he had to bear the disgrace of defeat after having hoped for honor and success. He had opposed the war with all his might, it is true, but when fighting was to be done, he had shown the spirit and energy of a true hero. In spite of all difficulties, he strove hard to conceal his sufferings from his soldiers, and during an eight days' march, with frequent attacks by the way, he kept his division of the army in good order until Demosthenes was taken prisoner. 
Then he offered to pay the Syracusians the whole cost of the war if they would suffer his army to quit Sicily. But they indignantly refused to treat with a man who had entered their country to take possession of it. Nicias reached the river Asinaris the next day with his men in a state of exhaustion, for the enemy's troops had galled them all the way. When they came to the banks of the river, some plunged into the water to quench their burning thirst, but they were butchered while they drank, and a cruel scene of bloodshed followed. At last, throwing himself at the feet of Gallippus, Nicias spoke in heart-rendering tones. Gallippus, let pity move you in your victory. I ask nothing for myself. What is life to a man who has had so many misfortunes? But for the other Athenians I ask your mercy. You should remember that the chances of war are uncertain, and that my countrymen treated you with mildness and moderation when they were prosperous. Gallippus was touched by the words and appearance of Nicias, for he remembered that he had been friendly to the Lacedaemonians. Besides, to capture two generals alive would be great glory. So, raising the conquered Nicias from the ground, he bade him take courage and order the fighting to cease. Then the prisoners were collected, and, adorning themselves and their horses with garlands, the Syracusians returned to their city in triumph. A general assembly was called, and it was resolved that the Athenian servants and allies should be sold as slaves. The freemen, and those Sicilians who had sided with them, should be sent to work in the quarries, and the general should be put to death. But Hermocrates sent a messenger to inform Demosthenes and Nicias of what their fate was to be, and they both committed suicide. As for the other Athenians, many of them died of disease and poor food in the quarries, for they were allowed only a pint of barley and half a pint of water a day. Those that were sold as slaves had the figure of a horse branded on their foreheads, but they behaved so well that they were either soon set free or won the love and respect of their masters, with whom they continued to live. Several were pardoned because they were able to recite the poems of Euripides, the Sicilians being great admirers of his writings, and the captives were often released from slavery merely because they remembered and could teach something that poet had written. Once, a ship pursued by pirates ran into the harbor of Syracuse for protection, and was only received because the seamen, on being questioned, were found capable of repeating the poems of the favorite bard of the citizens. End of chapter 13 Recording by Maggie Travers in Casilla, Mississippi. Section 14 of Our Young Folks Plutarch. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maggie Travers. Our Young Folks Plutarch by Rosalie Kaufman. Section 14, Alcibiades. Alcibiades was noted for his beauty as well as for his charming manners, which attracted everybody who came in contact with him. He talked very rapidly, and with a little lisp that seemed rather to add to the grace of his speech, and to give it a certain power when he was persuading people to do what he desired. He was an Athenian, with a character made up of such opposite traits that while he was praised for his talent as a statesman and his skill and courage as a commander, he was condemned for his lack of principle, his extravagance, and his dissipation. He was a disciple of Socrates, the celebrated philosopher for whom he felt great admiration and affection. Socrates did not flatter his pupil, as most people did, but always told him the truth, even though it was not agreeable, and tried to instill in him the best of principles. Alcibiades was often rude to his companions, though many of them were noble and wealthy, but to Socrates, whom he loved and admired, he was ever mild and courteous, and never lost an opportunity to be with him. The philosopher loved his young companion too, and when, at various times, he was led away by the youths of Athens and took part in their vicious pleasures, Socrates would seek him and bring him back to the proper path. He could do this, for he was feared and respected by Alcibiades, as no one else was. This young Athenian chose Pericles for his model in public life, and was ambitious to rise to the position that illustrious statesman had held. 
Even as a child the thought of ever being defeated or opposed in anything was most painful to him, and he would resort to any trick to prevent it. Once, when engaged in a wrestling match, finding himself on the point of being thrown, he bit the hand of his opponent with all his might. "'You bite like a woman, Alcibiades,' cried the boy angrily, letting go of his hold. "'Oh, no,' returned our hero. "'I bite like a lion.' Another time, when he was playing at dice, a loaded cart came along just when it was his turn to throw. He called to the driver to stop, but the latter paid no attention and drove on, the boys making way for him to pass. But Alcibiades would not yield, so he stretched himself across the road and cried out to the carter, "'Now drive on if you will!' The man was so startled that he drew back his horses and the child gained his point. At school Alcibiades obeyed all his masters pretty well, except the one who tried to teach him the flute. That instrument, he declared, he would never learn, because it was not becoming in a free citizen so to disfigure himself with the blowing. He was willing to play upon the harp, because he could speak or sing at the same time, and was not obliged to make ugly faces. Let the Thebian youths pipe, he would say, because they do not know how to talk, but we Athenians who have Minerva for our patroness and Apollo for our protector, cannot stoop so low. This decision of his had so much weight among his companions that not one of them would play on the flute, and that instrument fell into disuse. Socrates saved the life of Asclepides when he was a soldier, in this way. They fought side by side, and the latter was wounded so seriously that he must have received further injury had not the philosopher defended and rescued him from the enemy. Such being the case, Socrates might have claimed the prize for valor, but he was so anxious to encourage in his young friend a thirst for glory, that he used his influence to have him rewarded with a crown and a complete suit of armor. Many years later, when the Athenians were defeated at the Battle of Delium, and Socrates was retreating on foot, Alcibiades, who was on horseback, placed himself between him and the enemy, and, in his turn, became a shield. He had a very fine dog, for which he had paid a large sum of money. It was a beautiful animal, remarkable for its handsome tail, which everybody noticed. Alcibiades had this ornament cut off. Thereupon his friends exclaimed at such a piece of inhumanity, and told him that all Athens was talking about it. "'That is exactly what I wanted,' replied the young man. "'For if the Athenians had not this to talk about, "'they might say something worse of me.' "'Unfortunately, his conduct was often so shameless "'that he gave ample opportunity for scandal. "'Few men have had greater advantages "'for entering public life than Alcibiades, "'but he was determined to owe success to nothing but his own eloquence, "'and he became a most accomplished speaker,' always using the right word in the right place and expressing himself in the choicest language. We have alluded to his extravagance. He spent enormous sums of money for horses, of which he owned the finest breed, and he is the only person who ever sent seven chariots at one time to the Olympic Games. He carried away the first, second, and third prizes, and two others were won by his horses. This was considered so remarkable that the representatives of the various Greek cities, who witnessed his success, made him handsome presents, and after the games were over he entertained all the spectators at a magnificent repast. When Alcibiades entered public life, he had two rivals. One was Nicias, a man advanced in years, and one of the best generals of his day. The other was Phaeax, a youth just beginning to make his way. Phaeax was of high birth, but inferior to Alcibiades as an orator. It was said of him that he could talk, but was no speaker. Not only was Nicias esteemed by the Athenians, but he was in high favor with the Lacedaemonians on account of the care he had bestowed on their soldiers who were captured at Pylos, and the peace he had afterwards brought about. This aroused the jealousy of Alcibiades, and he was bent upon the downfall of Nicias, so he accused him of having neglected his opportunities when he was commander for the express purpose of currying favor with the Lacedaemonians. His eloquence won the day, as usual, and he was declared general. 
His first step was to unite three other Greek nations with his own, and combine an immense force against the Lacedaemonians. At the same time, he removed the seat of war so far from the Athenian territory that should the enemy conquer, they would gain little, and in case of defeat, Sparta would not be safe. This was a fine stroke of policy, and showed great genius on the part of Alcibiades. Shortly after the first battle, the officers of the Argive army desired to have an independent government, and the Lacedaemonians offered to assist them in accomplishing this. But their object was soon found to be a desire to form an aristocracy like that of Sparta, and so get a foothold among the nobility themselves. This made the people of Argos so angry that they took up arms against the Lacedaemonians, and with the aid of Alcibiades gained a great victory over them. He then persuaded the people of Argos to build their wall down to the sea, so that they might always be in condition to receive aid from the Athenians, and sent carpenters and masons from Athens to do the work. He advised the people of Partreia to build a similar wall, whereupon somebody suggested that the Athenians would one day swallow them up. That may be so, answered Alcibiades, but they will begin at the feet, and do it by little and little, whereas the Lacedaemonians will begin at the head and gobble you up all at once. Alcibiades made his countrymen love and hate him at the same time. They felt that they could not do without him, and were fascinated by his speech as well as by some of his worthy deeds. But they hated his luxurious habits, and were disgusted with the contempt he showed for the law. They made apologies for him on the score of youth and good nature, and were won, in spite of themselves, by his liberality, his courage, and his attractive manners. Once, when a whole assembly went to congratulate him upon the unusually brilliant oration he had made, Timon, an Athenian philosopher, who was given to making disagreeable remarks, took him by the hand and said, Go on, my brave boy, and increase your popularity as much as you can for you will one day bring calamities enough upon these people. Alcibiades next turned the attention of his countrymen to the conquest of Sicily, a place they had long coveted as being the surest stepping stone to Carthage. Nicias did not approve of the expedition, and pointed out the innumerable difficulties that would attend it. But Alcibiades worked with so much success upon the minds of the young men of Athens that they were all eagerness to depart, and preparations were begun. Much against his will, Nicias was appointed to command with Alcibiades, because it was expected that his experience and judgment would act as a check on the younger and rasher general. When everything was ready, a damper was put upon the expedition by many unlucky omens. Among others, all the images of Mercury in Athens were disfigured during one night, and this excited great terror in the minds of the populace. Several reports were circulated to account for this strange occurrence, and at last Alcibiades and his friends were accused of having mutilated the images when in a state of intoxication. It was further stated that, disguised as a high priest, he had on the same night acted the sacred mysteries, his companions playing their parts in the profane farce also. The people were very angry with Alcibiades and would have brought him to trial at once, but the young men who were ready for war declared that they would be led by no one else. So it was decided that he should set sail at once and be tried on his return. No sooner was the fascination of his presence removed than the enemies of Alcibiades circulated false reports concerning him. These added to the suspicion, for it could not be proved, that he had mutilated the statues of Mercury, increased the popular feeling against him to a perfect fury and the belief gradually gained ground that he was engaged in a conspiracy to betray Athens to the Lacedaemonians. It is hard to understand what connection there could be between this charge and the others, but such was the feeling against Alcibiades that the people were ready to believe whatever they heard, no matter how improbable it might appear. Every relation and friend of the unfortunate general was put into prison unheard and such great regret was felt that Alcibiades himself had not been tried and punished, that a vessel was sent to fetch him back. The soldiers objected to his leaving them, for they thought that the war would never end under the management of Nicias, but they were not heeded, and their general was forced to go. However, he took the precaution to embark on a vessel of his own, 
and not the one that was sent for him. On landing at Thury, in Italy, he made his escape and hid himself. Someone, who happened to recognize him in his hiding place, asked him if he was afraid to trust his country. "'As to anything else, I will trust her,' he replied. "'But with my life, I would not trust even my own mother, lest by mistake she should throw in a black bean for a white one.' We know that one black bean was sufficient to banish a man by ostracism, but a severe punishment was ordered for Alcibiades, for the Republic condemned him to die. When he heard of this, he said, But I will make them feel that I am alive. As he failed to appear, his property was confiscated, and all the priests and priestesses were ordered to curse him. Theana was the only priestess who refused, saying, it is my duty to pray for sinners, not to curse them. Meanwhile, fearing that he was not safe at Thury, Alcibiades had made his way to Argos. Thence he sent a message to Sparta, asking permission to live there, and adding a promise that he would serve the state faithfully. An escort was provided to take him to Sparta, where he immediately began to work in opposition to his country, never ceasing until it was almost crushed. Of course, such a service made Alcibiades exceedingly popular in Sparta, traitor though he was, and he gained many friends in private life by the way he adapted himself to their customs. This man, who had been so luxurious in his habits as to have his meals prepared by a professional cook, to employ a perfumer, and to clothe himself in flowing robes of regal purple, now wore his hair closely cropped, bathed in cold water, ate coarse meal, and dined on black broth. He was not changed, really, but he had the gift of entering into the habits and ways of the people he was with, and of appearing to be one of them. Therefore, when, at a later period, his life was in danger because of the jealousy of some ambitious Spartans, he placed himself under the protection of Tissaphernes, satrap to the king of Persia, and immediately became of great importance in the new field. Although Tissaphernes hated the Greeks, he was an admirer of Alcibiades, whose underhanded ways were rather to his taste than otherwise. So he received him with many marks of hospitality, and honored him by giving his name to one of the most beautiful of his parks. Alcibiades now turned against the Lacedaemonians, and advised Tissapernes not to assist them in ruining the Athenians, but to let the two nations fight on and gradually consume each other. His influence was so great that he was obeyed, and in consequence of his power he rose high in the esteem of his own countrymen, who now began to regret the sentence they had passed on him, particularly as they had suffered on account of his absence. At this time the whole strength of the Athenian army was stationed at Samos. They were in great dread of Tissapernes and the Phoenician fleet, so when Alcibiades sent them word that he would make the Persian their friend, it was an immense relief. But he did not propose to do this, he said, unless a change in the government of Athens could be brought about. He wanted the power vested in the hands of a few aristocrats, doubtless thinking it probable that he would then be recalled to Athens, but he did not let this selfish aim appear. The change really did take place, and the government was assumed by a body of four hundred chosen citizens, called the Five Thousand, to give it an appearance of strength but nobody ever knew of more than the four hundred, who established themselves by force and dismissed the ancient senate. This was an end of the Athenian democracy, which had lasted nearly a century. Any man who dared to oppose the four hundred was put to death, and when the Athenians at Samos heard of this deposition, they became so indignant that they sent for Alcibiades, declared him general, and urged him to lead them on to put down the tyrants. But he refused for he saw clearly that such a step could only lead to harm and involved Athens in a civil war. He performed a still greater service by using his influence with Tissaphernes to prevent the Phoenician fleet from joining the Lacedaemonians. Soon after this, the four hundred usurpers were driven out of Athens, and then Alcibiades was commanded to return. But he would not do so until he had distinguished himself in some service. He therefore sailed from Samos with a few ships and proceeded to the Hellespont, where there was to be a battle between the Spartans and the Athenians assembled there. He gained a great victory, 
of which he felt so proud that he was anxious to show himself to Tissaphernes, and he went to visit him with some handsome gifts. Much to the astonishment of Alcibiades, the Persian, who had displeased the court by showing him favors, had reason on that account to fear the displeasure of his king, and so had the Athenian arrested and sent to Sardis a prisoner. But Alcibiades had his revenge, for he made his escape before the month was out, and publicly announced that the Persian satrap had helped him to do so. Then he hastened to join the Athenian fleet, and was greeted by loud cheers when he made his appearance. He went to the Hellespont again, fought a desperate battle, and completely overthrew the Lacedaemonians. Elated with this great victory, the Athenian soldiers began to believe that no power could resist them, led by Alcibiades, so they attacked many important places along the coast of Asia Minor, and took possession of them all. Then, crowned with glory, Alcibiades turned toward Athens, longing once more to appear before his countrymen. So he set sail with a fleet of two hundred vessels laden with spoils. It was not without misgivings that he entered the harbor, but he was reassured by his relations and friends, who flocked to the shore and invited him to land. As soon as he did so, the multitude crowded around him, some crowning him with laurel wreaths, while others, who could not get near, shouted with delight and followed in his train, satisfied with an occasional glimpse of the great hero. Afterwards, in a public assembly, gold crowns were placed upon the head of Alcibiades. He was created general both of the land and sea forces. His estates were restored to him, and the priests were ordered to absolve him from the curses they had pronounced against him. It was believed by the majority that Alcibiades could fail in nothing that he attempted, and this belief caused his ruin. For after a while, when he fought a battle with the Lacedaemonians and was defeated, it was said that he had commanded carelessly and had spent his time in dissipation and pleasures while in sight of the enemy, leaving the management of the fleet to incompetent people. There were other charges brought against him besides, and ten generals were appointed in his place to lead the Athenian army and navy. It was Lysander who commanded the Lacedaemonians when they gained this victory, and he then took formal possession of Athens, burnt her ships, and demolished the long walls. Alcibiades, fearing the new masters, retired to Asia Minor, carrying a large amount of treasure with him, but he was robbed, and then determined to seek refuge at the court of Artaxerxes, the Persian king. Meanwhile, a reign of terror was established in Athens by the thirty despotic rulers whom Lysander had set over the people. Then there was talk of recalling Alcibiades. No one could tell precisely how one man could counteract the outrages of thirty despots, but it was the general belief that Alcibiades, were he on the spot, could effect some change. Lysander thought so too, and therefore sent people to assassinate him. They went to the village of Phrygia, where he was then living, and set his house on fire in the middle of the night. Alcibiades was on the alert because of a remarkable vision he had had, so when he discovered the flames he looked out and beheld the men who surrounded his house. Wrapping his cloak tightly about him, he rushed through the fire and smoke, drawn sworn in hand, and would have made his escape for the assassins were afraid to approach him. Had he not been hit by their darts, which, like cowards, they fired from a safe distance, he fell covered with wounds. Thus, in the fortieth year of his age, perished one of the most remarkable, though by no means one of the greatest or best, men of Greece. His qualities were such as ought to have made him a benefactor to Athens, but his judgment was at fault and no man ever inflicted greater misery on his native land. End of section 14. Recording by Maggie Travers in Casilla, Mississippi. Chapter 15 of Our Young Folks Plutarch. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maggie Travers Our Young Folks Plutarch by Rosalie Kaufman Chapter 15 Lysander Lysander was a Spartan and inherited, as all the children of that nation did, a passion for glory and a keen sense of praise or blame. He was poor and cared little for money, 
But, strange to say, he enriched Sparta and made her people love wealth. When Alcibiades increased the power of the Athenians at sea, the Lacedaemonians resolved to continue the Peloponnesian War, which had been going on for a long time, and selected Lysander to take charge of their navy. He went to Ephesus, and finding the people friendly but in danger of being corrupted by the Persians, many of whom were living there, he made that city his headquarters and proceeded to build ships of war. This improved trade by land and water, and from that moment Ephesus began to grow, and in course of time became a great and powerful city. On hearing that Cyrus, the king of Persia's son, had arrived at Sardis, Lysander went to see him, and they became such good friends, that at a banquet which the prince gave in honor of his guest, he asked him to oblige him by requesting a favor. "'As you are so kind,' answered Lysander, "'I will ask you to increase the seaman's pay from three to four pence.' Cyrus was so pleased with this generous request that he gave Lysander ten thousand pieces of gold. With this money the wages of his men were increased, and many from the enemy's ships deserted to the side where they would get better pay. Still Lysander did not dare to risk a battle with the Athenians, but when Alcibiades left Samos, Antiochus, commander in his absence, sailed with only two ships to the harbor of Ephesus, and shouted out insulting remarks to the Lacedaemonians to show his contempt of them. Then Lysander ordered a few ships under sail and gave them chase, but when Antiochus was strengthened by the more Athenians, he called out extra vessels, and the battle became general. Lysander gained the victory and took fifteen ships, whereupon the people of Athens were so angry with Alcibiades that they took the command from him. This was not an important battle, except as it affected the future of Alcibiades. Lysander made himself so popular at Ephesus that great regret was felt when he left, and Callicratidas, who succeeded him, although an honorable, generous, high-spirited Greek, was unsuccessful in whatever he attempted. This was not just, for Lysander was by no means an honest, straightforward man. His policy was that it was excusable to resort to any degree of deceit in order to gain one's point. He would laugh at those who thought otherwise and say, Where the lion's skin will not reach, you must patch it up with a fox's. Cyrus did not forget his friendship for Lysander, but sent for him to Sardis, where he presented him with large sums of money. Nor was this all. When he went to visit his father in Media, he ordered that Lysander should receive the tribute of the towns and govern in his stead until he returned, begging him not to fight the Athenians during his absence, because he meant to bring back a powerful fleet from Phoenicia and Cilicia for that purpose. Lysander promised, and Cyrus departed on his journey. But it was impossible for the Spartan commander to keep still with a fleet at his command and his Athenian enemy still powerful. So he cruised about, reduced several islands, pillaged some important towns, and then, sailing to Hellespont, captured the city of Lampsacus. This was a great loss to the enemy, who proceeded at once to give battle to Lysander. He refused to accept their challenge, however, because he feared that his fleet was not powerful enough to destroy theirs, and so he kept them at bay for two or three days, until, having made up their minds that they had nothing to fear from a cowardly commander, they ceased their watchfulness. It was for just such an opportunity that the Lacedaemonians waited. So on the fifth day, when many of the Athenians were enjoying themselves on land, others were asleep, and the rest preparing their dinner, Lysander rushed on to an attack, and took them so completely by surprise that three thousand of their number were captured, and their whole fleet was seized. Thus within one hour, and with little bloodshed, Lysander put an end to a conflict that had lasted twenty-seven years, and caused the death of more generals than all the wars of Greece combined. The three thousand prisoners were condemned to die, and Lysander asked Philocles, one of their generals, what punishment he thought he, who had given his countrymen bad advice, deserved. Do not start a question where there is no judge to decide it, answered the brave general, but now that you are a conqueror, proceed as you would have proceeded with had you been conquered. He then bathed, dressed himself in a rich robe, and led his countrymen to execution, he being the first to suffer. Lysander next sailed among the various seaport cities, 
and ordered all the Athenians to go to Athens. His object was to so overcrowd the city as to produce a famine, and save the trouble of a long siege. In each place he left a Lacedaemonian governor, thus increasing his control of Greece, for it was his own friends whom he appointed, and they had power of life and death. The famine that Lysander had worked for really did visit the Athenians, so that when he entered their harbor, called the Piraeus, they were obliged to surrender. He then wrote to Ephors, or magistrates of Sparta, Athens is taken. Thereupon they issued this decree, the Athenians must destroy the Piraeus and pull down the long walls. They must give up all the cities they possess and live within the bounds of Attica. On these conditions they shall have peace, provided they pay what is reasonable and recall their exiles. As to their ships, we will give orders as to the number they may be allowed to keep. Lysander took all the Athenian ships except twelve, and finding that at the end of the time he had granted they had not destroyed their walls and harbor, he did it himself. Then he changed their form of government, placed thirty tyrants over the city and in the harbor, and garrisoned the citadel under the command of a Spartan. Now, since Lysander's power was so absolute, of course he had a great deal of wealth, and all the gold and silver that he had taken or had been presented with he sent to Sparta, this was a source of uneasiness to the wisest of the citizens, who said some hard things about Lysander for inducing an evil that would be sure to increase crime. A council was therefore called, who decreed that no coin of gold or silver should be introduced into Sparta, but that only their old money should be used. Their money, being of iron, had little value, because it was so bulky and heavy that a whole cartload was not a large sum. Lysander's friends would not have his gold or silver sent away, but proposed by way of compromise that it should be considered public treasure, and that to use it for private purposes should be accounted a crime. This was not wise, for it only made gold and silver coin appear more valuable and encouraged a desire to possess it. Lysander was the first Greek to whom altars were erected and sacrifices offered as though he had been a god. Not that he was beloved or honored, but that he was feared, and people superstitiously believed that the gods might thus avert the cruelty from themselves which Lysander showed towards others. So much flattery made him vain and haughty. In return for friendship or hospitality, he graciously bestowed government positions, and any man who was so unfortunate as to arouse his displeasure was put to death. He was not above resorting to dishonesty in order to gain a point. Thus, when he had conquered Miletus, fearing that the plebeian party might escape, he swore to do them no harm if they would leave their hiding places. They did so, and were handed over to the opposite party, by whom eight hundred of them were put to death. Such shameful scenes were repeated in various cities, for Lysander knew no law but his own wicked passions, and he was remarkably cruel and revengeful. Many complaints were made, but the Lacedaemonians paid little attention to them until Pharnabazus, whose country Lysander had pillaged and destroyed, dispatched a messenger to Sparta to inform against him. Then the ephors sent him a scroll commanding his return. The scroll was made in this way. When the ephor sent an officer on an expedition, they had two round pieces of wood cut out of precisely the same length and thickness. One they kept, the other they gave to the person who went away. These pieces of wood were called skittles. When the ephors wanted to send a secret communication, they took a long, narrow strip of parchment and rolled it from end to end on the skittle like a bandage. They then wrote upon the parchment, following the direction of the wrapping, took it off, folded it, and sent it to the possessor of the corresponding skittily, who could read the message only after the parchment was bound as it had been when it was written upon. As soon as Lysander received the scroll, he hastened to wind it, and found out what order it contained for him. He was not only distressed, but alarmed when he read it. He knew that he had incurred the anger of Pharnabazus, Nevertheless, he sought an interview with that monarch, hoping to soften him and to have the charges against himself withdrawn. 
He used all the eloquence he could bring to bear, and the result was that Farnabazus consented to write to the Ephors and acknowledge that he had been hasty and unjust in the complaints he had made against Lysander. After showing the letter to his visitor, Farnabazus replaced it by another containing even more serious complaints, which he had prepared secretly. This he sealed in the presence of the unsuspecting Lysander, who felt greatly relieved at having, as he supposed, the dreadful charges against his conduct removed, and hastened with the sealed packet to Sparta. His surprise and indignation must have been great when he was shown the letter of which he had been the bearer, particularly as the Lacedaemonians were exceedingly friendly towards Pharnabazus, and were not likely to order light punishment to any one who had wronged him. Two or three days elapsed when Lysander asked and received permission of the ephors to go to the temple of Jupiter Ammon, there to offer sacrifices that he had vowed to the god before the war. This temple was in Libya, for which place Lysander set sail at once. While he was gone, the various Greek nations resolved to drive out his friends and re-establish popular government. The Athenians were the first to revolt, and attacked and defeated the thirty tyrants. Then Lysander returned and persuaded the Lacedaemonians to support him and punish the people. So they gave large sums of money to the tyrants to carry on the war, and appointed Lysander their general. Then Pausanias marched into Attica, pretending that he wished to support the thirty tyrants against the people, but his real object was to put an end to the war and prevent Lysander from becoming master of Athens again. This he managed by making the Athenians friendly with each other, and, as they worked together, quiet was soon restored. It was through the influence of Lysander that Agesilaus, the great soldier and statesman, was placed upon the throne of Lacedaemon. Having done him this service, he persuaded him to undertake an expedition to Asia, assuring him that he might easily conquer the Persians and add much to his own glory. Lysander accompanied him, he was so well known in Asia that he was applied to for everything, and the people stood at his door or followed him in crowds to receive his orders. This made Agesilaus angry, and the more attention Lysander received, the less would he show him favors, until at last it became generally known that if anyone asked for a thing through Lysander, the king would be sure to refuse. Then the people applied directly to Agelaus, but still showed deference to Lysander and joined him in the public walks and other places of resort. The king's envy and jealousy became so great at last that he appointed Lysander his carver at table and said to the people, Now go, if you please, and pay court to my carver. Lysander sought the presence of the king and said, Truly, Agesilaus, you know very well how to tread upon your friends. Yes, when they want to be greater than myself, was the reply, but it is just that those who increase my power should share in it. Perhaps this is what you say, rather than what I have done. I beg of you, however, for the sake of those strangers who have their eyes on us, to put me in some post where I shall be least offensive and most useful to you. Accordingly, he was sent as ambassador to Hellespont, where... Though still angry with Agelaus, he performed his duty faithfully. After a time he returned to Sparta, with the intention of making certain changes in her government. For this purpose he pretended that the oracles had given him instruction, and offered the priest and priestesses large sums of money to make answers that would suit his purpose. But they were not to be bribed, and he was found out. Nevertheless the Spartans brought no charge against him. Before Agelaus returned from Asia, Greece was engaged in the Boeotian War, during which Lysander was surprised and killed by the Thebans. His burial was conducted with the usual honors, and his poverty at the time of his death raised him very much in the estimation of his countrymen, for they then saw that he had desired wealth and power only for them. End of chapter 15 Recording by Maggie Travers Chapter 16 of Our Young Folks Plutarch. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maggie Travers. 
Our Young Folks Plutarch by Rosalie Kaufman. Chapter 16 Camillus. Furious Camillus was a very celebrated Roman who did so much service for his country that he was called a second Romulus. He filled many important offices and early distinguished himself in a great battle against the Aquinians and Volscians. On that occasion, he received a wound in the thigh which would have driven most men from the field. But Camillus pulled the javelin from the wound and then engaged with the bravest of the enemy until he put them to flight. One of the most wonderful of his achievements was the taking of the city of Vi after it had been under siege for ten years. Vi was the chief city of Tuscany and equal to Rome in the number of her soldiers as well as in her wealth, luxury, and refinement. The Vientes, after many fights with the Romans, in which they were generally defeated, became discouraged and contented themselves at last with building strong walls, filling their city with warlike provisions, and then waiting an attack. As soon as the Romans saw their intention, they laid siege to Vi, but as years passed by and the city did not succumb, the generals were blamed for not showing sufficient energy, and many of them were removed. Among those put in their places was Camillus, who was then tribune for the second time. In the midst of the war, a remarkable occurrence aroused the superstition of the Romans. It was this. Alban Lake lies embedded in the midst of hills, from the springs of which it is fed. Now, in the autumn succeeding a long, unusually dry summer, when all the lakes, brooks, and springs of Italy were dried up and the rivers ran low, Alban Lake began suddenly to rise without apparent cause. It rose and rose until its surface was nearly on a level with the tops of the hills. Such a size and depth it had never attained before, and everybody was amazed. But the increased bulk and weight of the lake broke away the earth which had held it in place like a great dam, and the water flowed in a torrent over the ploughed fields and plantations below until it found its way to the sea. Not only the shepherds and herdsmen, but all the Italians, were stricken with terror. They felt sure that some extraordinary event was pending. Those in the camp before Vei thought that this omen had been sent to them by the gods, but whether its portent was good or evil they could not even guess. One of the warriors who, during the long siege, had had opportunities for conversation with the enemy, had made the acquaintance of a man of Vei who was versed in ancient traditions and supposed to be uncommonly skilled in the art of divination. Finding this man inclined to rejoice at the strange behavior of Lake Alba, the Roman hit upon a scheme for getting his opinion of it without asking questions. So, pretending to treat the matter with the utmost indifference, he said, Oh, I could tell you of many prodigies that have happened of late to the Romans, some of which are far more wonderful than the rising of Lake Alba. Thinking to gain some personal benefit, the man urged the Roman to communicate freely with him, and became so absorbed in the stories invented to deceive him that he suffered himself unconsciously to be led far away from the gates of the city. Suddenly, as the two approached the camp, the Roman snatched up his companion in his arms and held him fast until two or three others came up and carried him before the commanders. He was ordered to declare the secret oracles of Ai. Knowing that he would be forced to speak if he refused, he wisely decided to do so at once. The city of Ai shall never be taken, he said until the waters of Alban Lake, which have found new passages, be turned back, and not allowed to mingle with the sea. The Senate held a consultation, and decided to get the opinion of the Oracle of Delphi also. For that purpose, three persons of distinction were selected. On their return from the voyage, they reported, among other answers, that some of the ceremonies relating to the Latin feast had been neglected. With regard to the lake, the oracle had said that it should be shut up in its ancient bed, if possible, but, if that could not be done, canals and trenches should be dug, through which it was to be drained off. Without a moment's loss of time, the priests set to work to offer sacrifices, and the people to dig new channels for Alban Lake. This happened in the tenth year of the siege, and then Camillus was made dictator. He selected Cornelius Sapicio for his general of horse. 
After making a vow to the gods that if they would grant a happy termination to the war, he would celebrate the great games to their honor, and also dedicate a temple to the goddess Matuta, or mother, Camillus, resolved to try a new plan for the capture of Ai. The soil about the city being easy to work, he ordered mines to be dug, and this was done in such a secret manner as to remain unnoticed by the enemy. Then Camillus began an assault which drew the Vientines to the walls, and enabled part of his army to make their way underground to the citadel close to the temple of Juno, the most important one in the city. At that moment the Tuscan general was offering a sacrifice. The priest who stood by exclaimed, The gods promise victory to him who shall finish this sacrifice. No sooner were the words out of his mouth than the Romans, who had heard them, burst through the floor with loud shouts and the clashing of arms, which so frightened the Tuscans that they fled, leaving the entrails of the animal they were offering. These were gathered up and carried to Camillus. Thereupon the city was taken by storm, and while the soldiers were occupied in gathering the spoils, Camillus raised his hands on high and offered a prayer of thanksgiving to Jupiter. At its conclusion he turned to the right, which was the Roman custom after prayer, but in doing so he fell. His friends were uneasy at this and regarded it as a presage of evil, but Camillus reassured them by saying that it was just what he had prayed for a small mishap as the counterbalance to his great success, lest the god should become jealous of his uniform good fortune. Vei was sacked, and the dictator resolved to carry the statue of Juno to Rome. Workmen were employed to remove it, but, before they began, Kamala sacrificed to the goddess, and asked her if she would be pleased to accept of his devotion, and if she would vouchsafe to consent to be placed among the gods that presided at Rome. It is said that the statue answered in a low voice that she was ready and willing to go. This is one among innumerable circumstances mentioned by ancient historians for which we of the present day can easily account by a natural course of reasoning. Words uttered by persons who had no concern in their affairs were interpreted by the heathens as good or bad omens if they happened in any way to apply, and they were so superstitious as to believe that statues really did speak groan and give other signs on occasions a bright flame from an altar was always considered a good omen as was also a sneeze from a person standing at the right hand of the priest engaged in sacrificing like many a hero before and since his time camillus was so puffed up by the praise he received on all sides on account of his having conquered so famous and important a city as Vei that it turned his head somewhat, and made him very haughty. On his return to Rome, he drove through the city in a triumphal chariot drawn by four white horses. No general had ever done such a thing, that sort of conveyance being considered sacred to the king and father of the gods, and the Romans were therefore shocked and displeased. Their disfavor was still furthered increased when a plan was proposed for dividing the city. The tribunes desired the senate and the people to be divided into two equal parties, one to remain at Rome and the other to remove to the newly taken city. This was a very popular project, for it promised great advantages to the poor, but the senate and the nobler of the citizens feared that in time the two cities might become so independent of each other as to go to war, and thus fall into the hands of their common enemies. They therefore opposed it and applied to Camillus for assistance. But, fearing the result of a decision, he managed to occupy the people with other matters, and so gain time. Such underhanded behavior was displeasing, and still more so was the manner of disposing of the spoils of Vei, for Camillus had vowed, before undertaking the siege, that if he conquered the city he would dedicate to Apollo one-tenth of the spoils. Instead of doing so, he had permitted the soldiers to divide everything they could lay hands on among themselves. Some time after, the senate and priests announced that their sacrifices showed signs of divine anger, and that something must be done to satisfy the gods. So the soldiers were required to give up a tenth of the treasure they had appropriated. This decree created a great deal of dissatisfaction in the army, 
but Camillus excused himself by saying that he had forgotten all about his vow. The soldiers had to submit. Therefore, when the spoils were gathered, it was decided to make a bowl of massive gold to be sent to Delphi. But there was a scarcity of gold in the city, and the bowl could not have been manufactured at all had it not been for the Roman matrons, who nobly came forward and gave up their ornaments to supply the required amount. As a reward for this act of self-denial, the matrons were granted leave to ride in chariots at the public games and sacrifices, and in open carriages on other occasions. As soon as the golden bowl was ready, three of the prominent citizens were sent in a large, well-manned ship to carry it to Delphi and place it on the altar of Apollo with all due ceremony. Before the division of the city could be completed, the Floreans declared war, and Camillus was appointed to command the Roman forces. He marched at once to the enemy's territory, and laid siege to Phaleri, their chief city. Trusting to the strength of their fortifications, the Floreans did not trouble themselves much about the siege, but left the guarding of their walls to those whose duty it was during times of peace, and continued their usual occupations. Now it so happened that in Phaleri there was a schoolmaster who had under his charge a large number of boys, and after their lessons were finished he would take them daily to the outskirts of the town for play and exercise. He constantly assured them that they had nothing to fear from the enemy at their walls, and they followed their master with perfect confidence wherever he chose to lead them. One day he approached the Roman advance guard, surrounded by all the boys, whom he delivered up to be carried to Camillus. When questioned by the commander, he told who he was, and said that he preferred the favor of Camillus to the obligations of duty, and that he had come to hand over to him the Florian children, and through them the whole city. The commander was shocked at such base treachery. War is at best a savage thing, he said, but it has its laws from which men of honor will never depart. Though desirous of victory, they do not avail themselves of acts of villainy. So saying, he ordered the lictors to tear off the wretch's clothes and tie his hands behind him, then to furnish each boy with a rod and a scourge, with which to whip the traitor back to the city. Meanwhile the Falarians had heard of the fate of their boys, and men and women crowded to the gates in a state of distraction, filling the air with their lamentations. Suddenly they beheld the schoolmaster running towards them pursued by his pupils, who did not spare their blows, but shouted and yelled with delight, while they proclaimed the Roman commander, their God, their deliverer, their father. The citizens were so struck by the generosity of Camillus that it was decided in council to send deputies to the noble commander to surrender the city to him. Camillus took time to consult the Senate of Rome, who advised him to demand a sum of money of the Floreans, but on no account to accept anything more. Peace was then restored, and the Roman army returned home. But the soldiers were disappointed at being forced to go back empty-handed when they had expected rich spoils, and determined to vent their anger on Camillus. So before many days, while he was mourning over the death of a dearly beloved son, they accused him of having appropriated more than his share of the Tuscan spoils. His indignation at such a shameful charge may be better imagined than described, but he was in no mood to defend himself, so he summoned those of the citizens who were friendly and requested them to do it for him. They decided that it was impossible to prevent sentence from being passed, but offered to club together to pay whatever fine might be imposed. Camillus was too proud and upright a man to submit to such an indignity, and therefore resolved to absent himself from Rome at once. So, after bidding farewell to his wife and his only surviving son, he went into voluntary exile. In course of time misfortune overtook the Romans, and they felt the loss of Camillus most keenly. This was when the Gauls, in tremendous numbers, marched through Italy, splendidly equipped for battle, and spread terror right and left, never stopping until they reached the very gates of Rome. The tribunes led out the army, but it happened to contain at that time many men who had had no experience in the field. The consequence was a total defeat and flight of the Romans in the very first engagement, 
which took place on the banks of the river Alia. Had the Gauls followed up their advantage, they might have taken possession of Rome itself. But, not being aware of the full extent of their victory, they contented themselves with gathering and dividing the plunder of the deserted camp. Thus the Roman citizens, who desired to escape, had ample time given them, while those whose duty it was to defend the city lost not a moment in making the necessary preparations. The latter assembled in the capital, which they fortified and supplied with arms, but their first care was for the holy things, which were hidden in a safe spot, while the vestal virgins fled with the sacred fire and vestments. Some of the priests and older senators could not bear to leave the city of their birth, so they put on their holy robes, made their vows to the gods, and sat down in the ivory chairs in the forum, prepared to sacrifice themselves to their country. When the Gauls arrived, they were surprised to find the gates unguarded. After placing a strong force about the capital, Brinus, their leader, went down to the forum where the priests and senators had placed themselves. There they sat, perfectly motionless and apparently unconscious of the approach of the enemy. The Gauls gazed and wondered, but for a long time were afraid to touch the men, who they thought must be superior beings of some sort. At last one of them ventured up to a senator named Papirius, and timidly stroked his long beard, whereupon Papirius struck him on the head with his staff. The Gaul drew his sword and killed him on the spot. That was a signal for the rest, who forthwith dispatched all who came in their way, pillaged the houses, and finally set fire to the city. When provisions failed, they foraged the country mercilessly, laying waste the towns and villages. It so happened that the best discipled part of their army went against Ardea, where Camillus had been living in retirement ever since his exile. The noble Roman forgot the ingratitude of his countrymen, and burned to relieve them from the hands of so formidable an enemy. So he interested the young men of Ardea in the Roman cause, and then, with the consent of the magistrates and senate, armed all those who were of the proper age, and drew them together within the walls, that the enemy might not suspect what he was about. The Gauls, elated with their success, became careless, and encamped upon the plains in a most disorderly manner. Night found many of them intoxicated with wine, and so soundly did they sleep that the Ardeans, led by Camillus, were in their very midst before they were aware of it. Most of them were killed that night, and those who were sober enough to make their escape were overtaken and dispatched the next day. When the neighboring cities heard of this action, their warriors agreed to send for Camillus and place themselves under his leadership. Among these were many Romans who had escaped from the battle of Elia, but Camillus answered that he could not command them unless he should be appointed to do so by those of their countrymen who were shut up in the capital. Though Rome lay in ashes, he would take no step against the constitution of his country. To get a messenger to the capital, while the enemy held the city, seemed impossible. However, a young man named Pontius Comenius undertook the difficult task. He carried no letters, that in case he should be seized would betray Camillus. But, dressed in mean attire, he traveled without fear by day and entered Rome after dark. He could not cross the bridge, because it was guarded by the Gauls, but he swam across the river unobserved, walked through deserted streets, and climbed up to the capital on the side of the hill which is steepest and roughest. He called out to the guards, told them his name, and was received with great joy, and conducted to the magistrates. The senate were speedily assembled and informed of the victory of Camillus. They were then asked to appoint him commander, as the citizens out of Rome would obey none but him. This was done, and Pontius returned by the same road by which he had come. When Camillus joined the Romans at Veii, he found twenty thousand of them in arms. To these he added a still larger number, and marched out against the Gauls. Meanwhile, the marks that Pontius had made with his feet and hands when he clambered up the precipitous rock to the capital were discovered by the Gauls, and their leader urged them to follow the example set by their enemy and make an attack from that side. 
the nimblest of them were selected, and they began the ascent at midnight with great difficulty, but in silence. The Romans would certainly have been taken by surprise had it not been for some sacred geese kept near the temple of Juno. These creatures, not being so well fed as in time of peace, had grown restless and watchful. The slight noise made by the Gauls excited them, and they ran up and down cackling so loudly that the whole camp was roused. Each man seized the nearest weapon he could lay hands on, while the Gauls, finding themselves discovered, boldly advanced to the assault. Menelaus, a powerful, courageous Roman, distinguished himself on this occasion. He fought two Gauls at once, cut off the right arm of one just as it was raised to strike, and, running his target full in the face of the other, pitched him headlong down the steep rock. Then he mounted the rampart, and, with the assistance of others, drove off the rest of the enemy. A reward of half a pound of bread and one-eighth of a pint of wine from each citizen was voted to Manlius after the fight. The captain of the guard was punished for allowing danger to come so near by being flung down the rock on the heads of the enemy. Thus the capital saved from falling into the possession of the Gauls. After the siege of the capital had lasted seven months, the condition of both the contending armies was so dreadful, and suffering, disease, and death had increased to such an alarming extent that it was agreed to propose a treaty. For this purpose, Sulpicius, one of the military tribunes, had an interview with Brunus, and agreed that the Romans should pay a thousand pounds of gold to the Gauls on condition that they would at once quit the country. After the necessary oaths were taken, the gold was brought, but the Gauls used false weights. The Romans soon detected the cheat and openly expressed their indignation. Thereupon Brinus, with an insulting remark, took off his sword and belt and threw them into the scale with the gold. Sulpicius asked what that meant. What should it mean, returned Brinus, with an air of contempt, but woe to the conquered. The Romans were so angry that some of them wanted to take back their gold and endure the siege to the bitter end, while others argued that since it was a disgrace to settle the quarrel with gold, it was better, in consideration of their necessities, to submit to the insult offered by the Gaul. It must be remembered that Camillus had not yet made his way to Rome, but he arrived at the gates with his army just at the right moment, before the gold question was decided. As soon as he heard about it, he ordered the main body of his army to advance slowly and in good order, while he, with a select few, hastened to join the Romans, who received him with all the respect due their dictator. He advanced toward the scales, took out the gold, which he handed to the lictors, and ordered the Gauls to be gone with their weights, saying proudly, it is the custom of Romans to deliver their country with steel, and not with gold. Brinus flew into a rage, and declared that he had been unjustly dealt with. His men drew their swords, and a fight ensued. But it was conducted in such a disorderly manner that, after a few had fallen, the Gauls were ordered back to their camp. During the night they marched away and returned to their own country. Therefore Camillus was regarded as the deliverer of Rome, and this time, when he made his triumphal entry, he was followed by a long train of men, women, and children, while those who had been shut up in the capital and almost starved to death went out to receive him, weeping for joy and embracing the friends and relations whom they had feared they should never behold again. The priests brought back all the holy things that they had hidden or carried out of the city at the approach of the enemy, Camellius offered sacrifices and then set to work to rebuild the temples where they had stood before the entrance of the Gauls. As the city lay in ruins, it became necessary to rebuild it also, and Camellius effected this only with constant words of encouragement to the people and incessant exhortation on his own part. The walls and buildings were all completed in one year, but in consequence of the hurry and confusion, the streets were narrow and crooked, and the houses were badly planned and huddled together without order or design, each man pitching on any plot of ground that happened to strike his fancy. No sooner was the work of rebuilding Rome finished than a new war broke out. This time it was three hostile tribes that invaded the Roman territory. 
Camillus was appointed dictator for the third time, and crowned himself with additional glory by the victory he gained. The citizens acknowledged his ability, but some of them were envious of his success. Among these, the one who made himself most notorious was Marcus Manlius, surnamed Capitolinus, on account of his heroic conduct when the capital was surprised by the Gauls. He was ambitious to be considered the greatest man in Rome, and it galled him to see honors heaped on another. So he gradually drew the poorer class of citizens about him, defended them against their creditors, and encouraged them to such lawless acts that he made himself obnoxious to the magistrates, and was sent to prison. The people put on mourning for their leader. This was never done except in times of great public calamity, so the Senate, fearing an insurrection, ordered Manlius to be set at liberty. Instead of profiting by the lesson he had had, he became more troublesome than ever, and incited the populace to riots. He was again arrested, and condemned to be thrown headlong from the Capitol Rock, the scene of his former glory. Then his house was pulled down, and a temple erected in its place. At this period, Camillus was appointed tribune for the sixth time, but he was in ill health and declined the honor. However, the Romans declared that they could not do without his advice, particularly as a new enemy was just then laying waste their territory. So he consented to go into camp, without intending to take an active part in the fight. But Lucius Furius, who was in command, acted so rashly in leading on his forces that he was driven back. Thereupon Camellius jumped from his bed, old and feeble though he was, fought his way to the battlefield, urged his countrymen on, and soon regained for them the ground they had lost. The next day he killed nearly all of the enemy and took possession of their camp. Then he marched on to Satricum and overcame the Tuscans and returned to Rome with great spoils. A Roman named Licinius Stolo created a disturbance between the Senate and the people by urging the latter to insist upon having one of their consuls chosen from among the plebeians and not both from the patricians, as they had always been. In order to settle this matter, Camillus was chosen dictator for the fourth time. But, finding that he was a better soldier than politician, he resigned his office on the plea of illness. Before the election for consuls took place, news came that the Gauls were again advancing upon Rome. Everybody was terrified. Nobles, senate, and people all relied on Camillus to save them, and he was unanimously chosen dictator for the fifth time. Although nearly eighty years of age, the noble Roman would not desert his country in her hour of need, but at once undertook the command of the army. He proved that his military genius was not yet on the wane, for he had the honor of beginning the attack, and won a glorious victory. The conflict with regard to the consuls had yet to be settled, and to that matter the people turned their attention as soon as the army returned. As dictator, Camillus presided in the Senate, where there were lengthy debates and various opinions on the subject. At last it was decided that one of the consuls should be a plebeian. This satisfied the populace, but at the same time the patricians had a new officer appointed, called Praetor, who was to be next in dignity to the consuls and this was an offset to the point they had yielded. The military tribuneship was at this period abandoned forever. It was Camillus who announced to the multitude the decision of the Senate. Loud shouts of applause greeted his welcome speech, and he was conducted to his home in triumph. The next day, it was unanimously agreed that the temple Camillus had vowed to Concord should be built in commemoration of the victory the people had gained over the Senate instead. One more feast day, in honor of the victory, was added to the list, and at the sacrifices offered on each anniversary, the Romans were ordered to appear adorned with garlands. The election was held at the regular time, when Marcus Aemilius was the consul chosen from among the nobles, and Lucius Sextius from among the commons. The latter is to be remembered as the first plebeian who held the position of consul in Rome. We have nothing further to relate of Camillus, 
except that during the following year he fell a victim to the dreadful pestilence that visited Rome, and his death was much lamented by his countrymen. End of chapter 16 Recording by Maggie Travers in Casilla, Mississippi Chapter 17 of Our Young Folks Plutarch this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maggie Travers. Our Young Folks Plutarch by Rosalie Kaufman. Chapter 17. Artaxerxes. The Artaxerxes about whose life we are going to tell was the second Persian king of that name. The first one was son of Xerxes and reigned thirty years. The second was son of Darius and ascended the throne on the death of his father. He was surnamed the Mindful because of his extraordinary memory. Darius had four sons, Artaxerxes, Cyrus, Oxtanes, and Oxithrys. Cyrus was his mother's favorite, and when the king was dying she tried very hard to have him named successor. The argument she used was that Cyrus had been born after his father began to reign, whereas Artaxerxes, having been born before that period, was therefore not the son of a monarch. But the dying father insisted that his eldest child should succeed him, and he was therefore proclaimed king. Cyrus, who had always been a headstrong, ambitious boy, was very much disappointed, but his brother made him governor of Lydia, and commander-in-chief of all the cities along the coast of Asia Minor, thinking that such an important post ought to satisfy him. We shall see, however, that it did not. Artaxerxes, according to the custom of his country, went to a place called Parsagardia to be crowned by the priest in the temple of the goddess of war. The ceremony was conducted in this way. The royal person, on entering the holy place, had to take off his own robe and put on the one which Cyrus first wore before he became king. He had also to eat a cake of figs, chew some turpentine, and drink a cup of sour milk. Artaxerxes was just on the point of going to the temple when Tisipathemes, one of his highest officers, brought in a priest who had come to say that Cyrus was hidden in the sacred building, ready to kill his brother when he was changing his robe. Cyrus was seized and brought before the king, but Parisatus, the mother, came with him, and, throwing her arms about his neck, implored her eldest son to pardon him for her sake. He did so, and Cyrus went back to Lydia, but he was not grateful for his escape, and hated his brother because of the indignity he had suffered in being brought before him in chains. Artaxerxes was a very mild, gentle king at first, with affable manners towards the lowly as well as the lofty in station, and always ready to reward liberally any deserving person. No matter how trifling a present offered to him might be, he received it graciously. A subject once brought him an uncommonly large pomegranate. He said, By the light of Mithra, this man, if he were made governor of a small city, would soon make it a great one. As he passed through the country, his people would present a variety of things. A poor man, on such an occasion, having nothing to offer, ran to the river and brought some water in his hands, and the king was so pleased that he sent him a gold cup and a liberal sum of money. One day, when he was hunting, a courtier pointed out a tear in his robe. "'What shall I do with it?' asked the king. "'Give it to me,' was the reply. "'It shall be so,' returned Artaxerxes. I give it to thee, but I charge thee not to wear it. The courtier, being a vain, silly fellow, put on the robe, and, adding to it some costly jewels, made a display of himself thus adorned. The courtiers expressed great indignation at seeing a royal robe worn by one who had no right to it, but the king only laughed and said, I allow him to wear the trinkets as a woman and the robe as a madaban. So by attaching the proper weight to trifles, Artaxerxes made his reign popular. And Stratyra, his wife, did her share towards it, for she always rode in her chariot with her curtains open, that people might see her, and she was so gracious in her manners that women were not afraid to approach and salute her. Of course, there were those who did not approve of the king, 
for there are always fault-finders in every age and country. They thought that Persia required a more dignified, ambitious, despotic ruler. Knowing such to be the case, Cyrus resolved to make war upon his brother, and collected an army of more than a hundred thousand fighting men, at whose head he began his march. Tisiphanthanes was the first person to hear of the approach of Cyrus, and lost no time in communicating the dreadful intelligence at court, where it aroused the greatest consternation. Parisades was taken to task for the danger that threatened, because it was she who had saved the life of her son Cyrus when he would otherwise have forfeited it. Stratatyra reproached her more than any one else for bringing war and all its calamities on the country, and this made the queen mother so angry that, later, she had the queen assassinated when Xerxes was at war. Cyrus and his army were amazed when they beheld the magnificent array the Persian king brought into the field. He had nine hundred thousand well-armed, well-disciplined men, who advanced slowly and in perfect order. The two armies met at a place called Kunaxa, about sixty miles from Babylon, and the battle fought there was so fierce and so remarkable that many ancient historians have written descriptions of it. It is therefore only necessary for us to recount the result. Bounted on a high-spirited horse, Cyrus fought with great fury, and routed the king's guard. He then engaged with the monarch himself, pierced his cuirass with his javelin, and gave him such a terrible wound that he fell in a swoon. This event caused disorder among the king's troops, and, before they recovered their presence of mind, the animal which bore Cyrus became excited and dashed in among the ranks of the enemy. It was growing dark at that time, and the prince was not at once recognized, but he was so elated with victory that he spurred on his horse, shouting, Make way, ye slaves, make way! The ranks opened at his command, but his helmet happened to become loose and fall from his head, whereupon a young Persian named Mithridates, who chanced to be riding by, struck a dart deep into one of his temples. The blood gushed forth, and Cyrus fell senseless to the ground. When he recovered consciousness, a couple of slaves tried to lead him away, but he was so dizzy that he could with difficulty reel along supported on both sides. As one by one whom he met began to recognize and salute him as king, begging at the same time for grace and mercy, Cyrus knew that victory was his. But he was not long to enjoy his triumph, for a party of men employed to do camp work for the royal army fell into his train under the impression that he was not an enemy. However, they soon discovered their mistake when they observed the coats over the breastplates of Cyrus and his attendants were red, while those of the king's men were white. One of them, without recognizing Cyrus, struck him in the leg with a dart. He fell, and dashing his wounded temple against a stone, died on the spot. Presently an officer of the king came along and asked the slaves over whom they were weeping. Did you not see, O Artaceris, asked one of them, that it is my master Cyrus? Be of good cheer and keep the body safe, said Artaceris, as he rode off in all haste to carry the news to the king. Artaxerxes, who had given up his cause for lost and was suffering from his wound, could scarcely believe the good news. He started up and ordered Artaceris to lead him to the spot where his dead brother lay. Thirty messengers were sent forward to make sure that Cyrus was really dead, and when the king came into the plain they met him with torches, and held up the head and right hand of Cyrus, which, according to the Persian custom, had been cut off. Taking the head in his hand, and holding it up by the long, thick hair, Artaxerxes showed it to the soldiers, all of whom flocked to him as soon as they heard of his good fortune. He returned to the camp, followed by seventy thousand men, who only a short hour before had been prepared to desert to the victorious Cyrus. The king then rewarded every man who had been in any way instrumental in causing the death of the prince, as well as the messenger who brought him the good news and those who confirmed it. But the two who had struck the fatal blows, the one in the temple and the other on the leg, went about boasting of their exploits, which made the king so angry that he ordered both to be executed. 
This was not because he felt any sorrow on account of his brother's death, but because he wanted all the credit among the enemy of having caused it himself. Perisatus, as we know, had always loved Cyrus more than her other sons. She was a cruel, vindictive woman who would stop at nothing in order to satisfy her revenge. So she begged that the condemned men, as well as the slave that had cut off the head and hands of her son, might be left to her for punishment. Artaxerxes gratified her, and the barbarous torture to which she subjected them, before death came to their relief, is too horrible for description. Now a large number of Greeks had followed Cyrus into Asia, and Artaxerxes had been most anxious to conquer them, because such a feat would add greatly to his reputation. But he failed in this, and they made a remarkable retreat through more than two thousand miles of the enemy's country, followed and harassed all the way by a victorious army. They reached their cities on the Euxuzina Sea, feeling contempt for the barbarous Persian king with all his wealth, luxury, and display, and great eagerness for new conflicts with him. Artaxerxes was now the peaceable possessor of the throne, and immediately set about preparations for another war. The Lacedaemonians had offended him by giving aid to Cyrus, and he resolved to punish them. For that purpose he joined Conan, the Athenian general, and made him with Pharnabazus admirals over his fleet. The Lacedaemonians were so badly defeated that they lost control of the seas, and Artaxerxes gained so much power over Greece as to be permitted to dictate his own terms of peace. It was called the Peace of Antalcidas, being named after the Spartan who, acting in the interest of the Persian king, induced the Lacedaemonians to let him govern all the Greek cities in Asia. The terms of this well-known treaty were so humiliating that they cast more disgrace on the Greeks than any defeat had ever done. Artaxerxes showed Antalcidas special favors when he went to Persia, and continued to do so until the Battle of Leuctra was fought. Then the Spartans were again defeated and lost their lofty position among the Greek nations. They were in such distress after this battle that they were obliged to send Agesalius, their commander, to Egypt to borrow money. Antalcidas then entreated the Persian king to assist his wretched country, but he met with nothing but insults and a harsh refusal. Fearing to return to Sparta after being so treated by a monarch whose cause he had favored, he starved himself to death in despair. Then all the Greek cities of Asia fell under the sway of Artaxerxes. A revolt in Egypt next attracted the attention of the Persians, and was followed by one in Upper Asia. The king attended his army in person, and showed that he could endure danger and fatigue in spite of the splendor and luxury by which he was always surrounded when at home. He was now growing old, and his sons began to dispute among themselves as to which should succeed him. The eldest one, who was named Darius, would probably have been appointed but he was so impatient for the exalted station that he formed a plot against his father's life. It was discovered, and the king had barely time to escape through a door concealed behind a piece of tapestry when the would-be assassins entered his bedchamber. He gave the alarm, and they were captured. The proof that Darius was at the head of the plot was too strong to be questioned, and he was put to death. Artaxerxes died at the age of ninety-four, and his son, Aucas, a cruel, bloodthirsty prince succeeded him. End of chapter 17 Recording by Maggie Travers Chapter 18 of Our Young Folks Plutarch This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our Young Folks Plutarch by Rosalie Kaufman. Chapter 18. Agesilaus. Agesilaus, being a Spartan, was brought up with the severe discipline that formed so large a part of the education of that race. He was a younger brother with little prospect of becoming a ruler. So he was trained to obey the law strictly, and being of a yielding, gentle, sensitive nature, anxious to do right and distressed at the slightest rebuke, he was easily controlled. 
According to the custom with Spartan youths, he was bred in one of the flocks or classes, and so orderly and well-behaved was he that Lysander took a fancy to him. He was a handsome boy, in spite of a slight deformity, which consisted in one leg being shorter than the other, but that did not inconvenience him much, for he was high-spirited and eager to distinguish himself. When he grew to manhood, he was undersized and insignificant-looking, but his good humor, cheerfulness, and kindliness made him attractive to the end of his life. By the death of his brother, he became king of Sparta, and grew into great power and popularity. In the life of Lycurgus, there is an account of how that statesman instituted two bodies to act as a restraint upon the power of the kings. These were the ephors, who were chosen annually, and the elders, who held their offices during life. The idea which Lycurgus had in this change in the government was good, but it was a constant cause of disturbance, because the kings did not like to share their authority. Agesilaus was wise enough to court favor with both the ephors and the elders. He asked their advice on every point, and was always ready to go to them when they needed him. Besides, he treated them with great respect, and made them so fond of him that they were satisfied with everything he did and thus he became powerful almost without their suspecting it. By seeming to obey, he ruled them and Sparta, and by justice to his enemies and attachment to his friends, he won many hearts. Agesilaus had not been long on the throne when news came that the king of Persia was preparing a great fleet to overthrow that of the Spartans. Lysander then wanted to be sent to Asia to support his friends, who were governors of the Greek cities there, so he persuaded Agesilaus to enter Asia at once with his forces in order that the war might be carried on at a distance from home. Agesilaus consented and called an assembly of the people, before whom he agreed to undertake the war on condition that they would supply him with thirty Spartans for captains and counselors, two thousand chosen men of the newly freed Helots, and six thousand of the allies. This request was granted, and Agesilaus started with Lysander for his chief. Both were glad to go upon this expedition because it seemed to offer an opportunity for them to win laurels. While the army was collecting at the seashore, Agesilaus went with his friends to Boeotia, and the first night he slept there he dreamed that a man approached him and said, O king of the Lacedaemonians, you know that since Agamemnon, Nobody has been appointed captain-general of all the Greeks but yourself. Therefore, since you command the same people, go against the same enemies, and depart from the very same place that he did, you ought to please the goddess by offering the sort of sacrifice he offered before he sailed. Now Agesilaus knew that Agamemnon had sacrificed his daughter Iphigenia in obedience to the oracle, but he meant to do no such thing with his own daughter. So when relating his dream next morning, he said, I will not imitate the savage ignorance of Agamemnon, for I do not believe that would give pleasure to so reasonable a being as the goddess. I will offer another sacrifice, however. He thereupon put a crown of flowers on a hind, delivered her to his private soothsayer, and ordered him to perform the ceremony. This gave offense to the chief magistrates of Boeotia, who said that if their own soothsayers were left out of the sacrifice, which they could perform only according to the laws and customs of their country, the ceremony should not take place at all. So the thighs of the hind were thrown from the altar, and Agesilaus, highly offended at such treatment, departed in anger. He was distressed also, for the omen seemed to warn him of failure, and he dreaded to undertake the expedition against the Persian king. He then joined Lysander at Ephesus, where he found that officer in such high favor that the greatest honors were being shown him. All sorts of applications were made to him, so that the importance of Agesilaus was lessened, and he became ruler only in name. He was not naturally a jealous man, but this he could not stand, and determined to change it. The method he chose was to oppose everything Lysander said or did. If a man applied to Lysander for anything, Agesilaus made it a point to refuse, so that even the friends of the former knew they must go straight to the king if they wanted to be heard. Agesilaus went further. 
he appointed his chief officer to the position of carver in the royal household and when he did so said before several guests now let the people who want favors pay their court to my carver lysander was very much hurt and said agesilaus you know well how to humble your friends i know those who want more power than i have answered agesilaus but perhaps returned lysander that has been so represented to you rather than tried by me however all i ask is that you will place me in a position where i may serve you without displeasing you he was sent as lieutenant to the hellespont and was killed in the war not long after agesilaus then proceeded with an army to persia and on his approach tissaphernes the persian commander was so frightened that he proposed a treaty by which the greek cities in asia were to be governed by their own laws but when his forces were collected they proved to be more numerous than he had expected and so he took courage and declared war to punish him for breaking his word agesilaus pretended to march with his whole army to korea and as soon as the persians were drawn to that quarter he turned about and entered phrygia where he took many cities and immense treasure but he found his cavalry to be weak and retired to ephesus to increase it the plan he adopted was to insist that every person of means who did not wish to serve should provide a man and a horse and thus he got together quite a respectable body one day he ordered that all the prisoners should be stripped and sold at public auction their clothing was offered separately and brought a large price but the prisoners being for the most part small and their skins being white and soft it was not thought that they could make valuable slaves and the bids for them were low adresilaus who stood by with his soldiers at the auction said in a tone of contempt these are the persons with whom ye fight then pointing to the rich spoils he added those are the things for which ye fight adresilaus then gave out that he would invade lydia but Tissaphernes, who had been deceived before, now made up his mind that Korea was to be the next scene of battle, and led his forces there. When the Greeks spread out on the plains of Sardis, the Persians had to march there, in such haste that, taking advantage of their disorder, Agesilaus gave them battle, put them to flight, took the camp, and killed great numbers. The king of Persia was so displeased with his general on account of this defeat which opened the country to the enemy, that he sent Tithrastes to cut off his head and take the command instead. That general was also instructed to offer Agesilaus large sums of money on condition that he would go back home. The making of peace belongs to the Lacedaemonians, not to me, answered Agesilaus. As for wealth, I would rather see it in the hands of my soldiers than in my own. We Grecians do not think it honorable to enrich ourselves with bribes from our enemies, we prefer to carry home spoils but to show his gratification at the way in which tissaphernes had been disposed of he retired into phrygia while on the march he received a staff or cytali from sparta appointing him commander of the navy as well as of the army an honor that had never been given to any one else but he was considered the greatest and most illustrious man of his time more on account of his virtue and real merit than of his power the grecian army did great damage in phrygia which was ruled by pharnabazus the latter did not feel strong enough to oppose the enemy but moved about with his valuables from place to place to avoid a battle and at last requested an interview with agesilaus which was granted agesilaus reached the appointed place first and threw himself down upon the grass under a tree pharnabazus came with soft skins and rich rugs to recline upon but when he beheld agesilaus he grew ashamed of such luxury and in spite of his fine clothing sat on the grass also after the usual salutations pharnabazus explained that he had just cause of complaint against the lacedaemonians they having ravaged his country although he had done them great service at the time of the athenian war the spartans who were present knew that they had wronged this man who had indeed been their friend and felt so ashamed that they hung their heads and blushed their general answered as follows while we were friends to the king of persia we treated him and his in a friendly manner now that we are at war with him we treat him as an enemy as for you we must look upon you as part of his property and wound him through you but whenever you prefer to be a friend to the grecians rather than a slave to the king of persia you may count upon this army 
and navy to defend you your country and your liberties to this pharnabasis replied if the king send another governor in my place i will certainly come over to you but as long as he trusts me with the government i shall be just to him and shall not fail to do my utmost to oppose you agesilaus was so struck by this noble reply that he took the hand of pharnabasis and said heaven grant that so brave a man may be our friend rather than our enemy as pharnabasis was going away his son went up to agesilaus and saying with a smile sir i extend to you the rights of hospitality handed him a javelin agesilaus received it and was so well pleased with the youth that he stripped a horse near by of its magnificent trappings and presented them in return many years later when this same persian was driven from his home by his brothers he fled to greece and agesilaus befriended him one of the most marked traits in the character of agesilaus was his loyalty to his friends which sometimes led him to do injustice thus when nicias was on trial he wrote to the prince of korea if nicias be innocent acquit him if he be guilty acquit him on my account but in any case acquit him by the time agesilaus had been at the head of the army for two years he was so renowned that he was able to restore order in the governments of the various cities of asia that had revolted from the persians he then resolved to remove the seat of war and attack the king in his own home but before he could do so he was summoned to sparta on account of the civil war which had broken out in greece though at the very height of his glory agesilaus did not hesitate for a moment his country needed him and he must go even though his work remained unfinished some countries allowed him to pass as a friend through others he was obliged to fight his way and before he arrived home he was stopped by an ephor who came with a message that he was to go at once to boeotia he obeyed and met the thebans in battle gaining a splendid victory after one of the most desperate fights ever known at last he returned to sparta and settled down to his former simple habits just as though he had never seen a foreign country and this made his fellow-citizens love and admire him more than ever he was wise enough to make a friend of agesipolis the king who ruled sparta with him and by so doing got his half-brother to Ludius, chosen admiral then with his assistance at sea agesilaus made an expedition against the corinthians and took possession of their long walls he was engaged in several other wars being sometimes victorious and sometimes defeated but always ready to fight the thebans whom he hated exceedingly indeed this hatred was so well known that the thebans complained of it and said we are wearing ourselves out by going in such numbers on this or that expedition every year at the will of a handful of lacedaemonians but agesilaus convinced them that he had more warriors in the field than they had for as the lacedaemonians were forbidden to learn trades they were all warriors whereas the theban army was composed of mechanics of all sorts the spartans were not always successful but met with several defeats both by sea and by land and at last tired of so many wars the various greek states sent ambassadors at lacedaemonia to arrange a treaty of peace by the advice of agesilaus thebes was left out when the treaty was signed and war was declared on the spot against that city all the signs were opposed to war but agesilaus was determined to gratify his dislike of the thebans and the defeat of leuctra was the consequence in that battle four thousand spartans were killed and they were the flower of the army brave young men who fell sword in hand from that time sparta lost the superiority she held in greece for nearly five hundred years the thebans lost only three hundred men at leuctra and won the most glorious success that one greek tribe could ever boast of over another the spartans knew how to bear adversity with dignity and showed in this case how truly brave they were for when the news of their defeat reached sparta a solemn feast was being celebrated and many strangers from foreign countries were present the ephors gave orders that the rejoicings should not be interrupted and privately sent the names of the slain to each family that had lost a member the next morning the relations of those that had died fighting for their country appeared in public with cheerful countenances and congratulated each other while those whose sons and brothers had survived hid themselves and looked troubled the reason of this was that among the spartan those of their warriors who escaped death when their army was defeated were called runaways and as such the laws against them were very severe they had no honors of any sort shown them no woman wanted to marry them it was permitted to any one who should meet them in the street to beat them and they dared not resist they were in such disgrace that they were obliged to go about unwashed and poorly dressed with patched clothes and unshaven beards 
At this time, when soldiers were needed, it was unfortunate for so many to be in disgrace, and it was feared that they might commit some desperate deed. So Agesilaus was requested to decide what best to do. He would not take it upon himself to change any part of the laws, but appearing in the public assembly, he proclaimed that the law should sleep for today, and from this day forth be rigorously executed. So the young Spartans preserved their honor, and in order to encourage them, Agesilaus led them at once into Arcadia, ravaged the country, and took the town of Mantinea. This success was balm to their wounded honor. In the southern part of Greece is a district called Laconia, which, at the time we speak of, was inhabited by the Dorians. So powerful were these people considered that no man dared to invade their territory, and for six hundred years they had not seen the face of an enemy within its limits. But now the Thebans were aroused and would stop at nothing. So with Epimonides, he, a learned and virtuous statesman and soldier, to lead them, they invaded Laconia with a tremendous army and ravaged and plundered the country to the very outskirts of Sparta. Agesilaus stayed in Sparta to strengthen the fortifications and guard the exposed places. He was constantly taunted by the Thebans, who called him the author of all the trouble in his country, and bade him defend himself as best he could. Besides, he had to bear the reproaches of the old men and the women of Sparta, who were almost out of their senses on account of the enemy being so near, for hitherto it had been the proud boast of his countrymen that their wives and daughters had never beheld the smoke of the enemy's fire. This was changed now, and Agesilaus felt that he was to blame for it. His reputation was tarnished, and he had the pain of knowing that the country, which had been in a most flourishing and powerful condition when he mounted the throne, was now laid low, her glory had departed, and his own boast had come to nothing. While the disturbance lasted, several conspiracies were formed among the bad citizens, but as soon as they were discovered, Agesilaus consulted with the ephors and had the offenders put to death privately. This was a new proceeding, for Spartans had never before been punished without trial. Many of the Helix soldiers deserted to the enemy, thereby causing great alarm to the inhabitants, which Agesilaus sought to remedy by having the soldiers' quarters searched regularly before daylight and the arms of the deserters hidden, that it might not become known how many of them there were. No historian gives a reason for the departure of the Thebans from Laconia, but certain it is that it took place after three months, and all agree that Sparta was saved from complete ruin by the wisdom of Agesilaus. He could not restore her glory or her ancient greatness, but he could and did sacrifice all personal feelings for her safety in time of peril. Although Agesilaus had now grown old, he could not be satisfied with inactivity, so he entered the service of Tachos, the Egyptian chief, though it was regarded as unworthy for such a man to hire himself out as captain of a band of mercenary or paid soldiers to assist a rebel in opposing his sovereign. But he did this nevertheless, and fitted out a fleet with the money Tachos had sent him, and then set sail with thirty Spartans for counselors, as he had done at the very beginning of his career. On his arrival in Egypt, all the great officers of the kingdom flocked to the shore, anxious to behold a hero who was looked upon as the first commander in all Greece. When they saw only a little old man in mean attire seated on the grass, they laughed and said, The old proverb is now made good, the mountain has brought forth a mouse. Tekos was preparing for the war, and Agesilaus expected to be put in command of all the forces, but he was disappointed in this as well as in other matters. The Egyptians were haughty and insolent towards him, and he soon began to regret having joined them. Therefore, an opportunity offering for him to desert, he did it, although even the most partial of his biographers cannot acquit him of base treachery in doing so. But he was growing old and longed to return to Sparta, which was again engaged in war. It was winter when he set sail, and he was overtaken by a storm which drove him upon a desert shore of Africa called the Haven of Menelaus, where he died at the age of eighty-four. It was a Spartan custom to bury ordinary persons in the land where they ceased to breathe, but their kings were carried home. So the attendants of Agesilaus embalmed his body with melted wax and conveyed it to Sparta where it was buried with all due honors. End of chapter 18「Chapter 19 of Our Young Folks Plutarch – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Our Young Folks Plutarch by Rosalie Kaufman, Chapter 19, Dion. When Dionysius the Elder was tyrant or ruler of Syracuse, he had two wives whom he loved very much. Their names were Doris and Aristomachi. Aristomachi had a brother Dion, who is the subject of this chapter. Dion was well received at court, and his brother-in-law Dionysius liked him so much that he ordered his treasurer to supply him with all the money he wanted. Dion was too virtuous to take undue advantage of such generosity, but it enabled him to devote his time to study, and he became a very talented man. Plato, the great Athenian philosopher, instructed him, and under such good influence Dion improved in every particular. He was considered one of Plato's most distinguished scholars, and so impressed was he by the doctrines of the philosopher that he wanted Dionysius to get the benefit of them too. So he persuaded him to attend some of the lectures, but Dionysius was not pleased to hear virtues lauded for which he cared nothing. Plato told him that only the just could be happy, and that the unjust were sure to be miserable. This was a new idea to Dionysius, whose actions were governed entirely by his passions, and it was an unwelcome one, particularly as he could find no good argument to bring forward on the other side. So he became angry, and asked Plato roughly, What business have you here in Sicily? I came to seek an honest man, answered the philosopher. Then you have lost your labor, it seems, returned the tyrant. His anger did not end with words, and at last Dion persuaded Plato for his own safety to leave Sicily. Accordingly, he embarked on board a vessel to return to Greece. Dionysius ordered the captain either to drop him into the sea or to sell him as a slave. For, said he, according to his own teachings, this man can never be unhappy. A just man, he says, must be happy in a state of slavery as well as in a state of freedom. The captain took his passenger to Aegina and sold him there for twenty pounds, for the people of that place, being at war with the Athenians at the time, had decreed that any of them who were taken on their shore should be so disposed of. Dionysius continued to be fond of Dion and sent him on several important embassies. During his absence on one of these occasions, the tyrant died and was succeeded by his son of the same name. The younger Dionysius was a less able man than his father and had neither his judgment nor experience, so he allowed himself to be ruled by courtiers who led him into all sorts of gaiety and dissipation against the advice of Dion, who, having returned to Syracuse, did what he could to direct the young man properly. Dionysius wondered at the wisdom of Dion and might have been influenced by him if the courtiers had been out of the way, but they were determined to keep the upper hand in the government and to control the young king. So they encouraged him to spend his life in enjoyment and made up stories that put Dion in a bad light. With a tyrant whose time and attention were devoted to pleasure, the government became very weak, and this so grieved Dion that he persuaded Dionysius to invite Plato to Sicily and place himself under his guidance. At first he paid little heed to what Dion said, but as time went on and the maxims of Plato were repeated and made clear to him, he became impatient to see the man who set forth such novel and wonderful ideas. So he wrote two or three letters urging the philosopher to come to Syracuse. Dion and other wise men added their entreaties, and Plato, with the hope of doing good to the young tyrant, at last consented. One of the royal chariots, richly ornamented, stood on the seashore to receive him when he landed, and after welcoming him, Dionysius sacrificed to the gods in acknowledgment of the great happiness, as he called the arrival of Plato, which had overtaken his government. For a while all went well, and the citizens were delighted with the changes that were made, for their tyrant became kind and gentle, paid attention to matters of business, gave banquets that were decent and respectable, and no longer spent days at a time in intoxication, as he had frequently done. 
Everybody began to reason and argue about questions of public interest, and even the palace itself was filled with students. But this state of affairs was not to last, for the greater Plato's influence became, the more were the courtiers alarmed at the effect it might eventually have on their tyrant. So they talked against Dion openly and declared that through Plato he had bewitched Dionysius for the purpose of destroying in him all desire for power, riches, or pleasure, and of inducing him to settle his government on the children of Aristomachi, Dion's sister. At last they brought matters to a climax by showing Dionysius a letter which they said Dion had written, the Carthaginians advising them when they wanted peace to ask it through him, because he would promise to obtain for them whatever terms they proposed. Dionysius said nothing about this to Dion for a long while, but one day, having invited him to take a walk, he led him to the seaside and there produced the letter and accused his companion of having conspired with the Carthaginians against himself. Dion was completely taken by surprise and made such a lame defense that the tyrant resolved to get rid of him on the spot. He therefore ordered his attendants to carry him to a vessel which lay at anchor in the harbor close by and bid the seamen to sail at once and set their prisoner ashore on the coast of Italy. Now Dion was a great favorite in the royal household and there were loud lamentations when his fate was made known. But Dionysius declared that he had not been banished but only sent away for a limited time and for his own good. He did not reveal his true reason for his conduct with regard to Dion, but pacified his relations by giving them permission to load two vessels with the servants and effects of the exile and send them to him. Dion was a man of wealth, and the number of costly and luxurious articles his friends shipped to him enabled him to fit up his house with royal splendor. In course of time he settled himself at Athens, and the people wondered what must be the power of a tyrant when an exile from his kingdom could make such a display of riches. Dionysius removed Plato to the castle under pretense of doing him honor, but in reality to set a guard over him, lest he should follow Dion and tell the world how he had been banished. Dionysius had another reason for wishing to keep Plato with him, and that was that he had grown fond of him and of the study of philosophy under his guidance. But a war soon broke out, and he was forced to let him go. Meanwhile, Dion was becoming very popular in Athens, as well as in other Grecian cities, and public honors were often bestowed on him merely because of the love and admiration he inspired. This made Dionysius so angry that he confiscated the estates of the exile, and no longer sent him a supply of money. Then, fearing that Plato might speak ill of him among the philosophers, he collected a number of wise men at his court and tried to appear very learned before them. He soon found, however, that he needed Plato to help him to sustain his arguments, so he sent a messenger to beg him to return to Sicily, and wrote a letter in which he said that Dion might expect no favors from him unless Plato consented. The wife and sister of Dion also wrote, employing Plato for their sakes to gratify the tyrant. Therefore Plato set sail for Sicily the third time, and his arrival was hailed with joy no less by Dionysius than by the citizens. Before long Plato began to speak of his friend Dion and tried to make the tyrant say what he meant to do for him. But Dionysius always changed the subject, hoping that in time Plato would cease to think of Dion altogether. While matters stood thus, one of Plato's followers foretold an eclipse of the sun, and as it happened just when he said it would, the tyrant rewarded him with a talent of silver. Thereupon a philosopher jestingly said, I too can predict something extraordinary. On being questioned, he replied, I foresee that in a short time there will be a quarrel between Dionysius and Plato. Soon after this, the tyrant sold Dion's estate, but refused to send him the money. Plato was so indignant at this that he resolved to leave Sicily forthwith, and one of his friends provided a vessel for him. But Dionysius, desiring to soften Plato's feelings towards himself, gave him some grand entertainments before he left. 
at one of these he said no doubt plato when you are at home among the philosophers you will often make my faults the subject of your conversation i hope we shall never be so much at a loss for subjects in the academy as to talk of you returned plato not only did the tyrant confiscate the absent dion's estates but he compelled the unfortunate man's wife to marry one of his favorite courtiers when dion heard of how he had been wronged he determined to make war on syracuse many friends declared themselves ready to help him and soldiers to the number of eight hundred were raised they met on an island in the middle of summer and dion prepared a magnificent sacrifice to apollo afterwards there was an eclipse of the moon which frightened the soldiers dreadfully but dion who understood the natural causes of such an event made one of his soothsayers explain it as meaning that the splendid reign of dionysius should be eclipsed as soon as they arrived in sicily so they were encouraged though there were several other unfavorable omens which even the most ingenious failed to turn to account dion sailed with all his men in two ships and had the good fortune to land at syracuse when dionysius was absent in italy there was great excitement in the city when his arrival was known but he took care to preserve quiet as much as possible timocrates who had married dion's wife dispatched a messenger to italy with a letter informing the tyrant of what had happened while passing through regium the messenger met an acquaintance who was carrying home part of a sacrifice a piece of the meat was offered to him he accepted it and proceeded on his journey he travelled a good part of the night but towards morning being overcome by fatigue he entered a wood just off the road and lay down to rest he fell asleep and a wolf smelling the meat came and seized it and carried it away with the letter bag to which it was tied when the man awoke he looked everywhere for his bag and was dreadfully distressed at not being able to find it of course he did not dare to go before the king without the letter so he decided to hide himself and keep out of the way of the royal displeasure thus it happened that dionysius heard nothing of the arrival in syracuse of dion for a long time when at last the news reached him he hastened home by sea and got safe into the citadel but this took place a whole week after dion had declared the sicilians free from the yoke of the tyrant and had liberated the state prisoners and armed the citizens dionysius dispatched agents privately to dion to see what terms could be made but the answer he received was that he must treat with the people so the tyrant sent one messenger after another with the fairest and most flattering promises but the syracusans had no faith in him and would scarcely listen to his proposals at last he asked them to offer terms themselves or to send some representatives to the citadel to discuss what it was best to do the syracusans consented but their agents were seized and locked up by the tyrant who having freely distributed wine among the soldiers in the citadel until they were intoxicated made an attack on the city by break of day dion was unprepared for such a surprise but he resisted at first with the hired soldiers whom he led on in person and fought a fierce and bloody battle he was wounded in the hand but mounted a horse rallied the citizens as they fled and at the same time brought up his greek soldiers who drove dionysius and his army back to the fortress after a great number of them had been killed the syracusans rewarded the foreign soldiers for their service and put a gold crown on dion's head the tyrant made another trial to regain his kingdom this time by letter he wrote dion begging him not to destroy the government and give freedom to his enemies but to proclaim himself king if only for the protection of his family and friends dion was honest enough to show this letter to the syracusans but instead of admiring him for so doing they became suspicious that he might really take some desperate step for the sake of his wife and son so they began to look about for another leader and heard with joy that heraclides a soldier then under banishment who had once held an important command in the service of dionysius was on his way home as soon as he arrived an assembly was called and he was chosen commander of the navy heraclides pretended to be a friend to dion but secretly he was an enemy and tried in every possible way to injure him in the minds of the citizens 
so dion's unpopularity increased but he worked so hard to keep order that no attack was made on him in course of time dionysius made his escape from the citadel and then heraclides who had charge of the navy was openly blamed he did not know how to excuse himself so he turned people's attention in another direction by causing one of the public speakers to go among them and excite them to rebel against dion's laws and to urge them to insist upon a redivision of land on the ground that so long as they remained poor they would be slaves he spoke to them also and advised them to get rid of dion's oppression the idea of freedom was so new to the syracusans that they did not quite understand it but they hated dion and were willing to be led by any other person who seemed to be on their side so they called an assembly and elected twenty-five captains among whom was heraclides they tried to win over dion's men by offering to make them citizens of syracuse if they would desert him but they would not listen to anything so base they went to dion and with their swords in their hands placed him in their midst and conveyed him out of the city he went to leontium where he was received with honors but the time came when the syracusans were glad enough to get him back again it happened in this wise dionysius sent a fleet commanded by a neapolitan named nipsius with provisions and pay for those he had left in the citadel nipsius was attacked by the syracusans who took four of his ships but as they had no person to guide them and had not learned to control themselves they celebrated their victory by feasting rioting and drunkenness in which their twenty-five commanders joined taking advantage of the disorder nipsius broke through the walls in the night and let his soldiers loose upon the city they tore down the fortifications set fire to the houses killed the men and dragged the women and children shrieking and screaming to the citadel the syracusan officers gave up all for lost suddenly in the midst of the terrible scene a voice from the cavalry was heard crying send for dion and his peloponnesians from leontium the very mention of his name inspired hope the people shouted for joy and half a dozen of the cavalry immediately rode off towards leontium they arrived just after sunset and throwing themselves at the feet of dion told him of the deplorable condition of their city he summoned an assembly and the leontines and peloponnesians soon gathered about him then at his request the soldiers repeated the sad news and added entreaties that he with his foreign soldiers would go to the assistance of the unfortunate people who had suffered so much because of their ingratitude and ignorance for several minutes dion was so overcome with grief that he could not speak but at last wiping away his tears he said men of peloponnesus and of the confederacy i asked for your presence here that you might consider your own interests for myself i have no interest to consult while syracuse is perishing and though i may not save it from destruction i will hasten thither and be buried in the ruins of my country yet if you can find it in your hearts to assist us you may to your everlasting honour save the unhappy city but if the syracusans are to have no more pity or relief from you may the gods reward you for what you have done for them and for your kindness to dion of whom speak hereafter as one who did not desert you when you were injured and abused nor his fellow-citizens when they were afflicted before he had ended the soldiers shouted out their readiness to go with him and begged him to lead them at once to the relief of syracuse when quiet was restored dion gave orders that all should go to their quarters and prepare to march that night they set forward meanwhile another attack had been made on the city by nipsius who seemed determined to lay it in ruins and leave not a living human being within its walls in this dreadful strait messenger after messenger met dion on the road and begged him to hurry forward he made his arrangements that he might attack from several quarters at once and having offered vows to the gods rode into the city at the head of his men while a confused sound of shouts congratulations and prayers was raised by the people they called dion their deliverer and his soldiers their friends brethren and fellow-citizens heaps of dead bodies lay in the streets through which dion passed with his men and houses were blazing on all sides which made it both difficult and dangerous for them to advance 
when they came near the enemy the road was so narrow and uneven that only a few could engage at a time but they beat off nipsius's men and put them to flight many got into the castle but those who did not were put to the sword the syracusans could not spare time to rejoice for they were too busy in trying to put out the flames at which they worked the entire night all of the captains except two escaped from the city well knowing that they deserved punishment for what had happened the two who remained were heraclides and theodotes these went to dion and surrendered themselves they acknowledged that they had been wrong but begged him to treat them more kindly than they had treated him and to be generous to men who were absolutely in his power dion's friends advised him on no account to pardon men who had been so active in bringing about the ruin of the city but he said my studies under plato and other wise men have taught me to subdue my passions and not to give way to anger and revenge there would be no merit in showing kindness to men of virtue it is those who have injured us that we must pardon if i have exiled heraclides inability i must not be inferior to him in justice and clemency heraclides may be treacherous malicious base but must dion therefore sully his glory by indulging his anger there is no man so wicked but that he may be influenced by kindness and softened by favours having spoken thus dion pardoned the guilty men and sent them away but heraclides proved himself unworthy the mercy that had been shown him for although dion even restored him to his position as admiral after having pardoned him he excited the sailors to rebellion and led them against syracuse dion went out to sea with an army to meet him and defeated him then it was decided to lay by the fleet because it was not really needed at that time and was only an expense and trouble to the syracusans attention was next turned to the citadel and the son of dionysius who had been left there in command agreed to deliver up the fort with all the soldiers and ammunition to dion it was a happy day for syracuse when the prince sailed away with his five vessels leaving them free from the most tyrannical rule that had ever existed dion now settled himself in his house and lived in very plain frugal style notwithstanding his high position he knew that the eyes of the whole world were upon him and he was anxious to show that prosperity did not make him foolish it was not long before heraclides gave trouble again by interfering with political affairs and opposing everything that dion attempted then some of the citizens feeling that there could be no peace while heraclides lived broke into his house and murdered him dion had a friend named calippus in whom he placed a great deal of confidence but calippus only pretended friendship while all the time he was going around among the lower classes talking against dion and trying to make them hate him when dion heard what calippus said of him he believed as he had been told by the false friend that it was done merely for the sake of finding out who were true to him and that calippus spoke so freely on purpose to draw others out but he soon found his mistake for calippus was forming a plot against his life just then his only son threw himself from the top of a house in a fit of temper and broke his neck while dion was mourning the loss of this youth whom he had loved very dearly calippus hurried on his conspiracy by announcing that the son of dionysius was going to be sent for to become their ruler this aroused the people to such a degree of indignation and terror that a great number were added to those already in the plot so when dion sat at supper one evening with several of his friends the conspirators surrounded the house and guarded the windows and doors while a few entered and falling upon dion threw him to the ground and endeavoured to stifle him his friends thought only of their own safety and did not attempt to assist him presently a sword was handed in at one of the windows and with it the almost exhausted dion who had made a desperate resistance was quickly dispatched calippus then took the government of syracuse in his own hands but he was hated and despised by everybody no city that he visited would receive him and at last he was killed by his own soldiers with the very sword that had been used to put dion to death End of chapter nineteen younger